पीटी का बर्थडे था तो किसी ने मेरे मुंबई से मेरे एक दोस्त ने गिफ्ट भेजा उसमें टॉय था और उसमें ऊपर एक क्यू आर कोड था उससे एप्लीकेशन स्कैन करके इंस्टॉल करनी थी तो हमने इंस्टॉल की और उसे कॉन्फिगर किया इज वर्किंग टॉय अच्छा चल रहा है मैंने कहा वो जरा डब्बा लेके आएंगे जिसपे क्यू आर कोड था वो क्यू आर कोड मैंने देखा तो देखा कि वो क्यू आर कोड के ऊपर दूसरा क्यू आर कोड चिपकाया गया था तो मुझे इतना सिंपल सा करना है और जो नया क्यू आर कोड था वो दो काम करता था वो टॉय वाली एप्लीकेशन भी इंस्टॉल करता था और एक स्टील मोड में कॉल रिकॉर्डिंग एप्लीकेशन इंस्टॉल कर देता था जो आपकी रिकॉर्डिंग बाहर भेजती थी अब मेरी बेटी का बर्थडे है दुनिया को पता है मेरे दोस्त के नाम से कोई गिफ्ट भेज देता है अटैक वैक्टर देखो कितना सिंपल है अटैक वैक्टर इसमें टेक्नोलॉजी से ज्यादा सोशल इंजीनियरिंग यूज हुई एक अभी फ्रॉड हुआ आप जरा स्लाइड मूव करते जाओ क्योंकि मेरे पास समय बहुत कम है <laughs> मैं आधी चीजें नहीं बताऊंगा <laughs> और मूव हाँ ये एक बड़ा अच्छा स्कैम हुआ क्वाइन एक्ट के बारे में कितने लोग जानते हैं क्रिप्टो करेंसी में कितने लोग इन्वेस्ट करते हैं वेरी गुड ये क्वाइन एक्ट करके एक्सचेंज बना और उसमें इसका जो मोडस ऑपरेंडी था बड़ा इंटरेस्टिंग लगा मुझे इसलिए बता रहा हूं आपको एक करोड़ का फ्रॉड किया इंडिया के अंदर इन्होंने फेसबुक पर कुछ लड़कियों के प्रोफाइल बनाए खूबसूरत लड़कियां मॉडल्स उनके पिक्चर्स लेके और फिर जो अमीर लोग हैं या जो लोग मिडिल एज जो ऐसे लोगों को टारगेट करके उनकी दोस्ती की गई फिर उनसे बातचीत शुरू की गई देख रहे कहाँ से गेम शुरू होता है अभी आप चलते जाइए देखिए कहाँ तक जाएगा फिर उस लड़की ने उनसे कहा कि ये हम मैं इस कंपनी में काम करती हूँ और ऐसा वैसा है और हम आपको फ्री क्रिप्टो दे रहे हैं फ्री हंड्रेड टोकन ले लो फ्री और अपना इन्वेस्ट करो और जो पैसा कमाया वो आपका हमें कुछ नहीं चाहिए ये तो हम प्रमोशन स्कीम है खूबसूरत बंदी हो गया तो वो हंड्रेड हंड्रेड क्वाइन लेके उन्होंने इन्वेस्ट किया तो वो पांच पांच सौ क्वाइन हो गए इन्वेस्टमेंट करते जैसे ही बढ़ गया तो उनका कॉन्फिडेंस बढ़ गया तो उन्हें अपना और पैसा डाल दिया उसमें जब ज्यादा पैसा डाल दिया और फिर विड्रॉ करने की बारी आई तो वो विड्रॉ नहीं करने देता था अब ये घबरा गए इन्होंने पुलिस में कंप्लेन कर दी पुलिस कुछ कर नहीं पा रही थी क्योंकि सारी चीजें बाहर होस्टेड थी तो इन्होंने फेसबुक पर उसके बारे में लिखना शुरू कर दिया फेसबुक पर वेबसाइट पर अभी गेम क्राइम या खत्म नहीं हुआ है भी शुरू हुआ है ये देखिए आप इंटरेस्टिंग है जैसे उन्होंने फेसबुक पे लिखा और दुनिया भर की वेबसाइट में लिखा कंप्लेन किया तो जो क्रिमिनल्स थे उन्होंने वो पढ़ा अब वो इन्वेस्टिगेटर बन गए उन्होंने उनको कॉल किया कि अच्छा आपके संगे क्राइम हुआ मेरे साथ ही हुआ है और मैं इन्वेस्टिगेटर हूं मैं आपकी हेल्प करूंगा मुझे अपना लॉग इन पासवर्ड देना ई मेल आई का फिर दोबारा लूटा दूसरी बार पैसे निकाल लिए क्योंकि अब बंदा 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 फंसा हुआ था उसको तो पैसे फंस गए थे अभी तिवारा भी लुटे हैं लोग उसके बाद तीसरी बार पुलिस के पास गए तो कई बार इस तरह के जो सीक्वेंस ऑफ क्राइम्स हैं समझ में नहीं आते लोगों को जैसे कि ओ फ्रॉड होता था कि लिंक आया आपको कि आपको पैसे आ रहे हैं दस हजार रुपये भेज रहा हूँ दस हजार भेज रहा हूँ आपने क्लिक कर दिया पिन डाला आपके अकाउंट से निकल गया आपने उसने कॉल किया भाई साहब पैसे आने थे पैसे तो चले गए ओ सॉरी मेरी गलती में जल्दबाजी में गलत लिंक भेज दिया मैं अब आपको बीस हजार का लिंक भेज रहा हूं अब आप दस वो जो मैंने गलती से लिए दस जो मुझे आपको देने आप आप, आप ये क्लिक कीजिए वो भी क्लियर बीस हजार चले गए भाई साहब आप गलती बहुत बार कर रहे हो बीस हजार चले ओ सर मैं आपको अब चालीस हजार का लिंक दे रहा हूं दस पेनल्टी भी दूंगा मैं आपको भाई साहब ने वो भी क्लिक कर दिया मतलब तब चेते जब अस्सी हजार नब्बे हजार चले गए अमित मेरे नब्बे हजार चले गए मैंने कहा ऐसे कैसे चले गए अच्छा इससे पहले मैंने एक वीडियो बनाया आरजे रौनक के संग रेड एफ एम पे और दिखाया कि ओएलएक्स फ्रॉड हो रहे हैं हमारे दिल्ली के चीफ मिनिस्टर की बेटी के भी तीस हजार चले गए थे तो वैसी हवा थी वो वीडियो बना के डेमोन्स्ट्रेट किया कैसे लिंक क्लिक होता है और लोग बेसिक सी चीज भूल जाते हैं कि भैया मुझे कोई पैसे भेज रहा है तो मुझे कुछ क्लिक करने की क्या जरूरत है भाई मैं आपके अकाउंट में एक करोड़ रुपये डाल सकता हूँ बिना आपसे पूछे डाल सकता हूँ आपको कुछ क्लिक करने की जरूरत ही नहीं है पर लोग भूल जाते हैं भैया पैसा आ रहा है दस हजार तो मेरे से क्लिक क्या करा लो एप्लीकेशन तो इंस्टॉल कर लेता है वायरस तक इंस्टॉल कर लेते हैं लोग क्योंकि पैसा आ रहा है तो इतना बेसिक चीज जो मिस होता है तो जब मैंने वो वीडियो बना के वायरल किया और उसके अगले हफ्ते मेरे पास कॉल आ गया मेरी सोसाइटी से कि मेरे अस्सी हजार रुपए निकल गए तो मैंने कहा यार अजीब आदमी तो मैंने इतनी मेहनत की वीडियो बनाया आपको वायरल किया आपको दिखाया भेजा आपने देखा बोले हाँ देखा था तो मैंने कहा बताया था मैंने उसमें मत करना तो बोले मैंने लिंक क्लिक नहीं किया था तो मेरे फिर कैसे निकले पैसे बोले यार उसने क्यूआर कोड भेजा था <laughs> तो क्यूआर कोड भी तो लिंक ही होता है क्या तुमने कहा बताया था तो आप देख रहे हो कि अटैक वेक्टर कैसे बदलता है 
कायम के संग हम एक चीज सिखाते हैं ओटीपी मत देना अरे कोई जानबूझ के ओटीपी देता है क्या जितने लोगों के संग फ्रॉड हुआ है उसने जा, उसने जानबूझ के ओटीपी दिया होगा नहीं कहानी ऐसे घुमाई जाती है एक पूरी ड्रामा तैयार होता है वो आपके संग ट्रस्ट बिल्ड करता है केस आया मेरे पास के साहब अमित जी मैं मुंबई में था सी से हूं किसी को बताना मत आईटी मैनेजर हूं बड़ी कंपनी का मेरे संग फ्रॉड हो गया और मैं आपकी सारी कहानियां भी सुनता हूं रेडियो पे मैंने कहा और मर गया <laughs> तो क्या हुआ भाई बोले मैं मुंबई में था मुझे एक सस्ती टैक्सी चाहिए थी दस रुपए पर किलोमीटर की मैं गूगल पे ढूंढ रहा था तो मुझे कई सारी मिल गई मैंने एक वेबसाइट पर देखा तो उसमें था कि आप सौ रुपए क्रेडिट कार्ड से बुक डाल दीजिए तो आपकी टैक्सी बुक हो जाएगी और शाम को दस रुपए पर किलोमीटर के हिसाब से पे कर देना तो बोले मैं सौ रुपए डालने के लिए पूरे क्रेडिट कार्ड डिटेल डाले भरा वो सौ रुपए जा ही नहीं रहते थोड़ी देर में मुझे कॉल आ गया वहां से कि आप ट्राई कर रहे बोले हाँ तो मैंने उससे कहा भाई मेरा क्यों क्रेडिट कार्ड डिटेल भरवा रहे हो बार बार यूपीआई नंबर बता दो मैं पे कर देता हूँ बोले नहीं नहीं सर यूपीआई नहीं प्रॉब्लम है सोल्यूशन देना पड़ेगा <laughs> मैं एक काम करता हूँ मैं आपको गूगल मीट का लिंक भेजता हूँ आप गूगल मीट का आप उसको अपनी स्क्रीन शेयर कीजिए मुझे दिखाइए मैं देखूंगा क्यों नहीं पेमेंट हो पा रहा है आपसे सौ रुपए का तो बोले गूगल मीट तो हम लोग डेली यूज करते हैं गूगल मीट से कोई फ्रॉड हो सकता है क्या तो उसे गूगल मीट लिंक भेजा मैंने खोल लिया गूगल मीट उसके बाद स्क्रीन भी शेयर कर दी उसको दिखाई दे भाई कि मैं क्या कर रहा हूं फिर मैंने अपने क्रेडिट कार्ड की डिटेल भी डाले ओ आता तो दिखेगी स्क्रीन पर <laughs> वो भी देख लिया उसने बोले मेरे पास बहुत सारे ऐसे में जाए पैसे चले गए मैंने उसको कॉल किया मुझे पता पड़ गया तो मेरे पैसे निकाल रहे हो तुमने ये कर दिया तो उसने मेरे बॉस से बात करो अब आगे सपोर्ट वो देंगे भाई साहब ने गूगल मीट लिंक नहीं हटाया तो आप कितना भी स्मार्ट हो कितना भी अवेयर रहे बार बार लोग कहते हैं अवेयर रहिए ये डूज एंड डोंट्स मैं आज तक कभी डूज एंड डोंट्स बताते नहीं हूं एंड आई डोंट बिलीव इन डूज एंड डोंट्स क्योंकि आज तक मैंने जितने लोगों को भी डोंट्स बताया वो बहुत जानबूझे करते हैं तो मेरा पर्पज ये है कि मैं जो हो रहा है वो आपको बता दू व्हाट्सएप हैकिंग कितने लोगों को पता है कैसे करते हैं मैं दो मिनट डाल लूंगा बस इफ कोई एक आध तरीका बताओ मेरे पास कुछ मेरी कुछ बुक्स हैं गिव यू एज गिफ्ट कैसे करते हैं लिंक सेंड करके और कोई तरीका बता मैं आठ तरीके बता सकता हूं एक साथ तब 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 और आठों चलेंगे अभी के अभी <laughs> लेकिन मिस यूज नहीं करेगा कोई हाँ जी और मैंने सारी क्रिमिनल से सीखे मैं खुद नहीं बनाए तरीके मुझे आता है एक भाई साहब की एक लेडी आई मेरे पति को मेरे बारे में सब पता पड़ जाता है मेरा पूरा व्हाट्सएप उसके पास मैंने कहा दिखाओ मैडम मैंने पूरा इन्वेस्टिगेट किया तो पता पड़ा अरे बाप रे कॉल फॉरवर्डिंग सेट है इसमें तो फिर मैं हॉटस्टार की क्रिएटिव हेड का फोन आया अमित मेरा व्हाट्सएप हैक हो गया मैंने कहा आपने कॉल मर्ज कर दिया होगा बोला हाँ यार <laughs> थोड़ा सिंपल सा टेक्निक है सारिका जी का व्हाट्सएप आपको उड़ाना है और आपको पता है कि मैं इनको जानता हूँ आप इनको कॉल करोगे अमित जी ने आपका नंबर दिया है और मैं फलानी जगह से बोल रहा हूँ आपसे बहुत जरूरी बात करनी है फिक्की के बारे में यार जो भी रेफरेंस देकर तो वो क्रेडिबल नाम लिया वो दो चार सेकंड बातचीत शुरू हो जाएगी जैसे वो दस बीस सेकंड के लिए बातचीत हुई वो क्रिमिनल बोलेगा मैडम आई थिंक अमित इज आल्सो कॉलिंग यू आप एक काम कीजिए कॉल मर्ज कर दीजिए तो हम तीनों आपस में बात कर लेते हैं हाँ कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं कितने लोग कॉल मर्ज कर देंगे और कितने लोग नहीं करेंगे <laughs> इसमें कोई अभी तक हमें पता ही नहीं है कि क्या हैक हो रहा है आप कॉल मर्ज कर दोगे जैसे आप कॉल मर्ज करोगे आपका व्हाट्सएप चला गया आपका जीमेल भी जा सकता है और आपका जिंदगी बर्बाद कर सकता है आदमी सिर्फ कॉल मर्ज करने पे मैं बताता हूं कैसे क्योंकि वो जो दूसरा कॉल था कितने लोगों को पता है कि ओटीपी आजकल कॉल पे भी आता है बताइए सिर्फ दस परसेंट लोगों को पता है चलो आवाज बढ़ गए ओटीपी एसएमएस के बजाय अब कॉल पर भी आता है चाहे व्हाट्सएप का हो चाहे गूगल का हो करेक्ट वो दूसरा कॉल ओ का था उससे पहले पूरी कहानी बनाई गई तो मैं कह रहा हूं ना कि कोई जानबूझ के ओटीपी नहीं देता भाई एक पूरा तरीका होता है और हम बताते हैं डोंट गिव योर ओटीपी डोंट गिव अरे ओटीपी नहीं दिया यार <laughs> उसने एक तरीका बनाया उसने गूगल मीट का लिंक भेजा उसने कॉल मर्ज कराया नो बडी टेल्स दिस मैं आपको बड़ा बेसिक्स बता रहा हूं और आपको अवेयरनेस में क्या चिल्ला चिल्ला के बताएंगे डोंट अरे हमने ऐसे तो ना बताया था मेरा ओटीपी थ्री टू फाइव ना ऐसे तो ना देता कोई कॉल मर्ज करा दूसरा कॉल ओटीपी का था वो कॉल उसने सुन लिया फटाक से डाला और ओटीपी आपका व्हाट्सएप हैक कर लिया यदि आपका जीमेल हैक हो जाता है क्योंकि जीमेल का ओटीपी भी व्हाट्सएप पे आता तो आपका गूगल ड्राइव 
आपके 12 साल की लोकेशंस कहां कहां गए किस होटल में रुके कब कब कैश विड्रॉल किया किस किस को पैसा ट्रांसफर किया किस ट्रेन से यात्रा की किस रेल से यात्रा की किस हवाई जहाज से यात्रा की किस देश देश में गए हर चीज उसके पास जब से आप स्मार्टफोन कर रहे हो तब से इट इज सो डेंजरस एंड ऑफकोर्स प्राइवेट कम्युनिकेशन तो है ही जो आपकी गर्लफ्रेंड बॉयफ्रेंड वाले वो तो चले गई इसलिए आई एल स्टॉप हेयर कोई स्लाइड बची है सर तो चला दो बंद टाइम बहुत कम है हमारे पास Thank you so much it was lovely talking to you Kisi ko koi aur question puchna hai Amit ji se ha sawal le sakte hain sign ke liye hai koi nayi investigation tarika ya sir kuch aur ho gaya ho ha ji please puche सर अगर व्हाट्सएप हैक हो जाता है तो फिर इससे बाहर कैसे आ सकते हैं <laughs> देखिए क्रिमिनल क्या करता है कि जब आपका व्हाट्सएप हैक करता है पहले तो मैं आपको बताता हूँ व्हाट्सएप हैक हो ही ना आपका सिंपल सा कोई बहुत बड़ा काम नहीं है अपने व्हाट्सएप पे टू फैक्टर ऑथेंटिकेशन डाल दीजिए टू फैक्टर में क्या होता है कि आपको एक पिन और आ जाएगा उसमें चार डिजिट का छः डिजिट का पिन आप डाल दोगे या कोई ई से लिंक कर लो उससे क्या होगा कि यदि उसको ओ मिल भी गया तब भी वो आपका व्हाट्सएप एक्सेस नहीं कर सकता तो आप सिर्फ ये सोच के चल रहे हो कि ओ कभी नहीं जाएगा ये मिथ है ओ को हैक करने के मैंने आपको बताया अभी आठ तरीके मैं पांच पांच दिन पुलिस की ट्रेनिंग लेता हूं सिर्फ हैकिंग सिखाता हूं तो बहुत सारे तरीके हैं मैं ओ टी पी डालूंगा आपका सेशन हाई चेकिंग कर लूंगा तो पहले तो अपना टू फैक्टर ऑथेंटिकेशन कर लिया अब यदि हैक हो ही गया चला गया तो उस चौबीस घंटे के लिए लॉक कर देगा आपका क्योंकि वो उसमें रॉन्ग पासवर्ड डाल के किसी उसमें जो ट्रायल्स होते हैं पासवर्ड के मल्टीपल डालो के पहला तो उसने लॉक कर लिया या वो खुद टू फैक्टर डाल देगा उसमें एक ये भी तरीका होता है तो फिर उसका ऑप्शन ये बचता है कि आप व्हाट्सएप के नोडल ऑफिसर को लिखें मेरे पास हर दिन कम से कम पांच छह ऐसी कंप्लेन आती है जिसमें सिर्फ व्हाट्सएप इनेबल कराना होता है और इट इंक्लूड्स रिक्वेस्ट फ्रॉम चीफ सेक्रेटरीज आई एस आई ऑफिसर्स तो ये बहुत तेजी से हो रहा है बहुत ज्यादा तरीके हैं व्हाट्सएप हैक करने के तो अच्छा होगा सारे लोग तुरंत टू फैक्टर ऑथेंटिकेशन करेंगे इसके बाद जाके और यदि होगा तो नोडल ऑफिसर को लिख सकते हैं व्हाट्सएप के कृष्णा है जो व्हाट्सएप का नोडल ऑफिसर है एंड हिल हेल्प यू टू गेट इट रिकवर्ड विद इन ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स पर वो 24 घंटे के लिए आपके दोस्तों को आपके नाम से लूट सकता है और कोई सवाल है कृष्णा को ढूंढना ज्यादा मुश्किल है मुझे ढूंढना आसान है तो आपके लिए आसान होगा कि इंडिया फ्यूचर फाउंडेशन की वेबसाइट पर जाए और हमारी हेल्पलाइन है तो इंडिया फ्यूचर फाउंडेशन की हेल्पलाइन यदि आप लिखेंगे तो आप मेरे से कनेक्ट कर सकते हैं और मैं वो चीज़ में आपकी हेल्प करूंगा ठीक है ये अब प्रॉपर हेल्पलाइन जिसमें इस तरह की जितनी भी रिक्वेस्ट आती है वी वर्क एंड वी सॉल्व यस प्लीज क्विकली सर एक्चुअली देर वॉज अ केस बैक का फ्यू टाइम कि एक इंसान ने किसी को तो व्हाट्सएप पे सिर्फ एक हाई का मैसेज भेज दिया और उसका व्हाट्सएप या फ़ोन कुछ तो पूरा हैक हो चुका था बट अभी तक कुछ पता नहीं चला है कि ये उसने कैसे कैरी आउट किया कैन यू प्लीज़ इलाबोरेट ऑन दैट सर ऐसे तो मैं बहुत सारी स्टोरी आपको सुना सकता हूँ लेकिन जब तक इन्वेस्टिगेशन करूँगा नहीं मैं कुछ भी बोल नहीं बोल पाऊँगा क्योंकि बहुत सारे तरीके हैं पेगैस से सुना होगा आपने उसमें तो हाई भी नहीं भेजते थे उसमें तो मिस कॉल करते थे अब मिस कॉल को कैसे रोकोगे आप मिस्ड कॉल को भी रोक सकता है और उसके बाद पूरा फ़ोन हैक हो जाता था तो होंगे तरीके डेफिनेटली बट इन दैट पर्टिकुलर केस आई थिंक इट रिक्वायर्स इन इन्वेस्टिगेशन ऐसे कुछ भी बोलना बहुत मुश्किल है Yes, कितने लोग आप में से हैकर बनना चाहते हैं एथिकल <laughs> मैंने आज तक खुद को एथिकल हैकर नहीं बोला आप क्यों बोल रहे थे डरने की जरूरत नहीं सर आई ऑल्सो है क्वेश्चन यस प्लीज सर जब हम किसी का व्हाट्सएप हैक करते हैं तो व्हाट्सएप में जो एक ऑप्शन आता है लिंक डिवाइस तो हमें वहाँ पे शो होता है दैट हमने जिसका भी व्हाट्सएप हैक किया होता है या उसे भी शो होता है कि कौन सी डिवाइस में हमारा व्हाट्सएप इस टाइम चल रहा है तो हम वहाँ से लॉग आउट करके भी तो अपना व्हाट्सएप वहाँ से हटा सकते हैं हाँ लेकिन वो तब होता है जब आपका आ, आपका उसने हैक किया और उसमें उसने मल्टी फैक्टर ऑथेंटिकेशन इनेबल कर दिया और आपको उसने हटा दिया तो सर लाइक इफ वहाँ से आपके पास ऑप्शन नहीं होता कि आप उसको हटा पाए तो सर हमें वो हमारी लिंक डिवाइस में तो पर शो होगा ना स्टिल आपका लॉग आउट हो चुका होगा ना आप ही को हटा दिया उसने तो दोनों में से जो पहले एक दूसरे को हटाएगा सर दैट मीन अगर वहाँ से उस उन्होंने हटाया तो हमारा व्हाट्सएप उनके पास से हट जाएगा या फिर वो हमें नहीं, नहीं, उनका नहीं क्योंकि आज अभी जो अक्टूबर ट्वेंटी के बाद व्हाट्सएप स्टार्टेड सपोर्टिंग मल्टीपल डिवाइस तो एक ही नंबर चार डिवाइस पर चलता है 
तो आप खुद भी स्विच कर सकते हो इधर से उधर उधर से उधर और आप डिसाइड कर सकते हो कि किस डिवाइस से लॉगआउट करना है सो यू कैन स्पेसिफिकली डिसाइड कि मुझे यहाँ से लॉगआउट करना है यहाँ से नहीं करना है तो जब आप लिंक डिवाइस में जाते हो तो जहाँ जहाँ से लॉग इन होगा वो हर जगह की स्पेसिफिक सेशन दिखाई देता है ओके सर थैंक यू सो अमित जी फिर मल्टीपल डिवाइसेस का लॉगिन तो वैसे भी नहीं रखना चाहिए ना लॉगआउट रखना चाहिए नहीं रखते हैं जरूरत होती है कई बार मैं अभी आपको बताऊं कि पिछले हफ, दो हफ्ते पहले यूपी के चीफ मिनिस्टर का ट्विटर अकाउंट हैक हो गया सीएम ऑफिस यूपी रात के सवा ग्यारह बजे मुझे फोन आया कि साहब हैक हो गया है और उस पर अच्छा मैं रिकॉर्डिंग हो रही <laughs> उस पर कोई फोटो डाल दिया फनी सी और बहुत सारे बिटकॉइन रिलेटेड ट्वीट हो रहे हैं तो हम लोगों ने पंद्रह बीस मिनट में रिकवर कर लिया मुद्दा रिकवरी नहीं था मुद्दा था हैक हुआ कैसे तो जब इन्वेस्टिगेशन शुरू किया तो पता पड़ा कि जो व्यक्ति उनका ट्विटर मैनेज करता था वो लैपटॉप पे उसने लॉगिन कर रखा था और व्हाट्सएप वेब डॉट व्हाट्सएप डॉट कॉम जो मैम बोल रही हैं वो अपने लैपटॉप से चलाता था उसको व्हाट्सएप से एक क्योंकि उसको इतने सारे अकाउंट मैनेज करने होते थे तो इट इज़ ऑलवेज कन्वीनियंट टू हैव वेब डॉट व्हाट्सएप उस पर एक कोई लिंक आया जब मैंने सेशन स्टार्ट किया था तो आप लोगों को एक लिंक बोला था प्राइवेसी डॉट नेट स्लेस एनालाइजर उसमें आपका ब्राउजर वर्जन था आया था आया था कितने लोगों का हंड्रेड से नीचे था अभी लेटेस्ट क्रोम का ब्राउजर वर्जन क्या है कौन बोलेगा हंड्रेड एंड सिक्स हंड्रेड से नीचे किसका था जिसका भी हंड्रेड से नीचे था उसके फोन में एक बड़ी खतरनाक वेलेबिलिटी है वो होती है सेशन हाई चैकिंग तो ये जो व्यक्ति था जो उनका ट्विटर मैनेज करता था उसकी लैपटॉप का ब्राउजर 91 था इतना पुराना सेशन आई जिकिंग का मतलब है कि मैंने आपको लिंक भेजा आपने क्लिक किया मैं आपके जो जो चीजें लॉग इन होंगी वो सारी मेरे लैपटॉप से लॉग इन हो जाएंगी विदाउट नोइंग योर पासवर्ड मुझे आपका पासवर्ड नहीं पता पर सारी चीजें मेरे सिस्टम से लॉग इन हो जाएंगी एंड देन आई कैन कंट्रोल दैट आई कैन पोस्ट डिलीट कुछ भी कर सकता हूँ तो हर दिन जो जीरो डे जीरो डे की बात कर रहे थे पिछले दिन भर से लोग ये जीरो डे वेलेबिलिटी होती है जो लोग फिक्स नहीं कर पाते और एक्सप्लॉयट शुरू हो जाता है तो आप अपने अपने ब्राउजर अपडेट कर लेना इसके बाद और सारी एप्लीकेशन मैं किसी को अभी होता है ना डूज ऑन डोंट्स पे आ गए आप तो मैं किसी को बोल रहा था कि भाई अपनी अपडेटेड रखा करो चीज़ें बोले सर क्या क्या अपडेट करें सत्तर एप्लीकेशन है <laughs> सुबह बैठ के यही करूँ कि अब ये भी अच्छा इसका अपडेट आ गया इसको भी कर लेता हूँ इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल तो वो चीज़ें कहना बड़ा आसान होता है करना आई नो कि प्रैक्टिकली वेरी डिफिकल्ट वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन सर यस प्लीज सर दिस इज अ पर्सनल क्वेश्चन नॉट आस्किंग फ्रॉम माई ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सर हाउ एनोनोमस इज डॉर ब्राउजर हाउ एनोनोमस हाउ हाउ इफ यू नो इट्स सेज दैट इज यू यू योर प्राइवेसी योर आई पी इज हिडन योर लोकेशन इज हिडन हाउ एनोनोमस इज इट एंड टॉर टॉर ब्राउज जो टॉर की टेक्नोलॉजी कितने लोग जानते हैं टॉर ब्राउज कैन वी है सारे लोग जानते हैं अच्छा आप में से कितने लोग वीपीएन यूज करते हैं क्यों करते हैं हाँ आप बताइए क्यों करते हैं तेज बोलिए जैसे मैं बोल रहा हूँ सीरीज इंटरनेट है सी डब्ल्यू सीरीज इंडिया में चलता नहीं है सी डब्ल्यू सीरीज हमारा बहुत टेक्निकल है जल्दी से बताओ क्यों करते हैं ईमानदारी से आंसर देना किसी ने सिक्योरिटी बोला तो फिर झूठ बोल रहा है क्यों करते हैं वीपीएन यूज यस प्लीज सर रिस्ट्रिक्टेड साइट्स हाँ जी रिस्ट्रिक्टेड साइट्स को ओपन करने की जो चीजें बैन है उसको देख लें हम <laughs> एक फायदा दूसरा फायदा बताइए क्यों देखते हैं ओ पे जो कंटेंट नहीं दिख रहा है नेटफ्लिक्स पर वो देखना है तीसरा फायदा बताइए गेम जो इलीगल है जो क्रिमिनल गेम्स है हमें देख खेल लें तो डोंट्स जो जो हमने डोंट्स कर रखा है वो बीपीएन के थ्रू हो रहा है डूज इसीलिए हम बीपीएन यूज कर रहे हैं बीपीएन से कोई सिक्योरिटी के लिए बीपीएन यूज नहीं करता करता है क्या अब मैं आपको बताऊंगा कि जो लोग वीपीएन यूज कर रहे हैं और सोच रहे हैं कि ये जो खैर मेरे पास समय कम है तो नहीं बताता डिस्कॉर्ड कितने लोग यूज करते हैं डिस्कॉर्ड क्या है जानते हैं आप लोग टेलीग्राम क्या है जानते हैं आप लोग अरे वाह क्या है ऐप <laughs> है ओह माय गॉड किस चीज की ऐप है टेलीग्राम किस क्या करता है मैसेजिंग ऐप है ओ माय गॉड कितने लोग टेलीग्राम पर चैटिंग करते हैं कितने लोग टेलीग्राम पर चैट करते हैं कोई नहीं करता है सबके फोन में क्यों है तो टेलीग्राम चैट मैसेजिंग ऐप नहीं है चैट मैसेजिंग के नाम पर धोखा है उसके पीछे इलीगल काम करने का 
एंट्री है क्या है वो पायरेटेड फिल्म लाल सिंह चड्डा अभी देखो एच डी क्वालिटी डाउनलोड पायरेटेड गेम बिटकॉइन खरीदना अभी खरीदो ड्रग खरीदना अभी खरीदो बंदूक खरीदना अभी खरीदो और जो कुछ भी इलीगल है सब कंटेंट वहां पड़ा हुआ है पायरेटेड पासवर्ड नेटफ्लिक्स हॉटस्टार भर भर के पासवर्ड आप ढूंढो नेटफ्लिक्स पासवर्ड डेढ़ लाख पासवर्ड मिलेंगे आपको तो फिर वो चैट मैसेजिंग ऐप कैसे तो ये जो मिथ है ना डिस्कॉर्ड क्या है डिस्कॉर्ड सारे बच्चों के फोन में मिलता है और डिस्कॉर्ड इज ए क्रिमिनल ऐप बिकॉज इट इज एन एनोनिमस चैट ऐप डिस्कॉर्ड में आपका कोई आइडेंटिटी नहीं जाता आपको एक हैंडल मिलता है उससे आप बात करते हो लास्ट ईयर जब ट्विटर हैक हुआ था तीन बच्चे पकड़े गए सत्रह साल का नमा फजेली और से उन्नीस साल का और इक्कीस साल का तीनों डिस्कॉर्ड पर ट्विटर सर्विस बेचते थे ट्विटर एज एन हैक सर्विस एक हफ्ते के अंदर उठा लिए गए चालीस साल की जेल होगी उनको सत्रह साल के लड़के को सो डोंट डू इट क्योंकि आप चाहे डिस्कॉर्ड पर हो चाहे वीपीएन पे हो पकड़ तो मिलूंगा ही थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू अमित जी मुझे लगता नहीं है अभी किसी का जाने का मन भी है पहले इन सबको नींद आ रही थी ये भी सच है ठीक है तो वो अपने वो जो अभी तक ना अभी आपने साइबर अटैक्स कैसे होते हैं बताया अभी ये नहीं बताया कि इसे बचना कैसे है वो डोंट्स नहीं वो मास्किंग बताओ वो बताना पड़ेगा हाँ अब अटैक ही बताऊंगा नेक्स्ट स्टेज में लेके जाऊंगा नहीं नहीं बट थैंक यू एंड आई एम श्योर वी विल हैव मोर सेशन विद यू इन एनी केस No, thank you, Amitji, and in any case, uh, India Future Foundation has been a partner to our activity, and of course, we will take up other activities with uh, India Future Foundation. And I'm sure you will have not uh, not stop questions. Jitne bhi honge, bhej di jega. You have a secretariat link. Just write to us. Whatever things we can help it out, we'll do. We'll see if we can have another session on how to safeguard yourself, not on don'ts, but how to be aware of on those things. So that's important. Like you mentioned, don'ts, everybody preaches, but difficult to follow that preach is important to be aware on how to be, how to actually safeguard yourself. So with this, we come to the conclusion and the end of our event, uh, Cybercom 22, 2022. Thank you all for being supportive. Thank you being live audience at the end of the session. And thank you, Amitji, for making it a literally rocking in a live session. So with this, we can conclude this session. There's a, height, uh, there's a tea which is being served outside. Please join us for the tea, and we look forward to more sessions in future. Thank you all. to all of you and a very warm good morning I would say. We are very very delighted to meet in person after a long phase of pandemic which lasted and of course all the precautions which we still continue to take in. It's a very as part of FICI and as part of the ICT team we are very very happy that we are having this particular discussion on a very important subject on an important day as part of an important month which is being celebrated as a cyber month and of course, the Cyber Jagrupta Divas was already announced by the government. So we are more than happy to have you all here as part of FIKI and the, the event which is being organized in the, with the support of Ministry of Electronics and IT and I4C. And on a very important subject on cyber security, we are def definitely going to talk about how to accelerate the evolution of cyber security in India. So thank you all for joining us here. And as I mentioned, we are very happy that we have a very distinguished set of people who have joined us today. Of course, the Power Pack uh, panel of the inaugural, who is being, who is, uh, which is going to start the day with a followed by various panel discussions, case study presentations, special addresses during the day. So we hope all of you are able to stay with us throughout the day and we look forward to your participation. Apart from that, we also give chance to the delegates to be part of the interactive sessions in the interactive discussions which would happen during various panel discussions. So we are more than happy and thank you all for 
taking out the time. I know there were various traffic advisories being issued because we are, we've started this event when the Interpol event is simultaneously starting today. So thank you all for taking the pain to join us today in the morning. And with this, I would now like to uh, welcome the dignitaries for the inaugural session. Uh, 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 with a round of applause from the people in the audience, can I request uh, Lieutenant General Dr. Rajesh Pan, National Service Secretary for Medical and Special Secretary for Government of India, to come and join in the audience. Dr. Sanjay Bhai, Director General, Indian Surgeon, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India. Mr. Nivesh Andre, Founder of Nuclear Software and Polaris Financial Technology. Mr. Ashutosh Chandra, Senior Member, IT and ITS Committee 50. And we have Dr. Ajay Data, Co Chair, IT and ITS Committee 50, who is joining online. He was supposed to actually. Come, uh, come with us in the in person for this meeting, but due to some problem with the airlines in the morning, we couldn't take off in the any time. So he is joining us from Jaipur. So that's the beauty of IT, and that's something which our uh, I would say the pandemic has further taught us that uh, the uh, there are now the hybrid modes which go on. There are a lot of things which we can do it in the virtual mode also. Getting him here, so this kind of contingency which happened in the morning, he is able to have us here. So Dr. Ajay Data, welcome. And I'm Sarika Kuryani as the Director and ICT Head of FIKI. So with respect to the subject, I'll just, uh, while we hear the dignitaries, I would just mention a few things. So we know that cyber security has not been new, like I mentioned, and that's why we talk about the evolution of cyber security. But we do understand that uh, this, this subject has taken further importance during the time of pandemic. As it is always said that every crisis has a silver lining. So this pandemic came up with the silver lining that the digitization took place at a very rapid pace. Something which was supposed to happen in decades happened in a couple of years. And with this, of course, the cyber security emerged as a very important vertical. We have seen how, uh, how this uh, part of cyber security has been handled uh, during the time of the pandem pandemic. We've heard various um, Attacks which have been increased, or I would say the number of cyber incidents which have been reported during the time. So while uh, these things come up, there also lies the opportunities that how to gear up for them, how to prepare ourselves well for them. If we talk about, uh, I mean, all of us right now completely dependent on IT in our day-to-day -day lives. If we, whether being handling any particular respect of our uh, home or any professional. So of course, uh, to get ourselves secure completely is very, very important. So keeping uh, that in mind, there are very steps which as a person we, or as an organization we need to take, uh, take it forward. Uh, one is of course getting your networks and the programs and everything being up to date. Second is to have a right cyber shield and of course keep on checking the vulnerabilities of the thing. And third is the knowledge sharing. The, if the incidents are reported and the uh, attack patterns are being shared, it becomes easy for us, I mean, as I mean to say, as the people who all are involved and being part of it, to take next steps on it. So one, uh, one of the reasons for having this CyberCom, the initiative which Vicky has started back in 2018, and we have been very uh, thankful to the government and, of course, Lieutenant General Pan that we have been having these discussions on this subject on various areas. I still remember uh, Jennifer mentioning about uh, the cyber incident in the year 2020 when the pandemic was just uh, into the run and we were talking about various things which needs to be taken care of. India did talk about, uh, as part of Wiki, we did talk about the cyber resilience during that time. But now when we stand today, the things have changed in a different fashion. Uh, we, we know that overall, uh, if we talk about uh, the numbers, uh, the security spending from the world, it is expected that we would have around USD around 175 billion in, uh, I would say, by the end of 2023. And it is further expected to grow at a CAGR of 8.1% in the tenure of 2020 to 2024. So with these numbers and the importance and the way our life is being actually affected by the IT and how cyber is going to be an integral part of it. We are happy to present this discussion uh, the conference of CyberCon 2022 to all of you. With these words, I would uh, stop myself here and I would now request Dr. Ajay Data, the co chair of IT and ITS committee, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Over to you, Dr. Data. Thank you, uh, Sarika, for wonderful setting the context. And uh, I'm extremely sorry I could not be part of this very distinguished panel. And uh, uh, as the plan happens, 
I had to be in Jaipur uh, in spite of my tickets and everything was planned to be with all of you. So I'm extremely sorry for could not make it there, but still I will make my uh, welcome speech and try to be uh, as participative as possible. Left Lieutenant General Radesh Pant, National Cyber Security Coordinator and Special Secretary to the Government of India, Dr. Sanjay Dahel, Director General Indian Computer and Emergency Response Team, certain in the mini meeting, Yogesh Handley, founder of Nucleus, and Gauri Gokhale, co-chair, my colleague in Task Force of Data Production and Privacy, Fiki. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the inaugural session of CyberCon 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's business world, cybersecurity has in fact become a part of day-to-day -day operations. It has become part of our board meetings. It has become part of our investors and funding discussions. However, we have to keep in mind that cybersecurity, data breaches, and cyber attacks are not only for business problems. They impact the entire ecosystem, which require both tactical and strategic solutions in terms of technology and policy framework. One of the reasons cyber camps are increasing is because it is cheap, fast, highly profitable compared to other type of crimes. And with the invent of 5G coming in, the things will change dramatically in this world. On the other front, these cyber crimes can cost organizations millions of dollars in damage. While I talk about damage, one more thing I would like to point out here India has spent quite a less amount on cybersecurity in comparison to our competitive countries. For example, China has spent around $10 billion on cybersecurity, and our fund allocated in India for cybersecurity is 550 crores and 515 crores. And that's the difference which we need to probably bridge in the future to come. It is not about just financial cost, it's about our damage and reputation. So what do we need to protect ourselves? We need security plan, infrastructure, security framework, skilled professionals, monitoring those security systems. I always wonder in terms of cyber security, we do not have, it's a comparison, we do not have policemen or a watchman in every home, but we still feel secure. Is this the same situation for the end user in the same principle? Can there be an ecosystem of protection? Can there be a more fundamental umbrella of protection that end user or people who really do not understand this still feel protected the way they protect, they feel protected right now in a physical world? Ever evolving cyberspace landscape is a good security plan, demands proactive measures, including regular technology upgrades, awareness, and skilling and reskilling to the stakeholders. As organizations evolve, merge and grow over time, their network and systems become more complicated, we all know that, and things may slip through the cracks. We, we may need to fill those gaps. How do we do that? I think we will discuss this today. How do we do knowledge sharing? And, and if it is a very critical thing, what are we doing around it? And the more important thing, I think the solution lies in by exchanging our notes on cyber attacks and how can we overcome them. That's a very important part of dealing with our cyber crime. In this digital age, the largely characterized by the shift from traditional industry to an economy based on information technology, which has further pushed by COVID-19. Obviously, we all know our dependency on GDP used to be almost 50% from agriculture. That is no more true. That is by services of more than 50% now. This, this indicates the world is changing, the country is changing, and we require just like Digital India, we probably need secured India as a vision. Never before the world at large has witnessed or prepared to embrace a revolutionary change in technology adoption as a way of life, the new normal. While this is in a way of bringing revolutionary changes, it is also bringing the question of emerging challenges relating to increased network attacks, cyber attacks, so on and so forth. And in this context, if we can also look at out of this uh, seminar, can we have one <clears throat> agenda which we will achieve as a country? Country can be completely man in middle attack. And I would like to address the chairs and uh, the distinguished panelists here that we 
could have one mission achieved. This country is managed the middle attack free. And with a one policy guide intervention there, that no APIs, no website is allowed to be hosted in India, which does not have SSL. Very simple direction, and we can guarantee that no middle man on middle attack can happen. At least one protection can we can ensure. All the dot in domains, all the dot com domains, all the dot gov domains which will be hosted will never have direct access without the SSL. And with very simple commitment which we can take out of this conference would be a great thing. Both enterprise and government agencies need to strengthen their cybersecurity infrastructure to proactively address the possible challenges. And there is a lot which is happening uh, around that. We always follow, but the crimes are happening. Probably we need to be ahead in the curve. And with the same aim, to advance the dialogue around cyber and security for Atmanirbhar Bharat, we have gathered here today for CyberCon 2022. Our IT uh, Enable Services Committee has been proactively working in the space of IT adoption and security. The committee has several initiatives and we will be delighted to work with NCSC and METI in future for activities around cyber security awareness. This is my great pleasure. I would like to welcome Lieutenant General Dr. Rajesh Pan, National Cyber Security Coordinator and Special Secretary to the Government of India. Sir, we would like to thank you for supporting our initiative with your fine presence and we thank you for joining us here. I would also, also like to welcome Dr. Sanjay Behel, Director General, Indian Computer Emergency Response Team, Ministry of Information and Technology and IT, Government of India. Thank you, Dr. Behel, for guessing this gathering with your presence and motivating us. I would like to also welcome Dr. Yogesh Enle, founder of Nucleus Software and Polaris Financial Technology for accepting our invitation to join today's session. I truly feel honored and also feel, also regret that I could not be joining you to share the dais with such a great mind and sincerely thanks all of you by sparing your valuable time with us. Lastly, I would like to welcome our audience, industry members and our friends from the media with us. I would like to conclude my welcome remarks. Thank you all for joining in. Jai Hind, over to you, sir. Dr. Vita for, uh, for your welcome address on behalf of Vicky and thank you for putting up the tone and like you mentioned, uh, sir, we are more than happy as part of the industry to work with you to take the, uh, I would say, the agenda of the cyber security for Atme Bharat and we would be more than happy to work with all the stakeholders in the best possible way, way for the interest of our nation. So thank you, Dr. Data. With this, I would now request Mr. Ashutosh Jadda, who is the senior member from IT and ITS committee from PIKI, to kindly deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, Mr. Jadda. Thank you, uh, Sarita. Thank you, and uh, uh, good morning, General Pan. It's okay, can you? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, good morning, General Pan, Sanjay Behel, uh, Mr. Andre, and Dr. Dutta on the on, on uh, virtually. And of course, good morning to everybody, all the attendants here. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, approach to this, to my opening remarks at this point of time. Not slightly different, but a very obvious uh, report. The, the Honorable Prime Minister has set a goal for India's GDP to be a five trillion, for India to become a five trillion dollar economy uh, in, in the near future by 2025. And, and we're seeing that happen. Right, we are currently in the top five uh, GDP aspirants as far as the global world is concerned. Out of that, we look at the digital economy to be we reach nearly a trillion dollars, and that is obviously going to be on the back back of you know, a strong digital infrastructure that we're going to create. Um, if I if we look at if we look at the three areas that define our trillion dollar, five trillion dollar economy for, for India, right? It's focused on economic growth, inclusive economic growth, it's focused on social well-being and building an India for the future, right? And technology is going to play a very strong role in each one of those areas. The other aspiration that the Ministry of IT and, and uh, the government has kept for itself is to make India the, di the data and AI hub to the world, right? So having the ability to leverage the data which is created not just in India but globally, process it, drive, derive insights, create solutions which are exported to the world and not just used in India. 
Now all that can only happen and people will only use technology if they trust it. Trust is going to be the most important factor. And where will trust stem from? Trust will stem from if we are secure. If we are secure in the knowledge that the technology that we are using, the technology that we are leveraging is secure, our money will not go away, our products will, be to what, will deliver what they are supposed to deliver, they will be transparent, open, accountable, in all forms. And this is the Cybersecurity Month, but I think it's Cybersecurity Month or Cybersecurity Day uh, is just to remind us we need to be cyber secure every single moment of our lives. Uh, as Sarika and Dr. Dutt was talk were talking, uh, the pandemic has, has leveraged, helped us recognize the but let's also not forget that technology, every every technology, right, uh, or every new innovation, and you can go back to the, you know, millions of years ago when fire was discovered, right? There's a positive to something, there is a negative. You can use fire to cook food, give you heat, you can also use fire to burn somebody's house down, right? So there is a positive and a negative. So technology enabled us, enabled society to possibly uh, weathered through the storm of the pandemic that we saw the last two years. But what we've also seen in the last two years has been an increase in the cyber attacks, has been an increase in the type of phishing mails that have happened. And if you really look at the type of cyber attacks which have increased over the last few years, we can classify them in various forms. Financial, which is ransomware, phishing, you had military attacks, cyber being used for military purposes in, in various parts of the world. You've looked at cyber disrupting critical infrastructure. And if you, uh, and, and if some of us remember four years ago, there were these, the, these ransomware attacks globally, which took down hospitals, etc. especially I remember in, 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 in the United Kingdom, right? And, and a hospital is a critical infrastructure. It's a critical social infrastructure, right? We've seen cyber attacks to spread disinformation, which is very interesting, because when you look at cyber attacks to spread disinformation, it actually creates, undermines public confidence in society, in governments, in, in, in institutions, right? And that can be very detrimental. So let's not just look at cyber attacks from the fact that my phone can be hacked. Cyber attacks can take many, many different types of forms, right? We've also seen in the last few years that they, they, they're increasingly becoming a tool for state as well as non-state actors acting against other states and non-states, right? So at the end of the day, it's extremely important that we look at, we, we look at cyber security becoming a part and parcel of our life, right? If anybody or any organization thinks that they are very secure or they haven't been hacked, then I think they're thinking extremely incorrectly. Because it's not about if you are hacked, it is, or when you're going to be hacked, it's the fact how well protected are you or how well can you detect when you're going to get hacked. That's the more important thing. And the fundamental piece that we all need to understand is is the fact that the weakest link in cyber is possibly the human interface. You will always find an individual somewhere, you can put up any number of security walls and, and, and I'm sure General Pant and Sanjay Behel are here who, who, who are much more knowledgeable on this, in this space, but it is always going to be that human interface which can actually break down the wall, break down any security that you have. You can create ways to mitigate that, but the human interface is, is possibly one of the weakest things. And hence, one of the key things that we need to look at is how do we drive awareness? How do we drive awareness at every level, level to, to, to drive good cyber hygiene practices? 
Uh, but of course, apart from that, there are other things that we need to put in place, which is you know relevant multi-factor authentication processes. We need to look at uh, uh, cybersecurity software. We need to have good cybersecurity policies. And as certain uh, recently, some four months ago, we came out with with, with guidelines on on making people aware uh, about about the fact that there is a possibility of even a, a cyber attack happening, right? And and I think in that conversation we joked about it that if you even spot someone who thinks who you think is 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 possibly uh, 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 you know suspicious, report it. It's always good to be forewarned and forearmed rather than you know react later. But fundamentally, any good cybersecurity policy needs to help detect, defend, disrupt, and deter. The four Ds. We need to ensure that happens. It ensure that happens with us individually, in our organizations, in the government, in society. And hence, it's important for the private sector, society, and the government to work together to ensure that people, processes, installations, infrastructure, and our data remain secure. Because only if we can do that for our country will we build the trust for others to trust our software, our solutions, and help us move on that path to becoming a $5 trillion economy. I'm very proud to say that as part of FIKI, we've set up this, this committee on, on privacy and data protection to help look at what are the requirements as far as, as, far as, this is, uh, as, far as data privacy and uh, uh, cyber security concerned. In addition to that, we've always been working with, with, with the National Cyber Security Coordinates Office, METI and CERTIN, to, to, to work on the policies that are coming out as far as cyber security is concerned. And, and uh, recently we are actually, I think very, uh, very soon we're going to be uh, also organizing a cyber hygiene and cyber awareness workshops, which, are, which hopefully will be our way as PIKI to, to drive awareness amongst everyone, whether it is small and medium businesses, individuals, or larger organizations on the good practices that we do. Uh, with that, I just sort of end my opening remarks and hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shadra, for, of course, highlighting uh, the importance and how uh, it is very important, which is even our honorable employees, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, you mentioned that to have a open, safe, trusted, and accountable India. That's something as part of uh, India we are aspiring at, and that's why the various uh, policies, various directions, and as well as the support from industry and the different stakeholders are being made. And it's it's going to be a continuous joint effort of all of us to make us lead to something which Mr. Chandam did mention, that the human intervention, which is the weakest link, it needs to be taken care of when we talk about the cyber security, the whole chain about it. So, and we all, are, we all are aware that we did mention about how the market has been growing, how, uh, of course, the number of cyber attacks, which is also been increasing and how it's been taken care of. Uh, so all those things. Uh, we also would be very happy that as part of Wiki, we have various MSMEs and many of you are also part of uh, discussion today during the panel also and during, as well as in the audience who are working in the products and the services line for cyber security. The numbers for that is also very encouraging in terms of the growth rate. I mean, if you talk about in 2000, um, I think in 20, we were standing around, uh, the uh, cyber security services market was around 4.5 billion US dollars, which is now for India, and of course now, while in 2021, we've reached around 8.5. So it's a growth rate which is very high, and we see that with <coughs> India as a trust, trusted digital partner, few steps more needs to be taken so that the whole ecosystem of uh, innovation as well as the products and services that we can be actually utilized for the cyber security domain. So thank you, Mr. Chenda. And as part of it, we are more than happy. Like you mentioned, we will be taking up various cyber hygiene and cyber awareness workshops <coughs> with the support of, uh, of course, METI and NCSA office. So we will be taking this discussion forward across India, not limited. So this is, of course, uh, said the uh, central level which we are able to organize for all of you, but we will be happy to take the discussions at the different parts of India. With this, I would now request Mr. Yogesh Chandle, founder of the software and Polaris Financial Technologies, to kindly deliver the industry at risk. Just a housekeeping announcement. People who are sitting in the back can move a little ahead because there are people who are joining because 
the they stuck in the jam because of the interpol event. So if they can move forward, it's easier for the other people who come later on can set up the bar. So a slight movement without the disturbance would be helpful. Thank you. Over to the minister. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And uh, respected dignitaries of the dais, Dr. Jalil Pant, Dr. Bahel, Mr. Ashutosh Chadda, Dr. Data, and Professor Dr. Sahika. Very happy to be here with, with all of you. And uh, what Ashutosh described, I infer it as, that we don't have to look at a jail in a crowd place. You can sit in the house and sit in the house. And also, if we have कंपनी को कोई नुकसान अपने कंप्यूटर को नुकसान पहुंचा रहे हैं तो हमें उसके ऑफिस दफ्तर में कोई जरूरत नहीं बहुत सारे वास्ते उसके दफ्तर में अंदर जाने के लिए और किसी देश के ऊपर कुछ हमला करना है तो कहीं कोई बॉर्डर पे फोन कॉल भेजने की जरूरत नहीं है फोन की बताया गया है कि कैसे किस तरह से हम एक दूसरे देश के ऊपर अटैक कर सकते हैं प्रभाव डाल सकते हैं तो इन this is the scenario we are living in today. Uh, just to give you my own personal introduction, my background, I'm also like many of uh, you sitting here, I'm an IT entrepreneur. I graduated from IIT Delhi in 1979. And ever since I've been working, since then I've been working in IT industry. Uh, in 86, we had uh, set up a company called Nucleus Software, which started working for Citibank in India. And each and every system that Citibank used for the next 10 years, even a lot of them today also, were developed by us. So we knew very you know, intricately from inside what software development for a highly technology dependent bank means. Just to give you an example how the way we, we uh, experienced some of the catastrophic events uh, during those days. Uh, perhaps some of you may remember at Citibank India, here in uh, Kronat Place, Jeevan uh, Tara building, there was a bomb attack in the lobby area. In Air India building, again there was a bomb attack at one point of time. Now in both the situations, we had to very quickly bring that bank up to function again. So, so we developed, understood a lot of practices that are required to deal with emergencies. And what we find is tools, techniques, processes, and people, as uh, Ajay also mentioned, people. Each and every people, process, technology, all three elements have to be addressed to be able to respond, identify, detect, and respond to any kind of uh, problems, issues, cyber attacks, physical attacks, whatever, whatever it may be. You know, uh, now, just to highlight a few points, I would like to uh, you know, share one or two uh, uh, anecdotes, which we keep hearing a lot. There was an attack on a water treatment plant in the US uh, uh, at one point of time. And the how how it was averted, this is that little anecdote that I recollect, is the operator who was watching the console noticed that some cursors movement, random cursor movements are taking place in the screen. Attentiveness. Right? Somebody had been able to hack into the system, but the operator who was there at that moment could sense. And once he says it, he investigated and was able to reset. That means he was able to take care of and counter the attack. Compare it with another situation. In this situation, in other countries, there was a, there was a nuclear uh, enrichment was happening and those enrichments were impacted. How, the, way, the way they were impacted, again, very briefly, the you know, the centrifugal uh, devices, the rotors, which would be used to enrich it, and uranium, they would rotate at a certain speed. Now, when the speed changes, it increases very high or goes down, we can hear. Some of you who are technologists, who have uh, some background in the engineering and other things, would probably be able to understand it well. 
those centrifuges, their speed parameters got, were disturbed. So the tolerance in which it has to operate, that was changed to a significantly higher level. The operators and several, you know, the technical team there did hear that something's, you know, we are hearing some big sound, you know, not normal sound in the rotors, but they, by the time they reacted, the rotors had got, you know, bad. Now, all this happened without even going to the country. This is the power of cellular. We all try and secure our homes, our offices, our buildings, our banks, but we leave one gate open. And I'm sure uh, all of you understand which gate I'm talking about. Anybody who does not know this gate, please raise your hand. I'll, I'll, I'll bring attention to that. Does, do all of you know this, this gate that we are talking about, which we keep if we leave open in our houses, in our factories, in our businesses. Any, anybody? This, this is our internet connection, the broadband connection. Every packet that's coming in, at any point of time, day, night, any hour, could be a malicious package, could be a malicious packet. Could create have could upset our router, could infect our computer, could take away our computer store information. Now, given this scenario, how do we deal with such situations? You know, I'm just I'm not trying to give statistics, growth, yay, oh, but what I'm trying to uh, come to is we as people are very very critical resource or critical element to understand, identify, react, better, correct, set the situation right to all these situations. Uh, we know that when we want to impact a system, some changes we want to make, there are six conditions. Any of the condition changes, the system will start changing. And what are these six conditions? There are three explicit conditions policies, procedures, resource flows. Yes, that's where the Pant, Dr. Behel, they can set guidelines, they can set policies, they can set principles, they are very visible. The other two conditions are, of course, uh, relatively below the radar, not so visible, are power dynamics or relationships and connections. And the most important one, which is absolutely hidden, very difficult to measure, monitor, are human models, our belief systems. Right? All kind of policies can be set. We can create resources, we can put everything. But if we are not conscious enough, we are not aware enough, the systems will, will make no difference. And today, we I shudder to think that more than that are small little kids in our homes who are attending schools and who are spending a lot of time on mobile devices or internet devices. They don't even understand what hygiene of the internet connection, internet maintenance, online, uh, this thing is all about. And each and every one, right from the little child to the grandfather and the granddad and grandmother, Anybody could become a victim, could become a, could let the perpetrator in. Now, in such a scenario, this becomes very important. Some of the things that uh, Ashutosh uh, highlighted, the cyber hygiene, the cyber uh, uh, vigilance, cyber uh, security, they become very, very critical. How do we take this message? You know, we as an all as industry people, uh, especially the ones who are from technology industry, we understand. We understand the issue of uh, viruses coming into our system. We, we set up firewalls. We set up all kinds of things. But not everybody is as tech savvy as us, and that that makes our task a uh, lot more important, lot more critical. This issue is as severe as smoking is injurious to health. Similarly, being, not being aware of these cyber issues is extremely injurious to health. How do we communicate this message to everybody? 
to the industry, to people, to schools, to colleges, is, is a huge, huge task. And this is where we feel that we as FIKI, together with uh, uh, organizations like Dr. Pans and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Behels, can do work in creating uh, awareness, spreading knowledge, information. Each and everybody has become a warrior today. And we, we need to learn and understand and maybe get drafted into this force which is which has to deal with these cyber securities and cyber uh, crime and cyber uh, breaches and everything. And I'll stop here. And I'm so keen to hear uh, Dr. Behel and uh, Jawad Pant about how, how these things are being viewed at their level and how can we contribute to their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amri, for, of course, like you mentioned, cyber illiterate is injurious to health. So it is very, very, very important that apart from us being knowing this stuff and the people who are sitting in the room are cyber literate, but you need to spread the message more to your peers. It has to be a multiplier effect. And like you mentioned, um, that one gate which we normally keep it open, and it is, I mean, you heard the news, recent news also, the organizations being targeted. One of the big conglomerates was under the cyber attack last Friday. So we all know those things. We know it's being a, it can be a normal human being, a normal, being, a normal person, a housewife sitting in the home, or a technique can also be, and also even the company. So this is something which is very important for each and everybody. So with this, I would now request uh, Dr. Sanjay Dev, Director General of um, SRT, which is uh, Indian Computer Response, uh, Emergency Response Team, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India, to kindly deliver this special address. Thank you, Dr. Behan, for joining us. And we know that as part of PIKI, we have been working with SRT on the various guidelines and the policies which have been recently announced and been taken by SRT. We are also more than happy to collaborate with you in our future activities and also the future things that the government is planning on. Over to Good morning, and uh, <coughs> first of all, I'd like, like to thank Kiki for inviting me uh, on this platform. And uh, good morning to Dr. Ajay Data, Dr. Kikos Tata, Dr. Anle, Dr. Sanjay Rupan, and Sarisa. I think a uh, lot has already been talked about as to what needs to be done from a cyber security perspective of the cyber security sector. So, and, and uh, while I leave the aspects of strategy, etc., whatever this uh, session was about uh, accelerating the evolution of cyber security in India and the strategy to the uh, general fund, uh, I will take a very uh, specific and narrow view uh, from a perspective of incidents, etc., and the threat landscape. Uh, I think one of the important points mentioned by uh, Mr. Anley was you can have all sorts of stuff, but if your culture is not there for security, you're going to have a huge challenge. And that is the problem that we keep facing. We believe in this Atiti Devo Bhava, so everything is open. We don't believe in shutting doors or doing anything. You go back into your culture, did you have cyber security or did you, did people think about security? Can you think of where, when was the first firewall, Any anyone? <coughs> so we are sitting and coming towards uh, Diwali and rightly mentioned the Lakshman Rekha was the sort of first firewall. He said, Sita should not cross. And you saw, if you cross, what happens? <coughs> so, you know, I'm just trying to say, maybe people did think about a lot of this uh, stuff long back. Similarly, to see where, when did the first passwords come into picture? You heard about Kulja Simshi? So, so you can trace back a lot of stuff which is now being done and people talk about and then multi-factor authentication, etc., all these things. <coughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dhaka talked about digital India and saying secure India. But you can't have digital India without security. So security is anywhere 
very important pillar in digital India itself. And uh, Adhikos mentioned about the digital economy being one trillion dollars, etc. Yes, uh, with inclusive uh, economic growth and social well-being. And we know today that data is the most important. But how do you use that data? Who has to have that data? How are people amassing that data? Those are things that need to be addressed. And trust, while it is the most important, uh, you need a, a open, safe, secure and trusted internet. And only if you have all these things, will you have a digital economy? Otherwise, across uh, economies, you will have distrust. And as was mentioned in terms of uh, various threats, you have disinformation, you have misinformation, you have destructive and destruct destruction of essential services for citizens. Uh, and in terms of the threat landscape, what we see is that as you adopt more and more of digital and emerging technologies, uh, such as cloud virtualization, work from home, uh, mobile apps, etc., which are on the increase, these have not been properly secured, properly configured, they have not been properly audited, and your systems are not hardened. Because of all these uh, lack of all these things, it is very clear that security is not being part of the design. If security is not being part of the design, how will you go forward? So you don't have a basic foundation of security and you are wanting to have a banded approach. The banded approach will not work. And because of this, we are in a position at CERT uh, to see vulnerable services uh, through our cyber swachta kendra and we are in a position to inform organizations and users that you are vulnerable and this is what you need to do uh, and these vulnerabilities also cause unauthorized access there is also usage of these systems by malicious actors for launching further attacks like distributed denial of service etc <clears throat> there is the second type of uh, uh, attacks uh, in terms of the threat landscape is the constant increase of advanced threat actors for conducting data theft for espionage as well as for ransomware. Both these points were mentioned uh, previously. And this ransomware again is exfiltration of data before it is encrypted. So as I said data is important. Now, who is holding this data? They have already exfiltrated it. What they do with it is a different story altogether. And then they encrypt it. And they demand ransom from organizations from where they have taken. And now they have also started going towards users. Putting pressure on them that you should inform the organizations to pay the ransom. And then they further go around and leak this information out in the open domain. Since I mentioned about ransomware, I do not know how many of you have gone to our website. Uh, we had uh, published the first half ransomware, ransomware report for India. Where we said there has been a 51% increase in the first half of 2022 uh, in comparison to 2021. And the top three uh, sectors which are being impacted for the IT, ITS and data centers, the uh, manufacturing sector and the finance sector. And if you say from the critical uh, sectors, uh, those in the oil and gas, transport and power. Having said about this ransomware, this has become a menace globally and uh, I will leave it to Dr. Pan, maybe he will touch upon it. But there are various initiatives of counter ransomware initiative, etc., which are being uh, carried out. And uh, we had recently conducted, a certain had recently conducted a uh, counter ransomware drill and exercise for about 16 countries of Asia Pacific to see how each of them uh, compared, how what are their best practices and what needs to be done, etc., and how we go forward. We've also seen an increase in the Android banking trojans. 
uh, basically a lot of you are using mobile apps and if you are on the Android platform, there are various trojans there. So let me take one uh, simple example. Recently, uh, certain became aware of a phishing site of a well-known bank, Indian bank, and it, this was hosted on a cloud platform. The phishing page was collecting personal identifiable information such as username, password, mobile, name, date of birth, account number, PAN number, Aadhaar number, email ID of the bank's customers. The site also issued malicious certificate to fraud sites and it was issued through a trusted certificate source. Now, how do you go around investigating such an incident? Now, because as a citizen, you have been duped. It's not one, because banking customers, all of them would presume that this is from the bank and you will click on this site. <coughs> so, how would someone go around investigating this? So, what we do at certain, we break it down. First of all, you need a point of contact. On this... Uh, of this cloud platform, you know, it's hosted there. So you need to take that down, so you need to have some point of contact there. If you don't have a point of contact, what do you do? Second, was this incident reported to <coughs> certain by the cloud service provider in time, so that action can be taken? In this case, obviously not, because CERT was uh, proactively looking at some of these things. As the cloud service provider maintained logs and also the certificate provider have they maintained logs. Fourth, <coughs> if you have the logs, is there time synchronization across these? Why is time synchronization important? If time synchronization is not there, whatever you are seeing on machine A and machine B would vary and just a few seconds could take you to completely different tracks while investigating. And the fifth is, as the cloud service provider and certificate issuer maintain the subscriber details, because now if you do come to this situation, now you want to know who is the one who put up this switching site, etc. You need the subscriber details. Now you see, I have broken this simple incident down in five different parts. And this is where, when we were doing incident analysis previously of various incidents, we found gaps. And that is what led us to issue directions. And I will correct both uh, uh, Sarika and uh, Kasutosh, not guidelines, directions. <coughs> On 28th of April. So the first one was everyone has to maintain proper time synchronization. So if you have to do analysis of incidents, you need that. Second was, you have to report incidents within a period of six hours. Now why is that important? If you don't report incidents at all, think of it in this fashion. You are in your house and there is a fire. Now you can sit and keep analyzing and investigating as to how this fire came, what happened, etc. Or you can call the fire brigade. What would you want to do? Let the house burn down. And if you are in a building, not only your house, the rest of the building also comes down. So if you do not report, how are you going to safeguard yourself and others? So you have the onus on yourself that you have to safeguard not just yourself but also the others. Third, we said you have to have a point of contact. You have to inform them so that we can reach out to them and talk to them and take appropriate measures, tell them what needs to be done, etc. Maintain logs for 180 days for carrying out incident remediation. Fifth, we said that all data centers, retail, VPS and cloud service providers need to maintain subscriber details. So in case there is an issue, and when we are doing investigation, we are able to figure out who had taken these services. And for the sixth one was for the virtual asset providers and exchange providers, 
custodian of uh, wallet provider, etc., to carry out the KYC. Very simple six directions that we are given to address these issues of incidents which are occurring so that citizens can have an open, safe, secure, and trusted internet. And as Ashutosh mentioned, the trust is important. If you have a mechanism, and as Dr. Datta also mentioned, that in the physical space, if you feel safe and secure, you need to feel safe and secure also in the cyberspace. Since October is a cyber security month, let me just uh, tell you, while we do all these things and answer, etc., but we also provide a lot to the stakeholders and our community. So what are the resources from certain? We issue alerts and advisories. If you join the CERT uh, websites for this current month, you will be seeing a lot of tips which are coming out on a daily basis, what to do, what not to do, etc. We provide threat intelligence to organizations, whether they are small, medium, large, whichever size of organization. We provide free tools for removal of bots for Android and Windows platforms. This is a PPP model, so we work with the academia, we work with the industry, we work with the ISPs, and provide these uh, free bot removal tools through our cyber search circuit. We provide training and awareness for organizations. And daily tips, as I mentioned, uh, uh, for the month of October. And we also uh, you know, put up a quiz on the MyGov platform. And I will encourage all of you to go to that platform, look at the quiz, answer the quiz, and you will be able to down, uh, once you complete it successfully, you will be able to download a certificate, etc. So, go ahead and do, uh, attempt it. And we also carry out drills and exercises. As I mentioned, we've done it for the Asia Pacific side. We also do it within the country for various organizations. So, having said all this, uh, these are some of the steps being taken to ensure trust is created with, the, with citizens for the digital India initiative that is there, so that we can move towards the one trillion dollar digital economy. And with this, obviously, we are looking at participation of all with certain and providing responsible disclosures if you do come across incidents, etc. So let us know. Just to give you an idea, the team that we have has been handling one incident every 30 seconds. So you, and we work 24 seconds. 365 days. Yeah. So, while this will only increase as we go towards 5G, this will exponentially increase. But nevertheless, we have to go ahead and make sure that we have a safe and secure digital India. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Behel, for, of course, mentioning about and elaborating on the various directions which came out on 28th of April, various uh, things which need to be taken care of as part of those directions. Uh, what about the, uh, the ransomware and how, how it is going to affect and what are the steps being taken by the surgeon? And of course, like you mentioned, uh, the various things which are specifically also done for the month of October, we would request everybody to kindly visit that certain website so that you get those tips, you can be part of various quizzes you mentioned and of course take the advantage of the various, uh, I would say the various softwares, the free software which, which is being available on that. So thank you sir for highlighting that and like did you mention that your team is handling one incident in 30 seconds. I think one of the figures which is floating is first a quarter of this year almost had almost like two lakh threats in which was there per day. So of course big numbers to be taken care of, we can understand a lot of work in hand policy. So uh, with this, now I would request a Lieutenant General Dr. Rajesh Pan, uh, National Cyber Security Coordinator and Special Secretary to the Government of India to deliver his keynote address. Thank you, sir, first of all, for joining us there. And I know you have a presentation. So we request the team to kindly set up the presentation, please. Over to you, over to you, Dr. Pan.
morning to my fellow panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls. Why I'm saying boys and girls is because I find a lot of young faces uh, in the audience today. So it's nice that uh, the awareness of cyber security is spreading across generations. I have a comment on the uh, subject that we have chosen for CyberCom, accelerating the evolution of cyber security in India. I think we will already evolved. In India, out of 195 nations, today we are 10th in the Global Cyber Security Index. So the evolution part is over. I can understand the acceleration of cyber security that is, that is well taken. So uh, I think some excellent points have been made by my uh, previous speakers. Uh, I'll concentrate on uh, some of the national issues. Yeah, we'll start with the quote from our Prime Minister who says that I dream of a digital India where cyber security becomes an integral part of national security. I think there's no doubt about this, that if you see uh, the examples that have been uh, given of 2010, Nakans in Iran, the Stuxnet attack, 2017, the North Pekia attack, which cost $10 billion losses worldwide. Uh, what happened last year in the US, colonial pipelines case, uh, which supplies 45% gas to the east coast of US. In fact, 90% of the gas stations in Washington DC uh, did not have any gas uh, during this uh, ransomware attack where a ransom of four and a half million dollars was paid and just Kesaya and the CBS Foods uh, closed our home. Uh, just three days back, we had a cyber attack on our Tata Power Company and uh, April, we had a ransomware attack in Oil India Limited, the Vyajan in Assam. This is a real and live threat and there's no doubt that uh, it is a very inherent part of national security. So with that, I will focus on the national cyberspace. While they say that cyberspace is borderless and uh, it is like a global common, uh, but there is an area which we consider as our own where our jurisdiction applies. Uh, even physically, I am aware of all the 120 odd gateways that we have from where the internet traffic comes in and goes out. So we are talking of this interconnected ICT hardware, software, data centers and processes that make up the national cyberspace. Uh, as you can see, everything depends on this. Uh, whether it is uh, e-governance, should I sit there? I can see the slide from there, otherwise. Yeah, this is better. So whether it is e-governance, e-commerce, business, industries, Everything around us, as you can see on the slide, uh, it uh, constitutes national cyberspace. And uh, with uh, 5G, which has recently been launched, uh, so far there are uh, about 5 billion mobile phones in the world uh, today. Uh, internet users, not mobile phone, internet users. And uh, the moment IoT devices start connecting uh, into this uh, 5G network, then the uh, cyberspace is going to expand exponentially from 5 billion to 30 billion. So you can imagine already what uh, Dr. Behel uh, is concerned about. I think maybe you'll have an incident every second after that. So uh, this is what is national cyberspace. And why it is important is because of the strategic aspect of it. So whether it is uh, defense, space, uh, nuclear, transportation, oil and gas, financial, communications, energy. Uh, in India, we have uh, seven sectors that we have officially described and classified as uh, critical sectors. And these are the ones that are shown on the slide. Uh, various countries have different uh, areas. In uh, Australia, it is 14. For them, education is also a critical sector. In US, again, there are 16 sectors. Uh, uh, on the side, in Netherlands, uh, the Heineken beer factory has been described as a critical sector. So different countries based on their uh, national interests, you know, have uh, sectors. We have seven, which includes the one that are uh, shown in this slide. Uh, in addition, cyberspace uh, also comprises of the data, which uh, already has been mentioned. 
So uh, you are aware of the process of uh, data governance in our country. Uh, it started off in the 2017 case of Justice Putuswami, where uh, privacy was declared as a fundamental right. And then we had this process of the Justice Sri Krishna Committee, and a very beautiful document came out of uh, the non-personal data protection bill. The draft was put in the parliament under Minister Leakey. And then uh, we had another committee, somebody said there is a non-personal data also. So we had Chris Govala Krishnan uh, with another committee and he also made a very good report. And by the time uh, the, both the bills were combined, uh, present uh, IT minister said that there are too many amendments. In fact, there were more than 40 amendments to the original bill, which was not coming out very well when it is presented to the parliament. Uh, so a data protection framework is uh, now being formulated, now being formulated. Uh, it is yet to be put up to the public for comments, so I don't think it will go in the winter session. Uh, uh, it will probably be uh, uh, tabled in the budget session uh, early next year. So that is the way the data protection part is being handled, but uh, there is no doubt about its importance. Uh, you are aware of that uh, Cambridge Analytica case where Facebook was fined $5 billion for leaking that 81 million uh, PIA data uh, to uh, Cambridge Analytica. So that's the sort of money that the nation is losing uh, uh, of the data that is being uh, you know, taken away from the country. So uh, this is of course the slide is seen from top to bottom as to who are these people who uh, carry out these attacks. They are the threat actors, they are individuals. Uh, every mafia group today has a very vibrant uh, cyber uh, crime cell because people have made a lot of money and as he was saying you, you know you don't have to go to the uh, Connaught place to get your pocket pick. So there are insiders, important cyber mercenaries, terrorists, state actors and these are the serious ones, the APT groups as they are called. And how do they come? They came in through they come in through the attack vector. Different type of attack vectors are there. Phishing, as Dr. Behar mentioned, is uh, most common social engineering, then there are various malware, Trojans, ransomware has been uh, spoken of. And uh, how do we now control this? It is through policy. So uh, the people, processes and technology, uh, there is a requirement of a policy and that is how we protect national cyberspace. So uh, what is the policy at the moment? It is our national cyber security policy of 2013. It is an excellent document. In fact, we were one of the first few countries in the world to come out with a national cyber security policy. And the vision was to build a secure and resilient cyberspace for citizen, business and government. But uh, from 2013, a lot of things have changed. The Digital India program has completely transformed national cyberspace. A number of attacks, uh, as Dr. Behel mentioned, have gone up from almost 50,000 in 2013 to 14 lakhs. This is last year's his official figure. Then multiple organizations have been raised in the nation. And uh, the threat landscape has changed. There was no crypto earlier, there was no ransomware, the supply chain attacks, everything has changed. And of course, the pandemic has made us more reliant on uh, cyberspace. You're aware of the digital transformation, as it is called, and the increase in uh, cyber crime. As far as the organizations are concerned, the certain was always there. Certain was raised around 2004. Uh, but from 2013, that is when the policy I'm talking about, my office came out of that. Uh, the uh, Department of Telecom uh, created uh, National Cyber Center for Communication Security. NCIPC, a National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center, came out. National Cyber Crime Coordination Center was established. Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center was established by MHA. MEA created a Cyber Diplomacy Division. The various states and sectors created their CSERTs, as it is called. Power, Telecom, Finance, Defense Cyber Agency came out in 2018. Uh, DRDO created a cyber search establishment and the National Security uh, Committee on Telecom for the trusted telecom sector came out. So a lot of uh, new organizations have come up from 2013 onwards. Uh, which is why we have uh, proposed a new National Cyber Security Strategy of uh, 2022 whose vision is to ensure safe, secure, trusted, resilient and vibrant cyberspace for India's prosperity. And each of these words has a meaning behind it. Safe and secure has already been uh, spread out, trusted. Unless we have trust in the environment, all our Digital India program, all our financial systems, uh, people will have doubts about using it. So it has to be trusted. It has to be resilient because attacks are not going to stop. The hard uh, truths of cyberspace are that 
the vulnerability will continue to exist attacks will continue to take place and the uh, the source of these attacks the attribution will be as difficult as it is today so it has to be resilient and vibrant cyberspace for india's prosperity so that is the vision of this new strategy it rests on three pillars of secure strengthen and synergize uh, the existing environment and create a entire ecosystem as was being mentioned and it also contains a action plan as to a large number of objectives who will achieve that objective how much will it cost in what timeline everything is given in this uh, new strategy uh, some recent uh, initiatives which the government has taken dr behel has already mentioned about the directions when a national cyber exercise was conducted uh, for all the cisos of critical sector uh, defense cyber agency has issued various policies cyber swachhata kendra is an excellent facility that is there in uh, certain it is a free facility please make use of it um, uh, the cyber security baseline requirements have been created then various uh, uh, sectors for example in the power sector the uh, guidelines have been issued uh, the uh, all their verticals of power uh, generation transmission distribution grid uh, operations including non renewable energy all of them uh, now have a security operation center their uh, uh, regulator which is the central electricity authority has given extensive guidelines their cisos have been trained so the power sector a uh, lot of uh, action has taken place in the last uh, one or two years and they practice the cyber crisis management also the uh, telecom sector you are uh, some of you may have heard that uh, we uh, launched the trusted telecom portal on 15th of june as per the national security directive for the telecom sector that uh, mandates that any uh, equipment connected to the telecom network of india has to be a trusted product from a trusted source so that is how uh, uh, the telecom sector is being handled and what is a trusted product what is a trusted source uh, uh, my office uh, is the designated authority for that exercise uh, for as far as crime is concerned uh, the portal has been created cybercrime.gov.in 1930 helpline has been created Uh, this is a sore point because 3,500 complaints uh, are reported every day on this portal, and these are the people losing money. In fact, these are the people who know that we have to report on this portal. I'm sure the actual figure is two to three times more than this. So this is a pain area that we are feeling, and uh, all the aspects that we have discussed about how to protect yourself have to be done. Don't click unnecessarily, etc. Uh, national counter ransomware. a task force uh, has been approved by the home minister you will hear of the promulgation uh, very soon on this and uh, there is a composition that is uh, given on this all the known people are there it comprises of uh, four working groups so there is a working group for incident response which uh, dr behel will be leading uh, there is a ransomware security cluster there is a ransomware cooperation uh, and uh, diplomacy international coordination which uh, i will be leading and there is a awareness and capacity building as far as the international cooperation is concerned uh, you are aware of the un group of government expert the open ended working group uh, we are everywhere counter ransomware initiative is uh, is in uh, something that dr behel mentioned it started uh, on 14th of october last year 37 nations are part of this and there are five verticals on this there is a resilience vertical uh, there is a vertical for disruption of the network there is a vertical for illicit finance that is how to trace the money there is a vertical on public private partnership and uh, last vertical is on cyber diplomacy uh, you will be glad to know that india is leading the vertical on resilience and the in person meeting of this uh, counter ransomware initiative is going to take place on 31st october and 1st november in washington dc uh, very soon uh, quad various initiatives have been taken there is a quad senior cyber group where again i am representing uh, and uh, we have handled the supply chain and cooperation within the four quad countries as far as this is concerned then all the other regional dialogues the sco rights the bimstech the brics the colombo security conclave everywhere today cyber security figures in in a very prominent manner uh various free uh, facilities are available or dr behar also mentioned uh, that i have just made a small list as to the free security tools that are available in the cdac uh, website you can go and make use of uh, these facilities Uh, that is given on the uh, cdac dot in. Uh, finally, uh, we all spoke about uh, cyber hygiene uh, this year. As was mentioned, is the National Cyber Security Awareness Month, and the theme this year is uh, the focus is on people in the people process technology triangle, because uh, 
humans as they see are the weakest link. So these are some of the uh, aspects that I keep repeating. Please change your passwords, have multi-factor authentication, uh, think twice prior to clicking a link. Uh, be very, very careful. You know, all these criminals are thinking of new tricks every day, how to you know force you. Uh, yesterday, even I got a message that my electricity connection will be disconnected if I don't pay or ring on this number by 9.30 or something like that. So, uh, I think that chef would have got caught by now. Uh, what is, this is my last slide. The way forward is the release of uh, the strategy that I spoke of, approval of the National Counter Ransomware Task Force, about which you will hear. Uh, regulations for digital lending platforms are going to come out uh, by the RBI, including the regulations for the UPI, etc. Uh, cooperation between state police is something that uh, we look forward to. It is an area where, uh, uh, again, it is related to cyber crime. Uh, then stoppage of fake duplicate SIMs. Uh, we are doing a, a lot of work on this in collaboration with the TSPs, with the, uh, with the, the Department of Telecom, etc. You will be surprised to know we got a man in the no in, in northeast sector who was caught with 4,000 SIM, that one person had 4,000 SIMs. So how did he get that and all that, uh, you know, there is an entire ecosystem, uh, not only in the cyber security, in the criminal world also, that has to be, you know, addressed, the banks, the DOT, the TSP, uh, the people who take a photocopy of your uh, Aadhaar, etc., and the guy who, the Panwala who sells the SIM, everyone is connected. So it's a uh, major problem. Finally, the fake and the mule accounts by banks are also involved. So this is uh, what is going to happen in the near future. And with that, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pant, for actually taking us through the whole ecosystem. And we are really thankful to the government on the various, uh, I would say, the various departments getting involved in it, the, the importance of cyber being felt at various levels. And of course, the support which the government is able to give, give it to the industry and the common man to uh, get uh, be prepared for the cyber things. Um, uh, you did mention about you getting a message uh, recently. So we also had similar kind of an incident within the organization. I'm not going to name it. We have been caught it sorted. Uh, but it was through one of the social media partners, uh, the, uh, uh, so the platform which was being used. And multiple messages were received. And it was, again, a way of uh, mix of, I would say, one was the ransomware and second was, of course, the uh, cyber fraud, I would say, the kind of a thing. So, yeah, the cyber fraud and data breaches are there, which we, I mean, like we mentioned, it is being faced by everybody. So, we all need to be careful. Dr. Pandit mentioned about various uh, steps you need to follow for the cyber hygiene. There is lots of information available on the internet. Um, certain did have, and of course, the like Dr. Pan mentioned, there are things which we need to take care of while we uh, do it on the dealing basis. And uh, also, um, for the people who would need support in, the, uh, in this particular respect, apart from general awareness, the things which they need to take care of. Uh, as part of Wiki, we do have a task force which is working on that domain, apart from the policy issues, we are more than happy to facilitate that process as well. So we know, we understand there have been some regions identified within the country also where, the, where we feel the lots of uh, cyber attacks do get originated uh, apart from the uh, outside India. But um, uh, So we are working on those things also. We will be working with the respective states on that part of it. I'm not going to mention, but names are very prominent to all of you in terms of the regions very much known within the country. So uh, thank you, sir. And um, like you mentioned, our Honorable Prime Minister's vision, we do stand together to work towards creating a very cyber secure Atmanbhar Bharat. And that's something which we all look forward to work uh, towards it. And like you mentioned, we need to further accelerate it. So we, our hope is that from number 10, we are able to uh, jump up the numbers and be able to be in the top five soon. So that is something we all work towards that. It. So with this, I would now like to conclude the inaugural session. Before we wrap up that, I would now request um, Mr. Yogesh Anle to kindly give a green certificate to Lieutenant General Dr. Rajesh Pan. It's a... Can we have the applause for uh, so it's a pretty tough uh, trees which is being planted for tigers in the Sundarbans National Park, West Bengal. So, so apart from secure, we go green, sir. So that's a agenda. So thank you for this. I would request Mr. Ashutosh Chadda to give a green certificate to Dr. Sanjay Behan as a token of appreciation. So the pretty tough trees being planted in your name, Sundarbans National Park, West Bengal.
Thank you. With this, we conclude. I would before that, I, it will not be fair on my part. I'd like to thank all of you who are present here, and also, apart from the organizers, the various agencies who supported. We would like to acknowledge the support we have received from various partners: the, the National Forensic Science University, Cyber Peace Foundation, India Future Foundation, ITS, and many others whose logos are not reflected here, but have been part of formulating the agenda and the discussions we are going to carry it forward. Thank you all for your support, and thank you, sir for uh, joining us here and we requ we would straight away move on to the next session i would request the audience to remain stay connected the panelists and the moderator is already here Thank you all. Uh, we directly move on to the next uh, panel discussion. Uh, the team would take some time to set up the stage, and the subject which we are taking it forward is a very, very important one. We know, we understand the importance of the new age technologies, how they are emerging, and how they are affecting our businesses. How they are also very important to have the business continue to future. But these emerging technologies come with new age challenges also, which needs to be taken forward. Something which needs to be dealt with, that so that we can actually get the benefits of emerging technologies along with the challenges being taken care of. So to get a secure digital environment, that's what the next panel is going to talk about. It. I request the team to set up the stage and then we immediately move on to the panel. Mr. Dubey will be joining shortly. Over to you, ma'am. Sorry, uh, Mr. Dubey is already. Uh, Can we start? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're done with the first overview of cyber security and cyber awareness ecosystem of India. I joined by a very strong panelist from the corporate world who is actually looking after the cyber things and handling the cyber space of India. I'm joining by Amit Kumar Dubey, sir, a known personality. I always say he's a celebrity, actually. Uh, we also have Pankaj Shukla ji, Sanjay Agrawal ji with me, and uh, we also have uh, uh, Mr. Devan Chatterjee uh, is here. I think he, ha he was here uh, a minute ago. <laughs> Yeah, we also have uh, Mr. Gujraj with us. Uh, so welcome each one of you for this discussion where we're talking about emerging technologies and we have young brains here. I think on 15th of August, our Honorable Prime Minister has given certain direction. We started with something called as, you know, Hame Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji ne kaha tha, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan. And Atal Bihari Bajpayee has it, added a new word called as Jai Vigyan. And now we got a new direction that is J Anusandhan and that is what is the R&D. So the corporate world along with the government we are doing a lot of R&D. I request my panelists to join on stage. Uh, we have uh, uh, Chatterjee also here. Mr. Chatterjee is here. Deban Chatterjee. Yeah, he's coming. Yeah, we'll take another one moment. So the young audience is here and uh, lot of responsibility on our shoulder about talking about the R&D and Anusandhan. Taking this discussion, the present government is actually looking something like as you know Alexa and Siri, the agility and the real-time responsive governance. Am I right? Are you with me? Yeah? So well, the way we speak to the Google, Alexa and Siri, we're getting the results and answers and output and outcome. And that is what the citizen of India is also expecting, a similar type of governance and the answers and response. But to take you to this journey of, you know, coming up with the agility and the real-time citizen service delivery, we have to have a lot of emerging technologies with us. Yes, in this cyber world and in cyberspace, we are actually using a lot of emerging technologies. We have a lot of booms. There are certain curves also. We know how this AI, the deep fake and other thing is actually, you know, we are... Uh, there are a lot of uh, cyber crime and the cases and all in this preventing world of cyber world. Before I set the stage for the emerging and how we are going to embarrass this emerging technology to make the cyber security and to strengthen the cyber ecosystem, let us first understand the buzzword which is around in this world. 
especially the youngsters are using cyber bullying. Am I right? Cyber security, cyber ethics, cyber hygiene, cyber diplomacy, cyber disarmament, cyber space, cyber landscape, cyber warfare. Oh my God, so many words are buzzing around. And where are we? What is there for us? I think uh, Dr. Panth has already given that let down the cyber security ecosystem. So many pillars is actually looking after us. So that is, we have so many parents, so many bodies, you know, who's coordinating the cyber ecosystem of India. And we living in this world, especially the youngsters born with the technology, they are using technology, but they're not aware that what kind of a threats are there. It is not just the electricity bill message, but there are so many things behind the curtain our data is going. We are in this data world, data analytics, and many of you must have opted for a master's in data science also. Many of you may turn out to be a data science, a data analyst. Uh, many, you know, many job roles would be there in the future. There will be a job role, there will be a challenges, there are opportunities also. So when we're talking about with this digital transformation, we are heading towards the digital economy. When we are heading towards the digital economy, definitely we are harnessing so many emerging technologies from artificial intelligence to machine learning to deep learning to data analytics or talking about hybrid cloud technology to blockchain, 5G, another word has come. And we're looking forward, the life is going to be transformed. So with this buzzword and data analytics, I think already the platform was set when we're talking about how we are going to analyze the data of this cyber world. There are a lot of threats. Yes, there's a possibility that we can analyze those threats with the help of having a strong algorithm of artificial intelligence and machine learning and we can have this predictability and preventive model. People talk about three Ps. Have you heard about the three Ps and it's a part of our policy? Public private partnership, right? There's also 3P which is there in cyber world, and that is what is predictive. We can predict the future. That is a predictive. What are the threats in the future? What are the vulnerabilities are there? What are the, you know, uh, the vulnerable points? Where is the data leakage? What are there? That is the predicting the things. In other words, we're talking about preventive. Especially in the COVID time, we have learned this art of preventive. Prevention is better than cure. Yeah, wonderful. So you're with me. So that predictive prevention is very important. And then how you are going to protect your system is the ultimate crux of cyber security. And artificial intelligence and data analytics will take you this journey of vulnerability assessment, threat intelligence, that how within a time you can anticipate any events by analyzing all those events, anticipate the future threats and then probably that predictability, preventive and then protection can be taken well in advance. So, so much of responsibility on your shoulder after, you know, after our discussion, it is going to be on your shoulder. So, having said that, we will discuss about cloud computing and blockchain also. Have you heard about blockchain? Yes. When I say blockchain, I always relate it with the Google Drive, you know, everyone has a key. We all have a data, you also have a data, we sharing on this decentralized mechanism. This decentralized mechanism has actually given a power that everyone is having a data. If data is lost, lost as one place, the other place we can access. But the crypto, we are encrypting, giving us security with that blockchain technology. It's not just limited to the Bitcoin. So definitely in this embarrassing emerging technology, we will discuss about that how blockchain technology can be helpful and boon in helping this 5G and IoT in the future. And how we can actually use blockchain technology with the IoT and other devices so that we can have a secure mechanism of again, preventive and protect our system. So with this opening remark, I may now request uh, my panelists to kindly introduce yourself about your profile and the company we are doing. Uh, I'm sure that will give a lot of insight to my audience to interact with you in the future. May I request Amit uh, Kumar Dubey, sir, please. Thank you, thank you Suryabhiji for uh, setting up this context. I'm Amit Dubey, I work with Tech Mahindra as a Chief Cyber Evangelist. I'm also a Cyber Crime Investigator. I also run a radio show on Red FM 93.5 named Hidden Files. If some of you have heard my story, so day to day I investigate and solve crime cases, that is my job. Uh, no, so that's... Hi everyone, I'm Dhamanjan and I lead Decision Sciences at Bureau.id, which is a tech startup 
that builds uh, products to detect fraud. And uh, I've been using data science to build solutions pertaining to fraud and cybersecurity for more than 17 years now, working with organizations such as HSBC and American Express. Uh, in my last role, I was leading fraud risk management at Paytm Payments Bank. And in addition to uh, the space of detecting crime for traditional finance, I also contribute to the literature of uh, detecting financial crime in the space of finance and blockchain. Thank you. My name is Ankur Shukla. Uh, I lead the technology team and solution engineering team for uh, VMware Software in India. And those of you who are not aware uh, what VMware does, so VMware is a, a leader in providing cloud infrastructure and multi cloud and cyber security and digital cloud space solutions. Thanks Hey everyone, uh, this is uh, Panish. Uh, I head the uh, technology side uh, for Ku. Uh, I think some of you might be aware what Ku is about. So we are uh, pretty much uh, trying to build the uh, social graph for the uh, millions of Indians here, having our own uh, social network built out of India. And uh, I've been very passionate about uh, scaling systems, securing systems, and uh, kind of being innovative from uh, making things that happen in India. So looking forward to the discussion. Right. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this afternoon also. Uh, we also have Sanjay Agarwalji. I request you kindly quickly introduce yourself. Sorry about that. So thank you, Surabhi. I am Sanjay Agrawal. I am a Chief Product Officer uh, in the Engineering and Product Management at Quickie. Quickie is a Pune-based, uh, Pune India-based, publicly listed cybersecurity company uh, where we sell the uh, retail uh, uh, retail user product. Uh, is quite commonly known. We have over six million retail users. And many of you may not be aware, but we, we have also a, a division which is very growing very rapidly on the enterprise side. We have um, you know, more than 3 million enterprise users. I personally have over 20 years of experience, especially 10 years in cybersecurity and big companies like Cisco and many other startups. I have a PhD degree in computer science from Stanford. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, and I'm really thankful to all my panelists today joining this afternoon for this very pertinent issue where we discuss about how we are going to embrace this emerging technologies to secure the cyber ecosystem of India. We have, yes, it is well said that we are the one where the cyber security policy 2013 was formulated in a very early time. We are also a country where we have a very joint cyber coordination system in place. Yes, there is an edge that we are in under 10 countries actually dominated by ITU also. That shows that in the ranking and parameters, we have evolved. But so many things to do. Still, we are actually facing a lot of challenges from insider. Just remember the electricity example. So we have an insider challenges more. And we have a strong panel here, those who are actually dealing with from data science to providing that threat intelligence to malwares, to VMware, then we're talking about cloud computing also. Now take Mahindra, which is giving me us a lot of solution also. So good panel and good discussion is going to be happen. Stay with us here. But before that, the one question is very important. When we started our digital journey of Digital India, the three technologies are actually playing a major role. Do you know which are those technology? Any idea? A quick idea from the young audience? We have, I think, the college students here, sitting here. Right? And you are harnessing those technology also. So the cloud has actually changed the world. Isn't it? That internet and connectivity, and then suddenly we realize that all the services are actually available on desk, that is, on demand. From massive storage to any service, to any app, to anything is now available on demand on subscription basis. So I think cloud has changed the world. The second thing is we're talking about analytics. Yes, analytics has also changed the world and that is what we are going to use as a solution when we're talking about cyber threats. The last, yes, we have to harness a most and that is the blockchain technology. We have been listening that cryptocurrency, crypto scam is bubbling around the world. 
but how we can harness this blockchain technology. Not only, you know, when I'm serving a public administration, IIT, Indian Institute of Public Administration, we talk how that we can provide a real-time governance, having this blockchain technology to actually mitigate the risk also, to provide better security, and to provide a better, you know, citizen service delivery. That is a transparent government. So we emphasize a transparent government, but also blockchain technology has a solution for many kinds of a threats also, enabling the technology in a more secure manner. Again, having said this, I now float the question, uh, you know, uh, to take this discussion forward. There are a lot of roles of emerging technologies and uh, how we can harness this technology. I request, uh, uh, we have Devan Chatterjee from Data Analytics. So request, uh, if you kindly, you know, give your insight that how these technologies, especially the data analytics, is going to be a game changer when we're talking about strengthening the cyber ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So I think with data analytics, you know, uh, again, you know, taking a step back, so there are various kinds of analytics, you know, that, that needs to be taken into consideration. Like one, one kind of analytics or one kind of solutions is prescriptive analytics. One kind of solutions is diagnostic analytics, right? One of them is predictive analytics. So all of these different sort of, you know, sub-verticals of analytics can come together and help you to strengthen your defenses against cybersecurity or, you know, fraud in general. So when it comes to predictive analytics, right, the kind of work that's going on is basically, you know, if, if I have the data set of, let's say, of any bank or financial organization or any sector for that matter, and if you tell me that, hey, you know, for the past six months or for the past month, one month or so on and so forth, these are the various kinds of security incidents that we've come across. So let's say, uh, I'll give you an example. So let's say there's been a data breach at a credit card organization, right? So what, what that will translate to is that the criminals or the hackers who would have siphoned off that data set would be immediately sort of, you know, um, accessing a marketplace on the dark web and would be sort of, you know, putting up those confidential information for sale, right? And a petty criminal, right, um, would sort of pay for those uh, credit card information, right? And then would start out testing. So this is the entire ecosystem that goes on. Now, from a data science perspective, let's say if, if you are the CRO of a bank, right, and you are aware that, uh, you, and you've been seeing these emerging fraud trends over the past, uh, you know, X months or X days, right, uh, and I'm sure you would, you would be gathering uh, these incidences in a systematic format, as in, you know, in a structured data kind of a format. And if there's a data science team in your bank, uh, what that person can do is the person can sort of run machine learning algorithms on top of these data sets uh, to decipher the nuances of these patterns. And the reason why, and you'll hear a lot of, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will speak on machine learning and, you know, AI and all of that. And a, and a question that I often receive is that, all right, what's the difference between me as a human scanning through that data, right? Or let's say working on anecdotal evidence. So let's say an anecdotal evidence might be that a CRO tells me that, you know, I've seen that credit cards uh, that have been issued by my bank, typically I've seen fraud transactions range between 10,000 to 20,000 rupees uh, at electronic goods stores in the south of Delhi, right? Let's say there's a, that's the trend, right? And as a layperson, what I can do is I can convert that into a rule that, you know, if the transaction uh, amount lies between these two bands, and if the card is being used somewhere in the south of Delhi at an electronic goods shop, then let's decline all incoming transactions, right? But if if you do this, I'm sure you'll get a whole lot of false positives, as in genuine people also targeting in a similar fashion, which is which would be horrendous from a customer satisfaction point of view. So data analytics or machine learning henceforth sort of you know comes into this picture because it helps you to identify those kind of mathematical relationships which are again not visible to the naked eye, right? It's sort of putting the data you know underneath the microscope, right? So, long story short, in the context of, you know, um, preemptive analytics, right, the data scientists, can, by virtue of machine learning algorithms, will be able to tell you that, hey, you know, uh, this is how the fabric of fraud attacks or cybersecurity attacks look, looks like, right, based on this data, and you can leverage these, these nuances and accordingly build rules or build solutions so that tomorrow, if you see a similar trend cropping up, 
you would know what to do, right? Uh, similarly, when it comes to uh, diagnostic analytics, right? So let's say a, a post-mortem kind of a thing. So you would know that you know these are the flawed incidents that have come up. Uh, you might want to again analyze that data so that in order to guide uh, the regulatory framework, right? Or in order to guide policy uh, building. So wherein you would diagnose as to you know what exactly went wrong. Uh, you would sort of find out your root causes to these events and so on and so forth. Then also you've got the third kind of analytics, which is basically very structured way of incidence reporting. So basically, you know, building dashboards, uh, using uh, visual representations, because again, what happens is, see, most of people in this room, you know, we are aware what cybersecurity is. So you've got a very, uh, at least a very basic level of, you know, education, or you've got a good grasp on, you know, what's being discussed. But let's say if you want to communicate the level of threat that you are aware of to someone else in your organization, or let's say to even to the general consumer, right, that, hey, you, you guys should be taking cybersecurity, you know, seriously because of this. So in order to uh, facilitate that kind of a conversation to a lay person, it makes sense to build dashboards, to use analytics, to come out with visual representations of these cybersecurity incidences so that the message is loud and clear. So long story short, uh, you know, to your question, I think, I think these are the various ways in which data science or analytics can help to A, uh, find out patterns in the data and also to B, uh, design regulations and policies accordingly and C, even to help in the space of consumer awareness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, to, in a very simple manner, making them understand the different kind of analytics and how that can be harnessed. Again, strengthening the cyber ecosystem, whether it is an incident response system or whether it is predictive, or whether it is when we're talking about our policy formulation. Taking this discussion forward, I may now invite Pankaji to kindly highlight when we're talking about cloud, IoT, and machine to machine, what are the risks involved in that communication channel, especially the infrastructure, the critical infrastructure part? And how this data sensitive sensors and other, how you're going to protect them? What are the mechanisms of protecting these infrastructures, especially when the world is actually uh, going on the internet, connecting so many devices with our wearable, you know, uh, your uh, watches to any electronic device that is now interconnected? That internet, and you are from VMware, the cloud, and also how we are going to secure, how critical it is. Over to you. I mean, the first uh, in the morning session I was there and we were all uh, the, the kind of fun and, and, and Dr. Bahar talked about the threats which, which are the so for example certain majors they said third threats that they have seen close to 100 percent increase in the last couple of years. Now the question is that before I answer this question is that why is those threats increasing? And there are two or three, three uh, broad things which have happened in the last couple of years. The first is that the way we work has changed. Right? The way we work has changed in a multi-mode of fashion. Second, the way we do computing has changed because we start doing computing from the cloud. And then the third is that how the way you build applications has changed. And the fourth dimension which we spoke about with the advent of IoT and 5G coming, this is going to exponentially increase. So the overall, if you summarize all of this, all it means is that the surface area of attack has increased. Right? And so the to address this uh, problem of increasing the surface area, foundationally we need to make some changes in the way we, are, we look at security. And there are two foundational things which, which most of the modern day security tech is being built. The first is the distributed nature, that you need to distribute security across infrastructure, platforms, devices, whether those wearables or anything, you should be able to distribute security across all of them. That's the first thing. Second is the notion of zero trust. And the notion of zero trust is, is it's not a technology, but it, it's an approach which everyone should try to achieve the zero trust model. These are two foundational principles, basis which most of the modern day technologies are doing. And I'll talk about three or four things uh, in, in short period of time. First is that if you look at cloud and the data center itself, this notion earlier which you used to have that we need to have a strong perimeter and that will protect your data center. But that's not true. That if someone is going to get to the perimeter and get to the most vulnerable system within within the data center and, and then start traveling laterally to, to the assets which they want to attack to, right? 
So it is important to protect and to prevent the east-west communication of the, of the threats. And that can happen if you distribute security across the application and infrastructure within the data center. Second aspect is the devices and the users public uh, people are working. So that if you look at devices and the, uh, and the, uh, and the users, the, the, the pandemic, what has happened is that the multimodal form of work has started happening where people are working from home or working from office or in the hybrid mode. Uh, the point is that you need to first establish the trustworthiness of the device and the user. That's the first step. And second is that how can you create a fine-grained policy-based communication to the piece of information it's trying to access which is sitting in a data center or in a cloud. So that is the notion of zero trust which I'm talking about. Establish the trustworthiness of the user and the device, and the device could be the IoT device or anything else, and then, and then create a secure communication to only the piece of information which it needs to access. And third is the way we build applications. I mean, you would have heard of the software supply chain attacks like solar winds, and, and those attacks have increased 3x three, three in, 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 in the last one year. And that has started happening because, I mean, most of you would know of microservices and container based development which is happening right now. So what's happening is that at, during the time of the code build itself, the, the, the vulnerabilities are getting inserted. So it is important that during the, your development and operation cycle, you should insert DevSecOps to, to ensure security during your path to production which when you move from code to production. So these three aspects, data center and cloud, end users and devices, and the IoT devices, and third is related to when you build the software and applications. When it comes to IoT, it, it takes it to a completely different level because of the enormous amount of devices, that's one. And second is, uh, is, the, is the integration of IT and, uh, and OT, where, where uh, there is a, and then the IoT devices also need to talk to the cloud. So those sort of things increase this enormity of this problem. And then there are technologies which are available, for example, uh, things like SSL communication, uh, things like the certificate based for each and every device, uh, the, the visibility and the lot of data science technologies which we spoke about. So all of those things are very critical when we deal with, with these modern day challenges. Uh, right. So on behalf of this audience, I think you also have very simple question which I think uh, I can put forward again to Sanjayji. That still there is a dilemma. My data is on cloud is safe or not. Whether I should go for a private cloud, whether I should go for a public cloud, or whether I should go for a hybrid, which one is safe? My data is safe, my data is sensitive, and that is what is the first question of everyone's heart when we're talking about cyber threats. So anything wrong? Those are. Yeah, so I mean, uh, at this point of time, it is very difficult to say that you need to be only in the private cloud. While your critical data has to be in the, uh, uh, in the private cloud, uh, the data which is very, very critical, which you think that, and it, it's about trust, that if you can trust a particular cloud provider and you trust all the rules of the game of security, then you can keep data in the public cloud as well. So, we, as of today, we can't talk of data being at one cloud or the other cloud, because that is something which we can't control. The data will be across multiple clouds, and that is where this notion of multi-cloud has emerged. So, whether the data is, because the perimeter has built it now, we, and there's no perimeter now, the data is everywhere, all you need is a multi-cloud management, security and governance frameworks to be built so that you are, you can trust uh, wherever it is running and, and then and, and you can govern it properly. So that's the fundamental things and the technologies which today we talk about are, uh, are, uh, are not only limited to private clouds, but they span across multiple clouds. So that's how we generally treat the multi-cloud uh, softwares. Thank you, Sanjayji. You are handling a very, uh, you know, vast area, the cloud and internet, when we talk about cyber, cyberspace, and we connecting to the internet. So again, uh, one more question, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, still people have a dilemma whether we should go for an AWS, you know, or an XGen. To any, any uh, you know, Azure or what? And uh, we living in the area of API now. We are integrating so many applications with the APIs also. We have come up with the API Setu. So with that, uh, we can integrate so many government, uh, you know, uh, data also. Integration of that data should not be in silos. It should be harnessed. Again, data analytics when we're talking about harnessing the data. Data is oil. Data is everything. We're sitting on the data. So we're integrating the data with APIs. 
uh, what policy framework we have when we're talking about integration of this API together, how vulnerable these APIs are, and we coming up with the national data analytic platforms also. So, yeah. we'll comment on this. Correct. So, I, I think the first thing which you spoke about AWS or private cloud, yeah. and let, yeah. let yeah. me yeah. talk again on that. See, as I said, uh, it is important, especially for the for the government organizations to also think about being data on the cloud, that's okay, but there has to be a sovereignty around that. So you have heard of the data sovereignty and the and the sovereign concept of sovereign clouds which has come in. So mm -hmm. sovereign clouds is not just about the boundary of the cloud which is, should be there within the country's boundary, but actually also abiding by the rules of the country and to the, data, to the, the sovereignty rules of the country. So that is the the concept of cloud sovereignty. Second, as far as the API security is concerned, now API is again a very, uh, uh, it, is, is, it needs to be looked in a completely different manner today because there is explosion of APIs. It's not just about the API for connecting to different and external systems with each other and securing it. It's also about within your organization, you have hundreds and thousands of APIs getting created on an everyday basis. If you are a big organization and developing software. Because one department probably is developing a software and that, that needs to be communicating to some other uh, software which is there in the other department. And So what is important is when it comes to API is that the discovery of API, that what are the APIs which exist in my ecosystem, what are the APIs which needs to talk to each other within the boundary of your organization and what are the APIs through which you need to uh, connect to the external systems. So the visibility of these APIs and putting controls around it. Again, the principles and technologies in controlling the API communication is are more or less based on the SSL base, based on the certificates, uh, based on the various the, the security tooling which come with web access firewalls and, and other technologies which are built in. Right. And, the, uh, and, and when it comes to microservices and connection of the API, it is also about the service mesh technologies which, which are there. So these are sort of things take the tech which is important when you think of APIs. Thank you so much, Sanjay for highlighting the security provision is there when we're talking about API. Taking ahead this discussion again, uh, uh, when we're talking about cyber you know, attack, the damages are high. And I think our distinguished panelist in the previous session has also spoken about the damage is there because of the cyber attack. So when the cyber attack damages are high, from data, money, and other infrastructure loss. What should be our primary focus to be there to mitigate those risks and to reduce this cost of damage? I request Amiji to kindly share your viewpoint on this. Thank you, Shruti. <clears throat> so actually, most of these security architectures that we develop, these are risk-based architectures. We need to first classify our assets. We need to classify our data. And we need to understand the value of the data. Most of us actually we do not categorize it. We, we think like it is equally valued for different operations and when we are creating APIs or any such provision to share this data across, there is no such regulations in place and that is something which creates a bigger risk in future. If it happens, it damages a lot. If you create clustering or if you do micro segmentation as I said, I think that can help us eventually to keep high value assets separately with low value assets. And if any such uh, attack happens and you face such kind of situations, you can minimize the damage. That is the only approach that we can follow. How we can minimize the approach? See, we, we, we are always going on two side um, uh, uh, sharp blade where we need to manage the ongoing operations also and we need to also sustain uh, uh, the losses. So that's why whenever the ransomware attacks take place. And uh, I have been investigating many ransomware attacks lately from different states and India was actually one of the most sought target for such kind of attacks. Uh, there were only three, four approaches that we could take. One, can we recover it or can we decrypt the data on our own? So it's possible, but it's possible only for four to five percent of situations. So there are open source tools, there are uh, already decrypted algorithms available. So if such attack has happened earlier with someone and they have found some solution that could be available online, so 4-5% chances are there. We should definitely try that. I'm not saying that we should give it up. Second is negotiating with the attacker. And that is something which we all would miss out. And many of these cases, actually, I could uh, negotiate with them. And because we, we need to minimize the risk, we cannot just 
give away the situation that we cannot pay the ransom. And it is a tricky situation. It's very easy to say that don't pay the ransom, but then what? We are already losing everything. We cannot close our business. So if we are helping somebody and some organization and have been doing it, because they cannot go to police also sometimes. Because it's not solving the problem. The criminal is out of your jurisdiction. And there's no way they can actually even expect any arrest or any kind of uh, enforcement on it. So the only way out is to negotiate and to minimize the risk. And I have successfully done that. It is an art. It is an art. And once you do it and if you build trust with them, it, it is also possible. Third is getting the data recovered through your uh, uh, logs. So what all logs you have or what all deleted content you have. Sometimes I have also helped organizations to, uh, because it is shared across multiple people. And if it has been to their laptops and all, we can consolidate the data. In 95, that old file was there somewhere in somebody's laptop. We can actually get it back retrieved or through really data recovery. So there are multiple such approaches that we that we followed and eventually helped organizations to reduce the risk. So risk is the only thing. And as I started with, with this question that we don't understand the value of data, uh, I'll just give you... Uh, some valuation when these 450 applications were banned from China. Uh, do we know that what were the valuations? Anybody can give me the idea of WeChat valuation. What was the value of WeChat? Or Cam Scanner? Or sh what else? There were uh, many video editing apps, sharing apps, right? What was the valuation of WeChat? So WeChat was at that time was valued 500 billion dollars and they were actually looking they had a very aggressive plan to penetrate to India at that time because of the Indian population and users India had many users 500 billion dollars do you know the GDP of Pakistan is close to 250 billion dollars so that is the value of data that we've always value and we were giving it free of cost to someone so we need to understand first the value of the data and then only we can apply because when we suggest some tools to an organization he was you need to have this tool that tool. So this is too costly we do not need these tools no 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 we, we because they don't value their data and once they face that incident then they realize oh my god this is actually not only damaging their reputation but also the financial losses and eventually they may also reach to a situation where they have to close down their operation so that's why i think the first thing to each one of you to help them to understand the value of their data. Once they understand the value, they'll give that investment to secure their data. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm sure uh, your mind must be working <coughs> that what is the value of this data? Data is an asset, and how wonderful it is. Taking this discussion forward, we also have Sanjay Agrivalji, who is from the Quick Hill Technology, and probably he may share certain global best practices in which organization leveraging them, this new emerging technology is for strengthening the digital ecosystem. Sanjayji, are you with us? Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, I think this has been touched upon before but there is, uh, besides the security hygiene, I think uh, there is a huge movement for zero trust. And zero trust, meaning it should be borderless uh, and distributed, as uh, it has been talked about before. It should be least privileged. Everyone, only people who should have access to certain processes or data, they are the ones who should have access. Everybody else should be there. Should be implicit denial of user centric, meaning it should be about users and the endpoint. Right? Uh, it should not be technology centric. Lot of technologies like firewalls. Then, in previously, they had broken it down to IP addresses, port numbers. These complex technology level constructs. They all need to be brought to the level. Uh, ultimately, technology is there to connect the users with the services, and that's where the uh, that's what it should be about. Those should be the most granular constructs, and policies should be. Uh, upon that, right? The how a particular type of user, depending on his you know, group he belongs to, is he engineer, is he a salesperson, is he you know, based on premise, is he 
based in home? Is he based out of country? Uh, depending on his posture and depending on what kind of endpoint it is, what kind of application it is, what is its reputation? Uh, is it located in, in India? Is it located elsewhere in threat countries? Um, uh, you know, what kind of reputation that site has? Is it, what is the categorization of that site? Um, what, is it an enterprise application? Is it a shadow IT application? Depending on the reputation and different uh, tagging, as you may call it, from um, the endpoint and the user, you should be able, able to apply different policies. Like, uh, for example, the person who's sitting on premise, on campus, should be able to access engineering um, you know, websites uh, when he is uh, within certain geographical region. When he steps out of geographical region, he should only be able to access HRMS. He should only be able to access HR systems, but not in the end. So being able to do implicit denial, everything is denied, and only allowing access uh, for a user to certain, based on the, based on the identity, based on the posture, um, I think that is where we can basically reduce lots and lots of kind of attacks. Um, so, and it should be completely distributed. It should be very granular. And it should be at a very micro level. Um, so this is the huge movement in the industry. I think we are um, sort of implementing this at uh, endpoint level. We are coming up with endpoint solutions which implement zero trust architecture. We are coming up with uh, network level where instead of having a classical firewalls, you are having much more cloud hosted proxy solutions which are proxying your traffic into the data center or public cloud where in, at that, either in the endpoint or at the proxy point, you are controlling these accesses. And uh, so, so policy-based, granular, distributed, user-centric, borderless, um, least privileged access is what um, essentially Zero Trust is about. And, and that's what is being implemented. Now, even after all this, uh, that you, some attacks still don't come, you know, uh, come through. Because after all, users are the biggest thing. They can click on um, you know, certain emails, uh, and they can be partnered to a phishing attack. Um, so transaction level, and so they can, a lot of these attacks can actually um, arrive on very legitimate uh, pipes, which are allowed, right? and then they sit on your systems in a persistent manner, and then they, after many days, they sort of horizontally replicate uh, across your organization, and then, uh, you know, establish uh, a conduit back to, to the attacker. And then, you know, they build this whole uh, breached uh, system as a or a network as a platform, and they sell it um, for whoever wants to exploit it. So this is where there is a huge movement in the industry to sort of take the telemetry uh, from the network, from the user, the you know identity systems, from the uh, machines, take all the telemetry, take all the events and correlate them together. And uh, then try to match it against certain patterns. Like, okay, uh, this threat came in many days ago, this phishing link, it was flagged by this email system, then it sat in this endpoint for many days, then that endpoint sort of created 20, 50, 30 connections horizontally, and then the same kind of behavior was exhibited on those endpoints, and then there was a CNC connection made to a threat vector, right? So being able to detect these patterns is where, uh, and, you know, XDR or, uh, you know, detection and response, uh, uh, endpoint detection and response evolving to network detection and response and finally XDR, meaning endpoint and network detection and response. That is cross-correlating and finding out whether it matches a certain pattern. And if it matches a certain pattern, then you, uh, you know, you basically identify the threat. 
And in, in, you know, it's very difficult for organizations to afford this kind of service. Therefore, therefore a lot of uh, service companies are evolving where they actually uh, take all your telemetry data and log data and then they cross correlate it. And if they find threats, they actually contact you and they uh, potentially identify the threats and even uh, they even remediate it. So the MDR. So MDR is a huge effort in the industry also. Um, and lastly, I would say AI. So uh, artificial intelligence is increasingly being used uh, to uh, make this. So what we have talked about so far was that we are matching a lot of this telemetry data against patterns. But what if the pattern is new? What if it's zero data? Meaning something, a pattern which has never been seen before. Um, and in that case, AI comes into picture where it sort of tries to take the existing, um, what is happening now, and it cross correlates it with what was the normal behavior before. It tries to baseline it and say, okay, these patterns are unusual. And then those patterns are something which you have never seen before. And based on cross-correlating that intelligence across many, many different users, especially in the MDR service, it can actually uh, tell you that you are under attack um, and reduce, and, and taking the feedback, it can actually even reduce the false positives. So, so AI is a huge promise in this industry, um, you know, because it's going to make the remediation or attack identification near real time. Uh, because humans uh, can only respond today in the case of hours, days, even months. Uh, so AI will tremendously speed it up that, or it can be human assisted, but it, AI will do a tremendous amount of uh, assist in that case. Um, so these are the three major patterns or three major practices that are evolving in the global landscape. Right, Sanjay, a uh, very interesting discussion and the point which you have given. There are a few questions which are, you know, strike my mind and I think maybe a question of the audience also. We're talking about zero-day attack, right? And we're also talking about exploit as a services. There's a new revenue model in this cyber world. We started earning money with this exploit as a services and with the help of artificial technology, we're also anticipating that we'll also have the zero security risk day also. So I request your comment on this when we're talking about the new revenue model in this cyber world and how we can mitigate this. And with the help of artificial intelligence and when I say, you know, machine learning and deep learning algorithm, when we're analyzing this network traffic, when we're analyzing the behavior analytics of an individual or an organization or a public sector or comment, when we're analyzing this behavior analytics, when we're analyzing this data usage, when we're analyzing a lot of data and events which is happening, then how we can ensure this zero security risk? Your comment on this. Sanjay, are you with us? Yes, yes. So um, the question is that how um, do we... Uh, Actually, it's not clear to me the question. Right, I think, I think I think I have asked too many questions with you. So much of expectation. One which you have mentioned about zero day attack, and you always say to remain away from this zero day attack is never go for a positive first movie show. So you will be away with this zero day attack. But when we're talking about zero day attack and we adding artificial intelligence in terms of predictability and preventive measures, uh, do you think this AI may help us in giving the edge of the zero security risk? Having said that. We are also coming up with a new revenue model in this side of the world with the new concept of exploit as a services. So I said uh, your comment on both the concept. Yeah, absolutely. So exploit as a service is, is a big thing out there right now. So platforms are being sold, breach service systems are actually being tremendously used. And, and you know, because there are so many threat vectors, there are so many things you have to do um, enterprises, uh, you know, have, so I think that this is the reason why, uh, you know, this is a big, um, you know, exploit in the industry. Um, so I think the way around it is to 
rather than try to solve and integrate these complex technologies on your own, you should try to exploit the threat, uh, security as a service models, uh, which we call MDR. So MDR services are rapidly evolving, and those are the people who specialize in these kind of um, things because they cross correlate information. And they, they build a lot of experience in terms of what is normal, what is not normal. Which you, you know, something which is, because you have a own data of only of your enterprise, but they have data potentially of hundreds of enterprises, how many uh, enterprises they serve. So they have much greater amount of data, therefore the intelligence that they can build, uh, especially the zero day intelligence they can build on top of that is gonna be much, much higher. So I, I think, this industry is rapidly going to move towards MDR model, their managed uh, detection and response uh, services. And, and that is the answer to reduce uh, some of these threat platform or risk system as a service. Um, and I think these MDRs over a period of time, they are going to uh, you know, uh, utilize AI increasingly because AI is going to far exceed the human capability of identifying um, the, what is abnormal um, when it comes to zero day attacks. Right. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, taking this discussion forward. You also have co-op with us. Mr. Bhuraji is here. And many of our young audience, they are using so many apps. Which app is secure or not? That is the first question of everyone's heart. But before that, I will state uh, one statement that actually technology makes our business very, you know, in a very easy way, effective and fast also. And that is what is the app is also playing a major role in our life in a similar manner. So uh, if there's a new gateway, what are the threats are there? When we're talking about apps also, uh, whom should I rely? Which is uh, the most useful? Whom should I rely? In, in fact, you know, from the primary to the adolescent, everyone is now using gaming to new avatars and now we are entering to this metaverse world. We cannot, uh, you know, ignore this metaverse, especially the young generation sitting, they are into gaming and social media combining with this W3. And we will have an avatars, probably next time we have an avatars of all the panelists sitting here. Right, so we entering in those world, uh, so many issues and threats. And the app, again, combining with the same concept of app also, so your comment on this line. Yeah, so this is uh, a very uh, active uh, research in many places, to be frank. Uh, and it also kind of uh, sets the tone for uh, we as uh, important cyber professionals who want to safeguard, uh, let's say, the community or the data or the overall org, right? What kind of steps we can take there? Um, if you kind of followed some of the uh, latest one that happened, uh, Cloudflare, which is a very popular uh, uh, WAF provider, right? It reported that it was able to block close to two terabytes of uh, DDoS attack. But guess uh, where the DDoS attack was targeted towards? <coughs> it was on uh, Minecraft. So a lot of you know Minecraft, right? So all of you play Minecraft. So uh, this DDoS attack was specifically targeted for Minecraft. Though Minecraft as a company was able to safeguard themselves using Cloudflare, it was able to prevent and hardly any uh, uh, kind of effect happened. What I wanted to point out here is, um, it's actually not just the uh, where the cyber attacks are targeted towards, but also the kind of volumes, the different kinds of vector sizes, and the approaches that uh, hackers are uh, very much innovating. And they always tend towards uh, certain domains, certain uh, uh, segments which are more uh, prone and susceptible. That's how the emergence, uh, uh, that's how uh, this uh, uh, attack was targeted. Now, if you see the uh, gaming, if you see the social, all these aspects, right, it's used by almost uh, everyone in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives, right? We either spend some time on that, uh, some people play it for a very long period of time as well. But at the end of the day, it's something that we don't even know that uh, our data is being, uh, we are being biased towards certain information, right? Because if you look at any, uh, if you are looking at any particular uh, news feed or if you are looking at any specific content or topics, the platform should not dictate what.
what uh, uh, you want to see, right? You should be the one, it should be the other way around. So sometimes you are not even aware of that. And in the concept of this fake news, etc., you are kind of pushed towards that uh, boundaries where uh, okay, you don't even know what's happening, but suddenly it starts trending. And you kind of, without your own thought process, you start to contributing towards that overall uh, ruckus that is getting unfolding, right? So it's very critical uh, to build very strong systems to kind of um, uh, address these kind of specific problems that are occurring. And uh, if you actually have to solve these problems right, it is at not just one layer or one particular level that it can be solved. Uh, it has to be solved across, uh, if you look at the OSI network model, some of you might be taking that class right. It is at actually every particular layer. So um, if you see, for example, um, even with the role of AI ML that is happening, we all use a lot of open source ML models, correct? But one question we always need to ask ourselves is, how was this model even trained? What kind of data they used? Who trained the model? From which particular organization, which particular model was trained? So if you look at these specific, uh, if you look at these things and uh, peel the layers, you actually come to know that, oh, okay, this data could be biased. I don't think I can use this. You might have to build your own model. So for who specifically, right, we had one specific scenario where we translate languages, right, one language to the other. That's our core uh, feature. So we cannot just translate languages just by uh, leveraging a lot of translate services that are out there. We also need to see how, whether the sentiment carry forward while translating from one language to the other. Because it altogether gives a very different sentiment when you don't really think about it. And secondly, the kind of attacks that we see on uh, uh, people who are very young, right? Let's say in this new world, a lot of people come online for their classes. They uh, attend the classes. Some of us here in this room and other people, we, we are aware of it, what kind of uh, false information we might be getting. But imagine a three-year-old or a four-year-old who are logged into their online things and suddenly they start getting uh, pop-ups, right? Or oh, you click here for your homework, you click here for this. So it's a very intuitive way for them to get into that trap, right? So the software that is providing that service need to really understand who the end audience they are building towards and kind of put certain uh, guardrails. So in my opinion, it has to be both from a product thinking, then in terms of who the audience is, then look at the entire uh, layers where the, uh, the technology, where the system is built, right from your physical layer all the way to your application layer and kind of go about it. The last thing I wanted to add is there's a lot of um, uh, integration that is happening between hardware, software, ML, etc. Right? So uh, if you look at it, a uh, lot of the ML models are built on top of GPU chips, right? And with all these things that are uh, happening, there could be certain scenarios where a particular vulnerability that is there in a particular segment on hardware which can be exported via software. So these kind of things happen only at a very later point of time. So with this metaverse that is taking shape, it's a very classical example where hardware meets software and it is kind of affecting the entire social ecospace. So as a if you from a cyber security threat protection standpoint, it is a very awesome area of research if you ask me. So you need to experience multiple facets in the technology stack there and kind of build a solution towards. So this is how I see the trend emerging with convergence of many different uh, domains coming together and being applied. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Gururaj. I'm very thankful to all my panelists for adding value. I, now the floor is open uh, to the audience. You may raise a question one by one. I'll take a couple of questions. Any question from the audience? Yeah. So you can switch on your mic, saying your name, and then you can ask a question. Uh, my name is Parthavatun Das and I'm a professional consultant, I head a consulting firm in the space of market entry and technology commercialization. Uh, throughout the session, I mean it was a very elaborative session, but there hasn't been any mention of ethical hacking. Now that has been a very prominent you know, workforce which has come up to tackle cyber hacking as such. Now my question is, that if that is the workforce we are utilizing to tackle a human workforce as such, 
why we are not structuring it and bringing it to the mainstream. I'm talking about the whole value chain, starting from education, training, being a professional in that space, and an industry as such of ethical hackers. What's your say on that? Thank you. Right. Uh, so I request the panelists, anyone of you would like to take this question. I think that's a, I'll just add something yeah. and then probably others uh, can. I think it's a brilliant suggestion and I know few of such initiatives those has been taking place in this direction. So uh, there's a body which is creating national security database which is registering all ethical hackers of India. And this central database will help uh, them to actually proactively assess the critical assets of India or to use their capabilities. It's kind of a bug bounty but uh, through a proper channel. So this is this is being already being started and uh, special uh, attention has been taken by Maharaja Masood, Mr. Edubiya. And I met him recently and he has taken many initiatives. He said that Amit, I'm in the next two to three years, we are uh, sort of a, we have a vision to build Masood as a strong cyber security uh, hub of India and we should generate at least 10,000 plus ethical hackers because we really understand the value of it. So they are setting up many cyber ranges and so which seems like, yeah, we have taken some serious uh, initiatives in that direction and I understand your point that I think we should use hackers positively in some of these initiatives for sure. Adding to the same point, uh, I think Government of India is also taking a lot of initiative in a similar direction in terms of developing the capabilities both in the defensive and offensive way. When I say capabilities, Definitely it is areas to every level we are developing this capabilities of going cyber ethics that is ethical and we have a lot of forensic laboratories coming into the picture certification so many things are going on but I request the panelists to add more on this uh, we also have Sanjay and uh, Pankaji like to add on this well, all I can say is that this is an excellent solution and, and we provide cyber security solutions to a lot of companies and and this has not taken a central space as of today. I mean, it's there in the minds, a lot of people do it in peripheries, uh, but but has to take a central place as part of the overall cyber security framework which organizations need to build to tackle that. As part of our organization, we typically help our customers to do some uh, in such initiatives for, for our company, for different companies to, to pinpoint where are the uh, potholes but yeah, this needs to take a central place and action solution, that's what we need. Right. Any other opinion? Sajiji, do you have uh, any opinion on this or shall we take the next question? <coughs> Alright. So, uh, now we take the, yes. Madam, I am Rubinder Singh, I am technology expert. But the problem with it, in India is that, you know, we are not, uh, you can say, providing accurate data and, and that's why you know our government's planning everything is not happening the way it should be for example you know in the case of weather you know I knew you know for uh, for for almost a month you know I was writing also to the government you know that there is a drought in many states you know food producing states but the government reacted uh, almost one month later and then you know then they find you know they couldn't you know respond properly so you know government is not uh, putting up you know data correctly and you know government is not able to respond to the situations you know properly and it is affecting our planning also since you are from public administration you know it is very very critical Right, so I can only say, sir, suggestion well taken, but I think a lot of initiative and direction has been given on a similar line. We coming up with so many policies also, Open Data Gov is there, National Data Analytic Platform is coming up, where we have integration of all the essential services from education to all. Amalgamation of ministries, departments are all integrating the data, because this integration is very important. How are you working as we working in silos? If you accuracy, works, accuracy is also important. Yes, yes. Accuracy is very important, sir. That is what called called standardization policy. When we are amalgamating the data, the standardization policy is equally very important. And we have to have an emphasis on this. 
So points were taken, but now we have started taking a lot of direction in a similar manner. That standardizing the data and integrating the data, if we really wanted to harness the potential of the data. So that is a comment from my end. Uh, any other opinion? Uh, since we have a data scientist also here, yeah, we have uh, yeah, Gujarat and Chatterjee. Uh, yeah, I think the only thing that I can add to that is, you know, uh, like uh, in the due course of my career, I've often come across the problem of inadequate data, where the data is accurate, but it's less in number, or let's say the data is stored in a very unstructured format. So a good example of that would be, let's say, if someone wants to do an analysis of social media data, as in the data is just, you know, strings of texts. It's not sort of stored in a very uh, orderly fashion of rows and columns, right? So that's another thing. The third thing, obviously, is inaccurate data that, that you are, uh, you know, that we are currently speaking of. There is one way to sort of maneuver around the problem of inaccurate data that is from a data science perspective and that is to conduct very rigorous sanity checks on the data. So often what would happen is like you know if you as a data science person if you if you could come up with creative ways to validate data or to validate certain theories then you can sort of write codes accordingly to sort of find segments which are counterintuitive. So let's say if someone, I'll give an example. So let's say from a KYC perspective, if you've got data wherein someone has mentioned uh, his or her <coughs> profession as a homemaker, right? But let's say the annual salary that's been reported is, let's say, in tune with someone who's a serial entrepreneur, let's say, right? So you can actually quote those kind of uh, filters or sanity checks wherein, the, uh, wherein, you know, you can have automated pieces of machine learning algorithms or even simple algorithms running in the background that can tell you that hey these are certain pockets where it seems that the data is not accurate and then you might want to sort of do something with that insight either you might want to trace the root cause of it as to what led to that data not being accurate or you might want to uh, from an analytics perspective you might want to not to consider that data because it would lead to you know erroneous of implications and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. want to add one point there. So, in my experience uh, with uh, working with the um, government sectors, right, so one thing that has really worked is the public private partnership model. Uh, for example, um, you might have heard of this uh, AI for Bharat. So, if, uh, please do check that out. Um, so, if you see the AI for Bharat initiative, there are some very good open source ML models that. Uh, it's out there for public and it is really gold standards and the way that model actually has come into existence is there's a lot of data that has been um, uh, shared between the public and the private sectors which are out there in the public and it is used for various important uh, use cases so especially on uh, speech to text language translation etc and um, uh, I do agree with your point about accuracy the way to solve accuracy, in my opinion, is um, you have to go, you have to start with something, a very small segment where the data is really good. Uh, probably take only one small particular region in India from where you source the data which is of very high quality and then start extrapolating from there. Uh, that's one way to look at it. But again, it depends on the problem you're solving to be frank. Right. But I'm at, at, at Trina, I'm downloading, searching, you know, on data from your state, uh, trade authority or trade commission is there. <coughs> they are giving data, you know, for the last 50 years, 100 years. You know, it is very accurate also. And you can easily access it. But you know, yeah, you know we, we, we can't access you know, our trade data, for example. How can we reduce our, you know, you can say, Right, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your question. But uh, yes, data accuracy and standardization is very important. Having said that, the government of India is taking note of initiative. I must emphasize on this point that you must uh, click on the link National Data Analytic Platform. Standardization policy is also there. Data is in silos, but we're coming up with the concept of data lab where we are actually amalgamating the structured and unstructured data so that we will get the meaningful information also. 
Yes, uh, every ministry's department and organization is parallelly working on their own data to make it very accurate and standardized. Uh, we just take the last question, if there's any. Otherwise, yeah, the last question. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Shikhar Mishra, and my question is, how will IoT be useful in cyber security? All right. So, I request Amit ji or... Uh, Sanjay ji, to highlight on this. Yeah, so, uh, in fact, uh, IoT uh, will become a bigger problem for us to uh, manage so many billions of devices eventually. And the bigger challenge would come uh, because of the quantum computing as well. And I think we have missed out that factor that this is one of the emerging uh, technology which is creating lots of challenges in future, especially for the data security because the data encryption algorithm, those were earlier used uh, as a legacy algorithm, most of these will get changed and we need better quantum safe algorithms. Those can sustain uh, the same sort of securities uh, in future. So this is the, one of the biggest uh, areas and IoT gives us lots of data. We are sensing lots of data and we have just discussed about the data uh, the accuracy and data manipulation challenges and those kind of challenges are always there when we have such kind of distributed environment and the data is coming through different sources. So this is definitely the biggest pain area in future, along with the quantum computing. And uh, the research has been happening. We, uh, we will very soon have uh, some quantum safe uh, encryption algorithms released by uh, the standard, uh, standard bodies and uh, that will come very soon. But before that, I think the risk is there, the loopholes are there and even if we identify the secure algorithms, it cannot be changed all of a sudden. There is always a transition phase. And this transition phase will create lots of attacks, lots of challenges for companies for sure. So that is something which I am worried of. And in the next two to three years, we will see once the first commercial quantum computer will be available next year, I think. Uh, these kind of challenges will be seen much more. Right. Uh, Pankit Ji and Sanjay Ji, would you like to add on this? It's talking about IoT and role in cyber security. Was that how can IoT help in cyber security rather than yes, yes. on the other way around? Yeah. Uh, as energy uh, suggested. But yes, I mean, uh, IoT devices connected to internet and cloud, and and the most of the principles of cyber security of internet also apply there. And, and if you look at while there are uh, the devices, there will be uh, much more device, many devices, and then the algorithms at which they will connect. Etc. will be different, and this is which a lot of technologies are getting developed. The certificates like X.509 or TLS.2, uh, uh, and so, and then the discovery of that what's the posture of those devices which are connecting to the central location. So, all those things are, and then bringing data science, AI, and ML, all of this converging together to make IoT secure. So, that is something which is in progress right now. and. Uh, I have just one reply to your question as IoT has an immense potential. Why can't we plan with the distributed technology, blockchain, enable IoT to make it more secure and useful in future? Um, Sanjay Ji, do you have any other point? Or, uh, so now I request all my panelists to give a one closing remarks related to the adding to the vision of government how we can actually accelerate and strengthen the cyber ecosystem. Uh, just a uh, one closing remark from each one of you. Sure. Uh, so if I can go first. I think, uh, you know, it's an ex extremely interesting time to be alive. I think we can all agree on that with all the emerging technologies that are coming up. In terms of how we can sort of, you know, leverage these times to build a resilient uh, cyber security or counter fraud uh, intelligence framework, I think the core skill that's required is the ability to think like a criminal because this space which we've been currently discussing about, it's extremely game theoretic, so it's cat and mouse, right? So anything that a vigilante would do, the criminal would obviously react to that and then, you know, the loop sort of continues. So I think the need for the hour for all of us in, in this room is to sort of come up with curve as far as the ability to think two steps ahead is concerned and what that requires is any solution that any of us are building be it in the space of fraud analytics, be it in the space of cyber security or cloud tech and so on and so forth, is to have a clear understanding of how to game the system, of how to game the solution that you yourself are building. Because if we are clear on that, then only it will be feasible for us to design the defenses accordingly. Thank you.
Thank you. So I'll just uh, focus on few of these challenges that I foresee in future because of metaverse, because of quantum, because of AI and all, because of IoT proliferations and all. We'll have lots of lots of data. I think with metaverse, uh, the kind of social media you are using right now, uh, the data that we'll generate through metaverse will be multi-force, multi-multi-force. And, and that is the biggest uh, uh, source of uh, information to any attacker when they create attack vectors against you. So that will increase further, the surface will increase and you will leave lots of digital footprints out which will eventually motivate attackers to create challenges in your life. So metaverse, regulations, how should we uh, 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 create government regulations against it so that law enforcement agencies can take corrective actions against such kind of attacks or crimes. I think that is something which government should start thinking about because this will come, this is not far. Second, quantum computing, uh, because the obvious nature of quantum computing that it can create lots of challenges, especially for the encryption. And we should not only start giving guidelines that what all quantum safe algorithms are there that should be used by government organizations and also by corporates proactively before we face such kind of attacks in future. And third is AIM, because uh, even I have seen recently DDoS attacks were uh, created through AI uh, tools and uh, they were able to uh, create that, uh, uh, they could bypass lots of empty data tools and that is something which is possible. So I think these are the three promising emerging technologies which will create uh, the future challenges for cyber security for which we need government guidelines and recommendations to Right. Thank you, Amit. I mean, I'll Sanjay Agarwal to kindly give the closing remark on this. India-based petrol and I think that's really, really important. Being able to, uh, you know, being sensitive to what is happening in India, what Indian assets are, uh, what are the threat actors who are targeting India uh, in big segments, big sectors, uh, I think that's really, really important. Uh, so we actively go and look out those kind of threats. We have identified um, some of these kind of threats before, uh, APT attacks uh, by, you know, uh, a neighboring group uh, called Invisible Tribe, it, the threat was called site copy operation. Um, so there are, I think, I think the government of India should encourage a um, lot of this local uh, threat intel, a lot of local threat uh, you know, remediation, uh, I think that's what I see a moving forward uh, government should do. Uh, and we are working very closely with government in that endeavor. Great. I mean, our request, Pankaj Shuklaji, to kind of give a remark on this. Yeah, so I would mean, just say one sentence that uh, I can build trust, uh, but I would uh, just government to seek clear guidelines on, on adopting zero trust. But if that is something which organizations adopt, uh, for sure it will be more right. So, uh, just to add on to some of my colleagues here. So, zero trust is, in my opinion, is one of the very critical ones. And uh, one more place where I feel uh, it can be a true game changer is reverse the order in which uh, we adopt technology, right? What I mean by that is we always try to solve solutions or put certain things where um, this, the problems are. But all these different applications are built on top of some core uh, technical fundamental basic blocks. If you look at operating system, if you look at network, uh, network uh, the DNS, etc. Right? So, can it be rethought? Uh, rethought is what I'm thinking. Because uh, in India still, we rely on a lot of the uh, systems that are built externally. And for whatever reason, if these systems become, uh, and we become the victim through these things, right, we are uh, kind of, uh, again, in the trouble. So there are a lot of operating systems, etc., that are built for security, you might be aware, like Fedora, etc., where people who are interested can do a very active research in those areas, build things on top of it, and make it a bit more uh, containerized. 
So this is more of a research way of looking at things. Right, thank you so much. Uh, I think we discussed a wide spectrum here from digital, you know. So my digital audience, digital safety and digital India is there from digital India to digital audience and digital safety. And how to remain safe in this world, I think privacy is just a myth. I always say privacy is a myth. Important is prevention, protective and protect yourself with a countermeasure. And therefore, I think our senior panelist here in the previous session was talking about the three things that is very important in your pocket these days. One is the toll free number 1930 whenever there is a cyber crime or a cyber crisis. The other is log on to cybercrimegov.in. <coughs> Reporting is very important and when you think about the conviction rate. And the last is Cyber Dost. We have young audience here. IFOC MH initiative of Cyber Dost. Have one friend is with you is Cyber Dost. Stay tuned with the cyber security which India is providing. Uh, learning is the ultimate asset of our life and cyber capabilities, learning and cyber hygiene is very important when we're talking about cyber strengthening ecosystem of India. Because together we have to secure the system. The more se system we secure, more secure we are. That is the only line I can give at the end. So if you want it to be secure in this world, let's take a shared responsibility of this security. Alone, nobody can make it secure. So it is our own shared responsibility to make this system secure. With this, uh, I close the session. Thank you so much and Jai Hind. session and uh, I would like to thank my panelists and our uh, esteemed moderator for this uh, wonderful discussion that we have. It was an eye-opener for myself as well and I'm looking forward to having some more discussion on this topic in our future activities. Uh, with this we will conclude this session and we'll uh, join request everyone to have a lunch outside and after that we'll recon reconvene at the second floor for the next session. Thank you everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. So we reconvene and meet after our lunch. I hope none of you are feeling sleepy. So a couple of housekeeping announcements. Kindly keep your phone on a switch off mode. Avoid your other discussions, which you may have a lot of time during the various interactions. There are tea breaks and others where you would have a lot of time to interact amongst yourself. However, we would love to have interaction with the speakers. So you are free to raise questions when the moderator or the speaker allows you, so, allows you to do so. Also, if you have any other thing, any support you require from Fiki with respect to the subject which we are talking about, the cyber security, which also I mentioned in the inaugural session, we are more than happy. You have our details. You can reach out to the Secretariat and we'll be happy to facilitate it through our various partners. So thank you all for coming back and joining us today. Now, after uh, inaugural session and after hearing the experts, Lieutenant General Dr. Rajesh Pan, Sanjay Behel, and the industry editors, followed by a uh, very, very, very strong, insightful session on where you talked about how uh, the emerging technologies and how you can secure the digital environment. We are now going to hear on a very, very important subject, which is uh, India's digital public goods approach to cyber security. And from none other than Mr. Arvind Gupta, Head Digital India Foundation. Can I have a round of applause for him, please? Thank you, sir, for joining us here. Thank you, sir, for joining us here. We know that you have been associated with the IT journey for long, multiple roles you have played, multiple hats you have been wearing it. But now from your side, we would like to understand, I mean, as part of our subject, we have taken how we can accelerate the journey of cyber security in India. Lieutenant General Pan did mention in the inaugural that as of now, India stands on the 10th number. We have, we have made the remarkable progress and we do continue to do, plan to do so in future also with our initiatives. So we would like to hear from you, sir, your views on the same as well as what should be the India's digital public goods approach for the cyber security? Over to you, Mr. Gupta, and thank you for joining us here. Should I come here on the so whatever you are comfortable with, yeah. 
stand up and talk. Thank you, Sarika, and uh, it's always uh, good to be back in a physical meeting, and that too at Fiki. Uh, so let me give you a context. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arvind Gupta. And the first time we talked about Digital India uh, in 2014 was actually in this room. Uh, the first session that uh, we explained what when we launched Digital India as a program in 2014, people uh, thought it is just another slogan. And uh, well, it was not. Right? It was actually conceived and launched before even the government in May 2014 came into power. So today, uh, from 14 crore internet connections, uh, smartphone connections in 2014, we are at about 85 crore plus. Um, uh, in eight years, the, the impact that we have had in the world, uh, first within India and then globally, is the highest. For those of who you are students of technology, digital, I am, I am a lifelong student of technology, so uh, I can tell you one thing, this transformation is not, has not happened anywhere in the world. What's, uh, what Sarika mentioned, we are 10th in uh, cyber security index. I think also we have to go along with the facts that we were 155th, 155th in mobile data consumption. Today we are number one, right, number one. And how many of you consume 2 GB, 1.5 GB per day? At least it happens in your plan. 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 Right? That is the 30 GB to 45 GB to 60 GB per month. And you can consume it at such a low cost, at pretty good speeds. And through that effort of public policy, private sector uh, investments, we today are number one in terms of data consumption the cost, lowest cost of data in the world, less than 7 cents a GB a month, 11, 7 cents. Same data cost, if you were to take the same data pack, anywhere else in the world it would be 10 times more expensive. So the, uh, the, the message I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of transformation in the digital uh, footprint of India that has happened over so many years. You and me are all equally responsible, industry, uh, public sector, uh, policy makers, everybody else, uh, everybody is equally, equally participant in that. Now, this session is about cyber comm, cyber security, and, and we discuss one aspect of it a lot of times. What aspect is that? And I'm going to, there's a reason I'm going to shift to English also, because my message is very clear. That the 85 crore smartphone users, 85 crore plus, we have to be cognizant that they only speak 15% of English. They don't 85% English. And why that is important? Because if in our approach, in our policy, in our thought process, the 85% of English do not speak English, the many languages are speaking, plus dialects, if we do stakeholder, then we will fail in our cyber security. We have done a lot of surveys and we know that if there is a link in English and people don't know what is written in it, then they will say it foolishly and unknowingly. Foolishly is a wrong word, I take back my words. Unknowingly, they will press it because they think it's an important message. So, a lot of things I'll say is how India is converting this opportunity of digital India into an opportunity to make sure it is true empowerment, bottom up. कि पूरे देश में पूरे भारत में डिजिटल भारत होना चाहिए अब इस प्रोजेक्ट का नाम तो हाउ इट इज बीइंग कन्वर्टेड इनटू अ प्रोजेक्ट व्हिच इज यू नो नॉट ओनली सॉल्विंग इंडियाज प्रॉब्लम्स बट आल्सो गिविंग एन अल्टरनेट मॉडल टू द वर्ल्ड फॉर साइबर सिक्योरिटी अब साइबर सिक्योरिटी में व्हाट व्हाट यूज्ड टू हैपन एंड स्टिल हैपेंस इज दैट वी नीड अ वेरी प्रिवेंटिव थिंग कि हमारे पे जो अटैक हो रहे हैं जो हमारे पे डेटा है उसको कैसे सिक्योर करें एंड हाउ डू वी एनहांस डिजिटल लिटरेसी और लिटरेसी अराउंड साइबर सिक्योरिटी बट वी आर एज आई सेड टुडे 85 करोड़ यूजर्स आप इस एक और मैं आपसे यू नो आई लास्ट यू अनदर क्वेश्चन व्हिच इज वे बैक इन 2014 अगेन there were about two or three units assembling slash making, making these smartphones in India. Now even Apple makes it. You, you all know this or not? 97% of the phones being made, uh, being consumed in India, today are being made in India. Why, does that, why is that important? A small fact, but why is that important? 
देखिए साइबर सिक्योरिटी इज अ वेरी वेरी होलिस्टिक सब्जेक्ट नो वन पर्सन कैन टॉक अबाउट इट इन कंप्लीट कॉम्प्रीहेंशन इट रिक्वायर्स हार्डवेयर नेटवर्क सॉफ्टवेयर एप्लीकेशन ऑपरेटिंग सिस्टम हम एक मतलब इफ यू सी द डेटा सप्लाई चेन द वैल्यू चेन ऑफ डेटा उसके अंदर इतने होल्स हैं एंड इतने हमने बहुत होल्स प्लग किए हैं वी स्टॉप चाइनीज टेक्नोलॉजी इन इंडिया फॉर एग्जाम्पल फाइव जी इज कंप्लीटली वी आर ट्राइंग टू मेक इट नॉन चाइनीज इन इंडिया एंड आई एम सेंग इट वेरी क्लियरली बिकॉज एट्स अ पॉलिसी वीड मेड बिकॉज आर डेटा वॉज गेटिंग कॉम्प्रोमाइज एट बाई प्लेयर्स दैट वी डेंट वॉन्ट इट टू बी कॉम्प्रोमाइज एट माई फ्रेंड सुब्रता इज सिटिंग हेर ही अंडरस्टैंड वॉट आई एम सेंग दिस इज द इम्पॉर्टेंस दैट फ्रॉम द नेटवर्क टू द हार्डवेयर टू द ऑपरेटिंग सिस्टम टू द एप्लीकेशन so lot of the 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 talk i wanted to give is that we we've seen the biggest platforms so one of the angles i want to so hardware software uske upar bahut sari discussions hoti hain we do a lot of discussions on that but what we don't understand how we are trying to secure a critical supply chain of data how we are trying to secure not hardware ke upar i am not going to talk i can talk about it different session but today jo digital public goods hain and what is that approach and first of all what is a digital public good anybody here who can tell me what's a digital public good a road is a digital public a, a public good not a digital public good abhi tak hui nahi virtualized road so a road a road is a public good what are digital public goods anybody here uses a digital public good everybody in this room uses it from aadhar to upi to uh, to ekyc जब आप कोविन का सर्टिफिकेट लेते हैं अपने मोबाइल फोन पर दैट इज अ डिजिटल पब्लिक गुड एट द बैक एंड एंड डिजिटल पब्लिक गुड का ये मैंने आपको ये दिस प्रेजेंटेशन दिस स्लाइड दैट यू आर सीइंग व्हाई इज दिस दीज आर द नाइन बिगेस्ट प्लेटफॉर्म्स इन द वर्ल्ड दे आर प्राइवेट प्लेटफॉर्म्स दे आर नॉट पब्लिक प्लेटफॉर्म्स हु ओन्स दैम प्राइवेट पीपल ओन दैम नथिंग रॉन्ग इन दैट राइट द राइट साइड डोंट ऑपरेट इन इंडिया द लेफ्ट साइड इज द बिगेस्ट प्लेटफॉर्म्स फ्रॉम ग्लोबली mostly from the west coast of usa there is a 10th platform in the world which is the digital public good of india jiska naam hai india stack jisme kya kya hai aadhar 2 upi 3 ekyc 4 data consent layer what is called depa data empowerment and protection architecture see you see the word and this is the digital public good means everybody रोड पे कोई बंदिश नहीं होती एवरीबडी कैन यूज इट बिजनेस कैन यूज इट होटल्स कैन यूज इट कंज्यूमर्स कैन यूज इट वी एंड वेन वी यूज इट द रोड डजेंट बेनिफिट इट्स द डेस्टिनेशन दैट बेनिफिट इन सेम सेम अप्रोच फॉर डिजिटल पब्लिक गुड्स द डेस्टिनेशन दैट प्रोडक्ट्स दैट क्रिएट क्रिएटेड ऑन टॉप ऑफ आधार ऑन टॉप ऑफ यू पी आई ऑन टॉप ऑफ द ई के वाई सी बेनिफिट ऑल ऑफ अस यूज इट एंड वन ऑफ द रीजन आई एम मैंशनिंग दिस अगेन इज जियो what you this call a geo effect what is the geo effect it brought down the cost of data in india right you know how did what was a big difference that geo did way back in 2016 it was not demonetization before demonetization what was the big effect geo did when they launched the geo phone anybody remembers that they did a complete digital onboarding paperless so किस पे बेस थी वो बायोमेट्रिक्स पे बेस थी आधार पे बेस थी ई के वाई सी पे बेस थी इट ब्रॉड डाउन देयर कॉस्ट एंड दैट इज पार्ट कंट्रीब्यूटर पार्ट कंट्रीब्यूटर इन ब्रिंगिंग द डेटा कॉस्ट डाउन इन इंडिया हु बेनिफिटेड डिड ई के वाई सी सिस्टम ऑफ इंडिया बेनिफिट डिड द डिजी लॉकर बेनिफिट फ्रॉम इट हु बेनिफिट कंज्यूमर्स बिजनेस लाइक जियो द होल इंडस्ट्री राइट एंड वी क्रिएटेड द बिगेस्ट मार्केट इन द वर्ल्ड सारे स्टार्टअप Subhi is sitting here. She works for Inbomi now, right? Her startups benefited. Audience, pehle 14 crore ki audience thi, ab 85 crore ki audience hai. She can serve more ads to all of us. Again, very proud of Naveen and what they have built at Inbomi. So, uh, these are these are these are these are things that we need to do to empower our own. And that is the word, the part of the digital, the the India stack, Aadhar, UPI, EKYC, and DEPA. digital uh, data empowerment and protection architecture we want to empower but also keep it secure protection both consumers and as everybody else so your dpgs ki approach hai nowhere no country in the world does it this is the india stack this is india's digital dna and this is the india stack that i'm talking about and why this is important is because there are so many aspects operating system hardware 
networks. But there is one critical thing, and, and we are solving for those. As we go along, we are solving for those. But uh, one of the things we needed to solve was a critical foundation layer, identity layer, that everybody in India can use and can benefit from. And that ensures what? And that's why I'm mentioning this in a cyber security session or a cyber comms session, is that that ensures that this data, this whole techno-legal framework, this techno-regulatory framework that we have, the data doesn't flow out of India. We have controls, both, both technical controls, but also regulatory controls. And again, I don't want, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to simplify it so that everybody can appreciate it. It's very simple. This is our own tools, our own technology. And every startup is building on top of it, but with certain conditions, right? And that conditions ensure that anybody who participates in this follows those conditions. Let me give you one example. UPI. Anybody in this room does not use UPI? Please tell me if anybody raises the hand that I don't use UPI through Paytm, through WhatsApp, through Google Pay, right? Through Phone Pay. Phone Pay is owned by whom? Can anybody tell me who owns Phone Pay? The company, uh, original company was Flipkart. Today it's owned by Walmart. Who owns WhatsApp? Meta, Facebook. Google is owned by Alphabet. All these are international companies, right? But they work on what? on UPI. The base layer is what? Whose rules and regulations they have to follow? UPI. And that is a very big thing. It, both security issue, they cannot now, even if, for example, in some countries, Google Pay stopped operating because of geopolitical issues. If they stopped operating in India, it doesn't make any difference to us. Because underground, under underlying layer is what? UPI. Google Pay is just a front end. They won't do it. They are fighting to get more share, but I'm saying if they want to, right? Second, all the data policies, all the uh, policies of how they share data, what data they store are governed by us, not by them. It's a techno legal tool. We have given them a tool to operate on, but they have to operate within our boundaries. Just a road pick conditions, hoti na, speed limit, hoti hai. Right hand, just kiss lane mein drive karna hai, wo log follow nahi karte hai, but there are conditions. Same thing in this digital public good, there are a lot of regulations, but we can enforce those regulations because we have control. And that is a simple message I'm saying. When you have control of the underlying technology, we, and similarly we have made the application layer, this is all the application layer, the digital public goods application layer. Uh, the government is at the center of these, these startups that you're talking about. Any startup today that you mention in India, I would say any startup is working on one or the other layers of this India stack. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, there is a lot of issues when we, we focus a lot on hardware, we focus a lot of critical infrastructure, but when you start from the operating system to search, to e-commerce, to transactions, to cloud, there is a lot of interventions that we are doing and, uh, and to break the, not only to break the monopolies, but also to present a viable option to uh, to to us and uh, to us as a country and uh, what what we are seeing globally as a trend globally as a trend is that there are few countries dominating it few countries dominating the supply chain for what critical uh, the, all the hardware so if we had not uh, still the semiconductor part we have launched the semiconductor mission in india that's also a cyber security um, mission project Finally, it will solve for us controlling the supply chain for, uh, for our hardware. Today, while we are making a lot of phones in India, I said 97%, it's also important to know that we are still dependent as a supply chain on certain semiconductors, certain countries. And those, those countries we know, they're dominated by South Korea, Japan, Taiwan um, uh, as countries. So, the, this is the implications of controlling your own destiny. At least in the application framework, in the identity framework, payments framework, we have we have done a few things to to ensure uh, this whole approach of digital public goods to cyber security. Couple of points, and then um, Sarika, if you permit, we can have a few questions if anybody wants. Or um, what are we doing? 
by building dpgs as i said it's a dpg stands for digital public goods by building dpgs we are build, uh, anything on top of it any platforms that use our technology we are making them accountable i gave you some examples we are ensuring data privacy because they have to follow our rules rules the techno legal rules uh, it is not the wild west they cannot just take any um, any uh, uh, any data away uh, as per their needs um, we are actually making and and again who owns aadhar who owns upi any anybody can tell me who owns that and who owns uid public sector government of india it's a combination of you and me same thing with upi unlike anything else so we are making a huge amount of investment into the strategic areas if you may call it to un to make sure that there is privacy and uh, uh, of data um, also on some other fronts what we are working we are ensuring there is a lot of self regulation um, uh, of 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 industries why self regulation is important is that uh, the latest industries the emerging technologies there will it will always be faster than regulation so we have to have industry coming together and the government is in, as creating an environment again to make self regulation a, a norm and that's also going to be very important because so many times so many times there are so many so many things you do as software or applications on your phone that re really you don't know why they are uh, why they are taking that data or why they are doing those actions that are um, that are unaccountable for cyber security uh, cyber norms also means that we all have to understand that we have to make technology neutral non weaponizable and uh, unbiased that's also very very important you can have technology which can be weaponized against you uh, we saw some platforms doing it we banned them but the non weaponization of technology is also very important uh, technology financial systems and for that we need to control our own destiny if somebody is weaponizing it we should have the power to cut that umbilical cord that umbilical cord can be only cut if we don't have a alternate mapping system to india imagine today everybody works mostly 99% on one map you all know which map it is where you use every day to map that and 1% maybe use some other map but unless we create a alternate to that mapping system whether it's the gps satellites to the navic system to the chip to the uh, to the actual application we we will we will weapon uh, technology can always be weaponized and it was weaponized during the kargil war by the way we were denied access to certain gps coordinates that it that that we should have been given so we and oh, and while we are doing this what we are doing ye jitne आपने कोविन का नाम सुना राइट जो वैक्सीनेशन पे था या यूपीआई टुडे देर आर 80 टू 90 कंट्रीज डिफरेंट समबडी 30 कंपनी कंट्रीज टॉकिंग टू अस ऑन कोविन 25 प्लस कंट्रीज टॉकिंग टू अस टू इंप्लीमेंट यूपीआई अनदर 10 कंट्रीज आस्किंग अस टू हेल्प विद देयर आधार प्रोजेक्ट्स व्हाई आर वी डूइंग दैट बिकॉज जियोपॉलिटिकली लास्ट थिंग जियोपॉलिटिकली द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग दैट इज बिकमिंग इज ट्रस्ट इन टेक्नोलॉजी as consumers as you and me we should now start we should ask ourselves do we trust this technology just because it's free are we going to use it or do we trust this technology before using it so technology coming out of india technology coming out of india always comes with the stamp of trust because of our democratic norms because of our checks and balances because of our accountability that we put on ourselves aadhar nobody knows how many iterations it went through how many lenses of privacy checks it went through right some may call it activism i always had said it that was good because that made us stronger right and that was that is something that we are now when we take that to the world and say we help we will help you co create that we are also teaching other countries in the world to secure their data supply chains their platform supply chains so we are creating global public goods india has joined the digital public goods alliance globally so um, this is the model what is called the dpg model because people uh, i'm sure my previous speakers very illustrious from uh, uh, from uh, rajesh pand ji to sanjay behel and everybody else has talked about everything else i didn't want to repeat the same things i just wanted to present a new thought process 
why this approach, digital public goods approach, to um, to uh, securing our cyber future, making sure technology is not weaponized against us, payment systems are not weaponized against us, data is not weaponized against us, is also very critical. And for that, we need to have our own alternatives, and that's what India has done, the open data platforms. And with the success of India Stack, with the success of India Stack, the government has become very ambitious. Now we are creating stacks for everything. Whether it's for e-commerce or whether it's for transactions, whether it's for skilling, travel, Digi Yatra, credit. 1200 applications, you know, 1200 fake or you not call them fake technically, illegal unauthorized applications were banned by the government who were giving loans. So somebody asked me, Ki loan to dere the kharaab kya kar rahe Paisa de rahe But what was wrong with that? The loaning process was profiled. They were profiling people who could not pay back those loans or were at a risk and they were doing social defamation of those, uh, those individuals. So they were targeting that and that was also not good. Remember, technology can be really weaponized in small to large forms and that's, that's the message I'm trying to give. That only when you make credit open, for example, then people will not fall Instead of falling for the village Mahajan, they were falling for the uh, illegal app operating out of somewhere. So, for to make and to ban all these 1200 or 1500 illegal apps, uh, loaning apps, we had to make sure that we, we have our own systems. And that's, so what you see on this chart is, is the fact that India has presented this whole open credit enablement network. It's a marketplace for credit. Uh, so, jab tak hum apna systems nahi banayenge, dusra ka band karna will be one solution, but will not help the consumer. So, what we are doing is, we are making sure that by presenting our own options, we have control on our own destiny, on our own cyber destiny. That's the brief message, friends. Um, I'll leave it here, and uh, if you have any questions, I can quickly answer. Otherwise, I think I am done with my time. Thank you very much, and good luck for the rest of the conference. So thank you, Mr. Gupta. Thank you for this session. So we need you for a second. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? And thank you, sir, for letting us this approach. It's kind of a cyber art nirbhar bharat, I would say, where we talk about actually getting the digital public goods for cyber security. So that was also one thing. So um, during the inaugural session, we did discuss on the Atmanirbhar Bharat and Honorable Prime Minister's vision. So I would say we add on to it now Cyber Atmanirbhar Bharat with a kind of an output which comes from Cybercom 2022. Thank you for that approach. Anybody wants to ask any question? No questions means everybody has understood everything. That's a normal role we, we used to follow in our engineering college. So I hope that's the thing we take it. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we would like to thank you with the green certificate. That's a ticket of trees we plant in your name. Uh, it has been planted in Sundarbans National Park, West Bengal. And thank you, this kind of uh, uh, Go Green initiative of FIKI for joining us uh, today. So with this, we immediately move on to our next panel discussion. We did hear about the approach the India needs to follow so that we are not targeted against us. The real policy initiatives needs to be taken forward and how balancing needs to be done so that the business is also not affected. The innovation continues into its growth trajectory. So that's what the next session is going to focus on. The subject is policy intervention and harmonization for balancing innovation and security. I would now request the panelists for the next session to kindly join us on the dice. Give us a second. I think my the team is just uh, setting up the stage. 
So meanwhile, while the team is setting up the stage, I'll introduce the panelists. The speakers for the session are Dr. Subhi Chaturvedi, Global Senior VP, Chief Corporate Affairs and Policy Officer in Mobi Group. Mr. Subrata Kumar Mitra, Head Government and Industry Relations, Ericsson India. Mr. Vineet Kumar, President, Cyber Peace Foundation. Mr. Anish Dhawan, Director, Sales Excellence Strategy and Planning, CEO of Public Sector, uh, Microsoft. Mr. Manish Sena, Director, Sales Engineering, India and Sark Royal X. And the session is being moderated by Ms. Aparna Gaur, Leader, IPTMT and Cyber Security Practice, NDA, that is Nishit Deshai and Associates. And we also have the chair for the session, Professor Rajat Muna, Director, IIT Gandhinagar. He would be joining a little late. He's stuck up in Ministry of Electronics and IT for the ongoing meeting. So I would request the moderator to start the session with the panelists. And whenever the uh, chair joins in, we can request him for his special address. So over to you, Aparna, and thank you all for joining in. Uh, you've heard the speakers in the first half of the day. Some of you were present since morning. So you know the task in hand is now a little tougher when you talk about the policy which the governments are working on, various things are being looked into, the, the industry is thinking about the data protection bill and others. So how do you actually balance it out, keeping in mind the innovation and security? Over to you, Aparna. Oh. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this session. Before we move on to the question and answers, I thought I'll share my you know two bits on what we think what I think should be some factors that should be considered, you know, when any policy that affects te technology to, uh, you know, to say uh, should be is, is being formulated or is being thought of, right? Uh, when we talk about any government policy today, considering how every sector today is so reliant on technology, right? There is uh, uh, multiple ways in which government policies can impact technology, and uh, you know, some some are positive ways, some are negative ways, right? Some of the pos positive ways in which policies can impact uh, technology is uh, creating, for instance, demand for new technology and pav paving a way for research in that area, right? On the other hand, there could be certain negatives, such as creating barriers to certain types of technologies, right, which should be avoided. Another consideration, and this is uh, very important for cybersecurity today, what we're seeing is that on a global level, there are discussions that are happening, right? There are, uh, there is also a talk of a new UN treaty that could be considered for cybersecurity. At a bilateral level as well, uh, a lot of countries are entering into cooperation treaties. India and UK uh, most recently have announced certain uh, measures for cooperation, etc. right? When these global measures are being considered, uh, it's it must also be seen what is the impact of it at a national level, right? Because at a global level, certain things uh, may work, but when we consider how what India is as a country, right? Considering the di different stakeholder holders that are there, there are these things should also be considered even when the uh, policy at a global level is being considered. Thirdly, when we talk about policy, when not only, and today what we're going to be talking about is not only regulation that should be coming in, right, in terms of, uh, uh, say, better cyber security practices, etc. But when we talk about policy, we're talking about a comprehensive framework, right, where, uh, uh, where the needs of all stakeholders are considered, where, where the, where, uh, the awareness that all stakeholders have is considered, and basis that, there is a framework is a framework is created where all stakeholders understand their responsibilities and then they can work together to create something that you know earlier also we spoke about maybe say security by design so these are some aspects that should be considered one last point that i, I want to talk about is that technology is ever evolving so when technology evolves so fast Policy in relation to technology cannot be something that can be, you know, stagnant. So my view definitely is, and I'll, I'll let my, my co-panelists talk about this later, uh, is that when we're talking about a situation, uh, uh, you know, a point like cyber security, maybe policy also has to be dynamic in nature, which means that maybe every six months, every one year or so, the government also reconsiders and maybe speaks to the stakeholders to consider what are the possible, what are the challenges that are being faced, etc., in relation to the uh, policies that have, that have come in. So I think those are my initial thoughts. So I'll move on to the question and answers. Um, 
the first question I have is for Subi. Uh, Subi, my question to you is for a country, especially for a country like India, how important do you think are global security standards and guidelines when it comes to creating a digital shield for the country? Thank you so much, Aparna, and uh, thank you everybody, and especially Fiki and the entire Secretariat for hosting this. My name is Subhi Chaturvedi, I am in InMobi, which was India's first unicorn. Thi. We did start the fire, I am a global public policy and corporate affairs officer. Hu. More than um, every other designation and every other hat that I wear, I am a very proud Indian. My family has been part of the national freedom struggle. And today, Arvind ji, you just heard and he spoke about national public goods and digital goods. The internet is a very powerful resource and what most of us are solving for and especially us at InMobi, we're the world's second largest uh, you know, ad tech firm and independently we're the largest ad tech firm. We are also now a double unicorn. Uh, Glance ka naam aap sabo ne sunauga. About 400 million Indian users experience their first internet through the lock screen. We are present on the lock screen. Aapko phone unlock karne ki bhi you will experience our product. So what is it that's changed over time? Uh, both Fiki, um both Fiki and this room are very, very special for me. In 2012, in October, mein, India ka pehla multi-stakeholder conference on internet governance happened right here in this room. Uh, Sarika is sitting here. We were all part of the organizing committee. What happened to that? Cyber security, as Aparna ji has mentioned here, um, is something which involves all stakeholders. It involves the private sector. It involves academia. It involves the government. It involves multilateral institutions. It involves... Um, intergovernmental organizations. Jab baat UN tak jati hai, and again in October 2012 there was an attempt um, called the UNCIRP where there was conversation that in conversations mein diet for role responsibility sirf sarkaro ki honi chahi. And this is where internet is different from telecom and I've spent time in both the sectors. They speak to each other but they're not similar. So internet is permissionless innovation. Internet ki char bade values hai. Openness, interoperability, it amplifies human rights. When we talk about global guidance um, and guidelines and security standards and what works for India, there is a lot of potential that India has for the first time ever after Digital India was launched, there's a lot of success that we've made. We now have 100 unicorns and all of them are building on the tech layer. So for the first time, instead of learning from the West, India is giving back to the West. What is at stake? A lot. Both internet freedom, potential economic opportunity and our struggle for um, our place in the global value chain. And if we do not look at balancing security with international standards, so what is it that you're effectively looking at? You're looking at over $6 trillion economy impact in terms of GDP. This alone, the cybersecurity risk that we face globally, that alone would be the third largest by GDP after US and China, if you look at the kind of impact that we're talking about. What is at stake? We all know we're living in a world post-COVID, remote work, uh, work systems where controls are lesser, uh, a lot of emphasis on app-based security systems, a lot of emphasis on how is it that even the smallest or the weakest link in the chain can be secured. So therefore, I can't agree more that you need to look at global standards and especially why, uh, I don't know how many of you recall the solar winds attack that happened. It was very powerful. It was driven by a state actor. Uh, it was that out of all 500 fortune companies, 400 of them got impacted. So when I was visiting the US and we were engaging with the US government, they said, the DA's office, that either two ways कंपनी हैं जो हैक हो चुकी हैं या उन्होंने कोई इवेंट फेस किया है या ऐसी कंपनी हैं जिन्हें अभी तक पता नहीं चला है दैट देव बिन हैक्ड और देव बिन देर सिस्टम्स हैव बिन कॉम्प्रोमाइज सो व्हेन यू लुक एट इंटरनेशनल स्टैंडर्ड्स इन मई 2018 ईयू केम अप विद जीडीपीआर दैट वाज प्रोटेक्शन बिल एंड वी डिसाइडेड टू विड्रॉ इट 
इसमें कम से कम आठ सालों का काम लगा ऑल ऑफ अस हैव कंट्रीब्यूटेड एट वेरियस फॉर्मेट्स एंड स्ट्रक्चर्स बट दैट इज व्हाट आई एब्सोल्युटली एडमायर अबाउट द डिसीजन मेकर्स ऑफ द कंट्री दैट we respect industry we respect innovation and when you are balancing innovation one of the biggest asks will be how do you make sure that you look at global standards you look at harmonization so that a you are setting up incentives for good practices so that when something like the solar winds happen they do not need permission from telecom networks they do not need your elements or servers to be compromised they manage to exploit vulnerabilities without even getting into your network so when you have global standards, standards and when you have uniform standards you make sure that your speed of response is faster your response is coordinated so how do security agencies work with each other they work through mlats they have country level agreements they take as much as 6 months sometimes to get information so a deeper enhanced level of cooperation where there is consistent engagement i loved what aparna said that policy has to keep up with tech and a six monthly evaluation not just you know things that we cast in stone and we cement them and say ye ho gaya hamara national framework is out and most importantly for the internet unlike telecom which is a licensee licensor arrangement internet is you and me it is as innovative um and therefore it's not a public use. utility it is not like electricity and water so industry jab paisa lagati hai infrastructure pe spends karti hai tab you get your internet you need access to cell sites there is an investment and then there is freedom to build and innovate so when so one of the two fathers of the internet talks about permissionless innovation so that's where a lot of us will need to sit at the table a lot of us will need to be present and what you will gain are coherent international standards what you will gain are reduced costs what you will gain is better access to markets because you are looking at global standards and therefore there's reciprocity there is greater acceptance because remember companies are designing in india but they're building for the world and that's what we're trying to get at a 1 trillion dollar digital economy and a 5 trillion dollar Dollar economy, right? So, if those goals are global, the approach will need to be holistic, but needs to be embraced and done in a uniquely India way. I'll stop here, Apan. Thank you, Subhi. I'll move on to the next question for uh, Subrata. Uh, what do you think? You know, there's this constant fight and constant race between technology and how even hackers are, you know, evolving day by day, right? So when entities think about when organizations think about innovation how do they strike a balance between innovation and safe innovation or security and innovation thank you aparna uh, thank you fiki for the opportunity uh, this uh, if i may use a corollary the if you those of you are interested in say uh, you know wildlife channel you will find the predator and prey Uh, in any forest that uh, is time immemorial and that will continue same is the case with hackers and protectors uh, it is a perennial uh, thing it will continue uh, the if you are servicing a network it is your responsibility 24 7365 to ensure that you protect the network and similarly the hackers on the other side they are also working 24 7365 to find opportunities uh, to breach in now if you look uh, i'll speak specifically from the industry that i come which is telecom uh, currently as you are aware india is rolling out uh, the 5g network uh, some of you have started enjoying the speeds and the latency and uh, my belief is that in a short period of time uh, large number of uh, fellow citizens will enjoy the benefits of 5g but what 5g uh, does bring in is uh, it enables huge number of use cases which were unheard of in 4g era uh, it allows multiple industries uh, uh, to access and harness the power of 5g Uh, industrial users manufacturing you are talking about even uh, as basic as you know drone movements within the city they will be using the 5g network uh, you are talking about logistic systems and of course the entire entertainment ar vr and all of that is going to get used that will 
enable or it will open up the system so today if you see in 4g uh, telecom has been predominantly within the sector so the security rules guidelines and as you understand telecom is a regulated industry worldwide so there are very clear uh, rules and regulations laid down licensing conditions under which operators and companies all of us operate in who work in the telecom sector but in 5g this network is actually going to go beyond into outside domain if i may call it multi domain and that's where the game gets interesting uh, both for i think the telecom industry and the entire 5g ecosystem to ensure that it continues to remain secure and trusted because as uh, to refer mr gupta's point end of the day a uh, technology adoption today is not merely innovation is it's also a matter of trust i may give you a very innovative technology i may give you a very ease of use technology but if it does not have the trust level uh, it is unlikely users are going to use it i think that's where uh, it becomes important for to secure these uh, points across the network and there the industry has done considerable work uh, there is something called uh, uh, Na- network equipment security assurance scheme nisas which is a global Uh, accepted 3gbp and uh, gsma adopted uh, technology assurance scheme which ensures that you know the equipments that go into the network uh, have the amount of uh, security uh, from the indian context if you see india has also taken uh, large number of measures to secure uh, telecom networks to select uh, secure the entire telecom ecosystem uh, much before the 5g rollouts have actually started and you would have heard about the international directive for trusted source uh, trusted products what it basically ensures is that uh, companies products uh, their ecosystem that is their suppliers supplier suppliers uh, everyone who is engaged in the supply chain uh, needs to be trusted and the product that comes from such source are the only ones which are allowed to be uh, you know put on to the network uh, it is uh, Now, many countries have done it india is not an uh, you know uh, first ones to do it but india has done it in a very uh, interesting uh, very consultative industry engaged consultative process uh, due to which today you see there are large number of uh, trusted source and trusted products which are available for telecom networks for roll out uh, the second uh, regulation which is uh, under play is the indian telecom security assurance requirement it's r Uh, which again uh, is uh, much technical at the level if you see at uh, the trusted was uh, lot less a technical it addressed issues primarily of supply chain resilience uh, supply chain assurance part of it and if you get into the it's are it handles the technical layer of it uh, that comes uh, now coming on to the aspect of this hacker piece of it uh, please understand uh, when you look at an hacker or when we see the threat uh, Uh, actor motivations these are not uh, single as what we see you know normally uh, most of the time romanticized in the form of a movie or a villain it's not an individual uh, we see a range of actors uh, so one end there are three if i may put it one is what we call the typical the surveillance and uh, espionage Uh, for example uh, you could be uh, state actors or non state actors uh, they are just interested to know you know where you are going what time you are coming from office uh, what uh, applications you are using what is the food that you are consuming uh, for critical people what kind of medications you are under so if you are uh, you know if you are buying medicines on the internet it, uh, your uh, medicine prescription is an extremely important thing for me to know what kind of vulnerabilities you are in so that is at uh, surveillance and uh, what we call uh, espionage case the second are purely in the case of financial gains you know those we see ransomware attacks uh, you know they are individual or sometimes they are groups or sometimes we even see state actors who indulge to bring down uh, an enterprise and that and uh, then they most of the time we find it is actually for a financial gain uh, you pay money they again uh, you know uh, open you the network get you get give you access back to your Or critical equipment infrastructure and on and third is of course a pure disruption or sabotage where the entire networks or grids are brought down so 
you will have to evaluate your response mechanisms for each one of this you cannot have a single uh, solution to address all that and say this is what we do and that's where from the net if you see from the network perspective uh, telecom networks when we say well, we primarily look at that you know this starts at the standards level of it which is typically what your NISA, GSMA, uh, 3GPP has done, where we believe that instead of one company, let the entire industry, 800 operators, uh, another 1,000 odd companies, they came in, build a common standard, it's done. Uh, the second is at the product development stage, you cannot have a security and after third, security has to be right from the word go of the design. The third is the entire processes that you have inside within the company. Uh, you know, uh, simple processes, you know, you force people to change password, you force people not to use the last five times password. I know a lot of us face a discomfort, but those are all processes which are built in. Earlier it used to be don't use last three times password. Then companies have figured three is not sufficient, now it is five times. You are not allowed to use sequential number. Earlier people used to use one, two, three, four, then it became two, three, four, five. Now you can't do because we are all learning in the process. So processes is very important. You don't want system administrator to share the password, put it on a fixed, you know, note script out on the server. So you have the server password is encrypted, but then you have that LO stick. You know, which says that user ID and password, I think. And the third is the network deployments. When you are actually deploying the network, you have a process laid down. Is it actually getting rolled out on the field, the rules? And the last is, you know, the entire network operations phase. So if you look into that holistically only, then you do. But if you say, I will do only in one layer of it, then, it's, then you remain vulnerable to, uh, you know, malware and other attacks. Thank you, Upan. I'll pause here. Thank you, Subrata. I'll move on to Manish for the next question. So we already spoke about, you know, there's uh, the data protection bill that's likely to come up soon. We have the telecom bill, etc. Do you think there's always this fear and there's a lot of critics about, reg uh, you know, against regulation saying that regulation may hinder growth of a sector or say the technology sector. What are your views on this? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that was the start of our discussion, Apana. First of all, thank you for um, inviting me here. And uh, thanks to Fiki for uh, making me part of this uh, panel. And uh, uh, just a brief introduction. I come in from technology provider background. I am a hardcore technical guy. And uh, uh, in Answering this question, there's an importance of global standards, right? We, we, we talked about uh, global standards, so we talked about it, Apana highlighted about it. The couple of global standards which are very important in security. Uh, why, why I would term them important? Because for any organization, there has to be a framework. I mean, when you are building up your security architecture, when you uh, want to protect your security infrastructure, right? Build up security infrastructure, want to protect your um, IT infrastructure. It is very important that you build up a very robust framework. What does that robust framework means is that how do you secure your infrastructure against evolving threat? I mean, we have been hearing about threats like ransomware. We thought uh, we hear about threats like uh, um, um, nation state attack. I mean, recent is the nation state attack. How do you build that framework is very important. And <coughs> all these global standards help you build that framework. Like, uh, let's talk about three or four of them. One is NIST. NIST is, uh, is, is a very comprehensive framework. You talk of NIST 53 or NIST 171. These frameworks define that how do you plan your incident response. If you are breached, if you have a security threat in your network, how do you plan your incident response uh, methodology? How do you ensure that your detection is effective? How do you ensure that you have proper controls in place across all the vectors? When you look at your network, it is not only one single data center. That's not a network today. Network is dispersed. It is all distributed. You have on-premise data centers. You have cloud. There's cloud adoption that is happening. How do you ensure that across all the vectors, you have a lens across eyeball across all these vectors and you are able to effectively analyze the security threat whether it is coming in from cloud or whether it is coming in directly to your data center now NIST then uh, you would have heard about PCI DSS you would have heard about uh, HIPAA 
then ISO standards. These are a couple of standards. Organization adopt one of these standards and make their security framework. This is just a precursor to what I wanted to, to discuss further. That is on the regulations part, right? One is global standard that you form, but then countrywide there are regulations. We all know GDPR. GDPR is something that we have all heard of, discussed so many times. What actually was the purpose of GDPR? The purpose was not to protect organizations. The purpose of GDPR was to protect the data of citizens, right? Sometime back, the data of our citizens like us who are on internet, it's floating everywhere. I mean, your PI data, critical PI data, uh, user information, it, is, it, it, it was not uh, uh, within the domain of your immediate service provider. It was floating across. How do you ensure that it is all regulated? How do you ensure that any data processor, whoever is processing your data, is not selling your data? These are critical data. I mean, just for, for an example, if you are a university student, if you are working, if you are in a specific university, that data is also a PI data. Your name and the university where you are studying or the course that you are taking is also a PI data. How do you ensure that this data is locked inside the data processor? It does not share it with any third party. That's what uh, European nations uh, through GDPR enforced, right? And that that became a universal standard. It's not enforced onto us. GDPR is not something that we have to, uh, to, to adhere to in India. But if you are doing a business to any European nation country, then we have to follow that, that practice. But why are organizations adopt, adopting GDPR? Why are organizations asking for it? Because it is very comprehensive. It lays that foundation of data privacy. It lays the foundation that how are people or intermediaries or organizations going to use this data. Now moving to them, this is global scenario. We are talking of global scenario. But look at uh, what is specific in India? What are we doing with regulations in India? Take an example of Article 79B, which is very recent. It came in three months back by certain. Certain is an organization, um, all of us you would know about certain. And uh, the recent Article 79B is encompassing all the enterprise or all, all, the all the sectors in the country, whether it's the banking, finance, IT, ITS, telecom, Everyone is supposed to uh, follow that specific article. What it states is that if you have a security incident in place in your organizations, you are going to report that security incident with artifacts to certain within six hours time frame. This is first. Second is about data privacy. You are going to, to ensure that if there is a breach of data, you are going to report back to that organization. Now, how does it help an organization, right? This is an add-on work. For any organization, this is an add-on work. For an enterprise, this is more work than regular. For any enterprise, if they have to provide this data, first thing is they have to have the capability. They have to have the security framework in place. They need to have a mechanism where they, they are able to detect threats across all these vectors, collect the artifact and then share it with, uh, uh, with the regulatory body here in this case is certain. Data breach is very critical. I mean, if you have a data breach, you need to also, th there are a lot of implications of data breach, right? So you, when you have to inform, you have to be aware of what's happening in your organization. So uh, I mean, this is on one side of it. We are all talking of regulations being enablers, regulations being helping organizations build up uh, a robust platform, be more confident, more agile. But uh, the other aspect to it is, it, is it a hindrance also? Is this regulation also causing uh, or uh, hindering the growth or hindering the innovations or resulting in less agility of organizations to adopt new technology? I would, I would say to some extent, yes, if the policies are, as uh, was mentioned earlier, by, um, I think Subi was mentioning about that policies have to be agile, they, they, they have to be dynamic, they have to be changing with innovations. So uh, there are two things that happened during COVID, right? Digitalization of all the assets that happened. Most of the banking, finance industry, if you see, they moved to digitalization as an end-to-end -end process. And then you had cloud adoption. Everyone wants to scale. The number of users are phenomenally increasing. How do you do that elastic scaling? It's all through cloud that is possible. It's not possible through hardware. You need to scale through cloud. 
Now, these two are very critical, digitalization, end-to-end -end digitalization, and second is cloud adoption. How do you ensure that you are uh, taking your product first to the market? You are faster in innovating, you are agile, is all depending upon these certain innovations that, that you have to imbibe. At times, regulations are hindrance if the policies are not matching or not, not, not aligning with your growth uh, uh, enablers. Typically cloud and uh, data localization are the two aspects which I would want to point out here. Data localization is about your data or your enterprise data should be staying within the country. Now, how does it relate with the, whether it is important for security? Yes, it is important for, for security. But whether it is a hindrance? Yes, because it's a hindrance because you can't adopt all the cloud technologies. The ones which are within the country, which will have a localization of data, only those service providers you can adopt, right? So my suggestion to regulators here, or uh, uh, what I would like to see is, when such regulations happens, then there has to be a periodic review of the relevance of those regulations also. Data localization, to what extent is important? What kind of data should stay within the country? What kind of data can, can move out of the country? A further drill down, a double click into it in terms of what's the relevant content that needs to be, be staying within the country, that's very important. And the policies have to be tuned so that cloud adoption definitely needs to, to to be addressed i mean organizations need to move to cloud and uh, the regulations should tune for for uh, faster cloud adoption so these are a couple of pointers that i wanted to bring it up thank you thank you so much manish vinita i'll move on to you do you think to have a more effective and more efficient policy for cyber security is it better to have clearly assigned responsibilities of the relevant stakeholders that are involved? Do you think that will make b better effective policies? Right, right, Apana. And in fact, uh, uh, let me first quickly introduce uh, myself to everyone. I am Vineet from Cyber Peace Foundation. We are a grassroots NGO and as well as a policy think tank working on all aspects of cyber. So cyber and peace, you can very well imagine why we are here is to make cyber space peaceful and we're doing everything to kind of make sure that if individuals uh, netizens to say large scale enterprises they be safe and resilient in the cyberspace having said that uh, uh, yes in fact uh, if you ask enough has been said already well being the last speaker i think i have to say less because all the points are already covered by the eminent panel uh, uh, in terms of regulations in terms of policy in terms of guidelines I think uh, we need to be uh, clear on certain aspects uh, and there are certain misses which I feel in India we need to kind of quickly act on that like for example uh, in India we came out with the cyber security policy in 2013. Now normally I mean we should have come out with a strategy. The strategy document is a mess at the moment we are in 2022 so that's something that we need desperately we need it uh, as of yesterday so that's something that is very much required and the policy that can be aligned to the strategy uh, the technology is changing fast and i uh, agree with my fellow panelists uh, subhi uh, manish uh, uh, that in fact it has to be dynamic in nature also in fact the entire po uh, policy that come in technology is changing 5g has come in now 5G that ensures more and more connectivity, connectivity at uh, the grassroots level. In fact, uh, uh, being a grassroots NGO, now we see more and more people are coming from uh, tier three cities, they are coming from villages, from the tribal areas. So the unconnected population is now getting connected. But that has given birth to a lot of a new set of challenges now. And I'm sure uh, all of you must have seen uh, the famous Netflix series Jamtara. Have you, have you seen that? So. Yeah, so Jamtara, I, and basically I come from that state. So I would say, so so it's it's just that, uh, in fact, the village has earned a bad name. Uh, now, in fact, the cases have reduced there. But uh, the pockets, I mean, po pockets like Jamtara are developing across the nation. So that ecosystem is developing, and it is developing very fast. And at the moment, uh, what is the need of the R is to kind of have these uh, kind of efforts, have agencies, like there are agencies already there. But the roles and responsibilities of the agencies properly defined, like we have I4C, I4C supporting uh, these conferences. Now MHA has the I4C wing, which deals with cyber security and also helping the victims on the ground. We have different channels of reporting, like the cybercrime.gov.in, 1930 and all of that. 
but I think this needs to be scaled much more. The way we see things on the ground is cases are increasing at a very fast pace. And when uh, Mr. Arvind was talking about abuse of tech and weaponization, I was just making notes. Like I see abuse of tech, weaponization happening at all levels. He mentioned about the instant loan scams. We are struggling with issues like sextortion. I'm sure you must have heard, or maybe some of your family members have also got a kind of a call from an unknown number. If they would have picked up, then somebody on the end, other end would have kind of, uh, a lady would have stripped and then taken a video and then later tried to blackmail. So all of those incidents are uh, just piling up. And just today, in fact, this is again a report, uh, 1,400 cases of sextortion just in 2022 and in Pune. This is just in Pune. This is the, and these are reported cases. Maximum cases in India are un, unreported. Cybercrime is underreported. People don't go and report it. So at this stage and time, it is something that we need uh, to come up with proper, uh, I, I would say, the laws. In fact, IT Act also, I feel now it needs a revision. Already there's some work that is happening. Uh, what I've been hearing from ministry also that we'll soon see the new version of the IT Act, the V2 of the IT Act, which I'm sure would address all of these issues and problems. So that's one. Uh, the Data Protection Act, again, we have been running a campaign called as My Data, My Privacy, where we have gone to different places. Where in a van, we have spoken to uh, people, we have spoken to Chai Wala, Pan Wala. Unse hum baat karke, humne pucha ki, what is pri privacy to you? Aap privacy se kya samajhte hai? So, they came out with their problems. Everybody has faced some kind of an issue in this space, some way or the other. I'm sorry, I'm just uh, bringing the negative side of uh, tech, but this is something that we all as different stakeholders need to work on. And I'm sure once we have the proper acts in place, once we have the national cyber security strategy, and also, uh, in fact, uh, the policy aligned to the strategy, the Data Protection Act and everything in place, we will be able to overcome these challenges. So this is most to do with the uh, national level. At international level, uh, my fellow speakers have already spoken, but yes, uh, the dialogue at the UN level has started with a UN cyber open-ended working group. Uh, India is uh, also being consulted. India is participating in the meetings. There are many track 1.5 happening. A lot of international cooperations happening, which is a very good thing because cyberspace is not limited by boundaries. So it's like we don't have borders here. So we have to be extremely responsive. Subhi, I highlighted it in the right way, but I'll just correct you, Subhi. In fact, in one way, MLAT, now it takes uh, 12 months. The, the time period has changed. So six months used to be earlier. Now it's taking even more. I've been, we have been kind of reaching out to the law enforcement agencies, speaking to them. They have been saying that we don't have data. Data we don't have timely. Mil nahi and imagine if you suffer a kind of a financial fraud, yeah, any kind of a fraud, and the data doesn't come to you on time. After 12 months, there's no point of data. Ka koi nahi jata hai. Victim is parishani parishan hai. victim. Ko to madati nahi so when you talk about uh, relief to the victim on the ground, Nothing is happening in that sense. We have to be extremely swift uh, in action because we are flooded with cases. Uh, we run the Cyber Peace Helpline and we are just flooded with cases. At times, uh, it becomes very difficult to manage and respond to the victims also because victims feel that when we, they go to the police station, first of all, they're not comfortable going to the police station and reporting agency. They'll see that society ko pata chal jayega ki mere ye hua hai. Same goes with the uh, uh, MSMEs and the startups. They'll say, if we go to them, if we go to the police, then, well, in fact, uh, the entire uh, investor community would get to know that such a breach has happened and everything. And now, in fact, as Manish highlighted, this becomes extremely important that if any breach happens, we have to report it uh, within the six hours. That's, that's extremely important. To, to complying to those things, to comply to those particular uh, kind of advisories, it becomes very difficult because uh, startups and SMEs, again, they don't have the right kind of resources. They don't kind of have the right kind of budget. So that is something that is uh, kind of uh, creating some problem on the ground. But then, yes, uh, if we have uh, the better uh, regulations, and I'm really looking forward for the new version of the bill to be introduced because I'm sure, because with a lot of consultations, all of us at different levels, we have been part of the consultation and we have given the feedback. I'm sure the bill that comes up will kind of factor in a lot of things and we'll be able to kind of collectively make the cyberspace safer for everyone. Thank you, Vineet. I'll move on to Anish. Uh, what is your view on security by design and do you think companies like Microsoft have a role to play in sort of, you know, uh, bringing in awareness about security by design. I'm 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I'll 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 quickly put in the everybody's put in a lot of words right about uh, various aspects on cyber security. Let me just put that together to bring in a context as to why security by design is the need of the hour. Now, if you see uh, the cyber attacks, the scale that they are happening today, it's not limited to IT alone. I mean, you've got a mobile device that is a potential window for a cyber criminal to get in. Uh, you've got an IoT device, they can get in through that. You've got the operational technology, you've got CCTVs, they can get in through that. So basically, I'll, I'll come to what Subi said initially, right? It's a position of assume breach. I mean, everybody's got a stance to protect themselves, but what is becoming more and more relevant in today's context is the detection part. That is becoming super, super critical. You know, so everybody's got to assume breach by one way or the other, a cyber criminal would get in. It's akin to saying that, you know, can you have enough immunity today not to catch a viral? The answer is no. So you, what you start doing is you start taking proactive measures, but you try to catch that early before it impacts your system much more. And that's exactly the stance that every organization and even an individual should be taking. Because look at the number of devices you work with today. All of them are actually giving out data for you. While there will be regulations, but it is very important that every individual takes this personal responsibility themselves. Now, having assumed a position of breach and that my organization has already got breached, what is it that you will do to protect yourself? How will you come to know that you've got breached? So there is a, a, a stock change in the way people are, or cyber criminals are attacking today. I mean, the transformation that we've seen in operating models of organizations, in our personal lives, in our engagements with organizations at on a personal level and professional level, everything's changed. And what has also happened, it, it has created a vast amount of opportunity, right? So much so that cyber crime has become a career option to a lot of people. It's being sold as a service. I mean, Jamtara series, right, got made on it, imagine, right? Now, with that said, and, and I I am actually, I was surprised when some of the students asked me that will it make sense if we get into learning how to hack? It's the fastest way, and there's a very thin line that goes between the two. So that is how the behavior is changing on the other side. They will get in one way or the other. The other thing is, if you go just five years back, how did you detect a, a, a threat? Something used to get locked. Something stopped working. Your access wasn't there anymore. You know, denial of service, etc., etc. And, you know, you will pay the ransom and the guy will relieve you. Things are completely changing now. I mean, that's a kid's play right now. Go to haveibeenporn.com and you'll see your credentials floating everywhere. I mean, that's a very popular kid's site to check whether your credentials are there or not. Now, the moment you start seeing this, so what does a cyber criminal, criminal want to do today? He wants to get into your system and he will do everything to camouflage themselves. Everything. So that you can't detect them. Now, the time to detection two years back was close to about 200 to 300 days from the time they got into your system and the by the time you detected, right? It's come down to 90 days, 200 days, depending on which part of the world you are operating in. So it becomes very important that do you have the right tools to detect? And if you have a lot of point solutions which do not talk to each other, you will never be able to get them together. So, data, analytics, AI is all being used by cyber criminals to attack your environment. 
do you have the requisite tools to fight back or you're just using manpower to fight back if you're doing manpower you've already lost because your ability to catch signals will not be there for your ability to bring all the data together gather insights and do that detection will never be there and that won't happen till you have security built into everything that you're using which is what i mean by security by design it is a built in and not bolt on security plus every component talking to each other so that when they come together you have sufficient tools to gather those insights to detect that i will give you an example look at i will give you example of nobody else but our organization we process close to 43 billion thread signals on a daily basis we secure about 780 to about 800000 organizations with our products and services so this is the number of thread signals we capture on a daily basis last year alone we blocked about 70 billion email threads about 26 billion uh, brute force attacks now how were they done it was only because we were able to catch the signals with different customers bring them together in one place and use those signals block that and use those signals to protect the other parts of the organization and that is only possible when you have security by design in everything that you do whether it is a process whether it is a product whether it is a device that is coming in you can't stop the way the technology is proliferating today i mean there are blurring lines between your personal space and your official space a lot of unauthorized unmanaged applications are being used today even for official work so cyber crime can happen on organizational front and your personal front so by design this is what something that everybody should be thinking in your organization if there is any new project being talked about is security built in, in on the first level itself are you leveraging the security that is built into the product that you're using is super super critical for everybody to leverage thank you anish i do have another set of questions another round of questions for everyone but i just request all speakers to maybe restrict answers to 3 minutes each so that we are you know in the in the view of the time constraint uh, i'll move on to vinit i'll come to vinit again actually uh, you already spoke about some issues uh, being faced by individuals uh, you know at a, in 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 smaller cities and towns what do you think about msmes and you know how do you think they can smaller smaller organizations institutions how can can they prepare themselves better for data protection and cyber security issues right so uh, in fact i made a brief mention about the kind of uh, cyber attacks that are being targeted to the msmes and also especially some of the institutions like like uh, healthcare also i see a, a huge amount of attack that have been mounted um, i mean mounted against them so uh, one is like what we generally do is we kind of uh, assess the msmes startups with basic cyber hygiene something that they can follow not everybody cannot deploy the high end i mean devices threat management solutions threat intelligence solutions and all that so at best they can follow some basic cyber hygiene like employee awareness in fact a lot of phishing attacks are mounted towards employees and uh, in fact towards the senior managements towards the boards and all that so at least they must be aware that these kind of attacks can happen and anybody can con- be compromised at any point of time so basic cyber hygiene there's already a booklet that was released uh, uh, just just last year by uh, general panth it's basically a booklet for msmes and startups which highlights the best practices that Uh, they should follow it also highlight some of the open source solutions if they cannot afford some proprietary tools at least they can have some open source solutions which can be deployed at their level and that way they can be safe like in terms of securing users or securing the data that they store by the way they store a lot of data and sometimes it is critical data also that they have been storing so keeping in mind the kind of data that they are storing so some best practices should be kind of implemented by them and like i mentioned uh, if they can't afford proprietary at least the open source solutions can be deployed by them to safeguard the entire thing thank you uh, i'll come back to anish uh, uh, we need also mention the importance of sensitizing employees 
in an organization so what do you think how do you how important do you think and is it something that all organizations should organization should be adopting to sensitize their employees about the security risks and what are the ways that in some ways that uh, organizations can do that thank you uh, so i sorry about that it's like akin to unmuting and muting yourself sorry i was talking on mute right so uh, i think that's a very important part because uh, uh, cyber resilience and cyber secu security is not an individual sport right it's it's a team sport and it's also a joint responsibility i mean an organization is as secure as the weakest link i mean anybody even uh, using a device on who's on your network could be just the receptionist for example with all due respects right uh, if they are not uh, sensitized enough of what they're doing they could uh, they could be the potential way uh, for cyber criminals to come in so it is very important that the, every organization over emphasizes over communicates right the importance of uh, cyber security not just that you also enable them give them live experiences and you don't have to have the whole paraphernalia with you there are a lot of organizations which can do that for you who can be used as a service they will come do assessment tell you where you are do a quick uh, simulation attack on your environment and tell you that how many people are still how many people still need to get enabled there are tools which are available i think that should be done the other thing is they should also evolve with what's happening around and be aware of what's happening you gave an example of passwords for example right now today passwords are become are the biggest reasons for uh, systems getting hacked if you if you delve down deeper more than 80% of the times ultimately it will result into a credential theft so the biggest responsibility right or biggest reason for uh, a cyber uh, uh, hack today is passwords so what how can we do away with them so if you have tools where you can move away from passwords it could be using a windows platform and a hello right there are basic rules what you have what you know and what you could do yourself right so if you could use those rules and do away with these weak links uh, you know apprise yourself with what's happening there all this can be taken care of so it's super super critical for every individual to pick up that responsibility of making the organization secure thank you uh, i'll come to subi now let's move on to some more interesting you know new technologies that are coming up we talk about there's so much that's going on about the metaverse and how so many companies are now venturing into this space so what do you think security is going to look like in these emerging technologies and who do you think are the primary stakeholders who will be ensuring security when it comes to technologies like the metaverse <laughs> Thank you so much, Aparna, and um, I think I'm greatly enriched by just participating on this panel and being a part of the session. I can't agree more with the comments that uh, my colleagues have made, Manish, Vineet, and Anish, Subrata. Um, fantastic points. And when you look at the culmination of expression, so what is the metaverse? There's a lot of hype around it. We're also talking about a decentralized internet or Web 3.0. Uh, conversation that's been in the works for a very very long time when uh, from the i star organizations i can ietf igf a lot of organizations which are very heavily structured and they loosely coordinate the internet right so who controls the internet who runs the internet and what happens how does this problem get conflated even more when you're looking at over seven layers of the internet so what you see and experience is the content layer um, and when i look at this uh, in the domain of how India is now connecting so many users and their first experiences of the internet is via applications. It's via applications which are on their mobile phones, uh, they're already preloaded or their applications they're downloading from the internet. Um, it's, it's interesting at multiple points because when you talk about shared responsibility and collective responsibility, the very definition from the VISIS process um, when it started in Tunis many, many years ago is the rightful roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders involved in the internet. And I emphasize on the word rightful 
in the world of uh, multi stakeholder internet governance models you do not privilege any single stakeholder so unlike multilateral arrangements where vinit now you know shared a new piece of data that it's taking as long as 12 months to share and exchange information and that too depends upon the goodwill of the nation states uh, people have found people to people connects but more importantly very very critical is the understanding that what is it that the private sector can do what is it that industries need to do what is it that chambers like fiki can do what is it that young people who now have a seat at the table in some of the most critical internet governance conversations and then we impact how our government looks at internet governance and security uh, so it's never a compliance journey only manish talked about the nist standards uh, what is amazing about those standards is also incentivization for msmes for small businesses remember it's a cost and we're uh, you know the startup that uh, really did start the fire back in 2008 first company that softbank invested in when you look at in mobi and glance um it's very easy to say hey we we don't need to acknowledge this we're solving for something great but that's not what we decided we said let we will look at privacy first solutions we will look at privacy by design we will look at acknowledging what may be a vulnerability but ensuring that you embrace it and address it so one of the biggest challenges whether it's the metaverse or it's web 2.0 is destigmatizing breaches and threats and events so in your house if there's a physical theft you will immediately call the entire neighborhood chori ho gayi chor chor bhi chillaoge but when it comes to vulnerabilities which are tech driven this entire approach now Now you're obliged by law to report it, but it's still very much that let's hide it, let's brush it under the carpet. There will be no collective learning. Remember, Indian problems are very, very Indian. They need to be solved in an India way. The learnings that we've had, even on vaccination successes, they've been there because we were able to share data. So the approach that we advocate for, even it when it comes to metaverse and cybersecurity solutions, is responsible innovation. We believe that data is not an end in itself it's a means to an end you look at data intelligent nations especially you know burdens of let's say climate change there are very different metrics for developing countries and emerging economies vis-a-vis -vis developed nations so india needs to be able to work with its data indian enterprises need to be able to access that and to be able to make meaningful solutions that make your life better so we came up with spaces how do you live work and play now what is it that we need to do very quickly in under a minute we need to look at even emerging tech solutions emerging security solutions as emerging tech solutions so they'll be smarter but they will always have space for play so uh, look at blockchain the entire premises is trust and integrity so when we look at cyber security for emerging tech we look at greater cooperation we look at ledger based solutions uh, look at solutions like ai and ml when they start speaking to each other as uh, anish mentioned not just manual but start teaching your systems to learn better start making sure or that you invite scrutiny so i believe sunlight is the best disinfectant the more transparent and more accountable corporates become and the more conversational and dialogue based approaches governments will take the better partnerships we'll be able to forge right so again less stick more carrot incentivize encourage not even best practices but take home good practices mit labs been working with supercomputers and they're churning massive amounts of data to again look at localized solutions that speak to local actors and how do you build more progressive chains then there is conversation of distributed cloud technology manish i've been a huge fan i know you made that pitch um it makes sure that business continuity does not get hampered it it makes sure that there are multiple keys located at multiple places and there's no single honey pot that's created so as tech evolves the um and i think it's our moral right to make sure that startups in india have that ecosystem which is stable which is predictable which is conducive but has that space for disruption so don't make security compliance onerous but make it as a journey and a conversation where industry academia civil society uh, youth uh, even when questions around hacking when i go to the my alma mater which is the iit delhi they talk about ethical hacking so when you can do use technology for good and when you can have engagement which is much wider 
while not leaving the seniors out or while not leaving the juniors out. Building them into uh, every single building block across all pillars, that's the kind of metaverse that we are trying to envisage, where you live out your identities, you have time for play, you have time for creative expression, but you're also cognizant that you are uh, contributing to a much larger goal and a much larger agenda. So as progressive and as inclusive, as our Prime Minister uh, talks about inclusive growth for all, sabka saath, sabka vikas, sabka prayas. And that prayas and now a uh, lot of emphasis on research and development. So those budgets need to go up and that's a pitch more respect for research and collaboration and also more such conversations. Sarika, this one's for you for bringing us all together. I'll stop here. Thank you, Apan. Thank you. I think that's a great thought. So, Prada, I'll move on to you. Uh, uh, more as a concluding remark now, we've all spoken about this, striking this balance between innovation and uh, security. How do you think with these new regulations that are coming in, how should how can regulators ensure this balance between the two? You already spoke about the telecom bill, but any further comments that you have on this? I think uh, the panelists have uh, mentioned this needs to be a continuous ongoing process. Uh, organizations like FIKI uh, does excellent job in that. So it's important that communication channels between the re policy makers, the regulators and the industry continue to remain. Uh, let's also be clear on the fact that innovation will always keep it will it will move ahead than regulation uh, but having said that i think the job of the sovereign or the regulator is to protect the consumer so while i understand as an industry we would want innovation to keep ahead of it but let's be clear sovereigns worldwide would try to protect their citizens and that so sometime you will have to take this call or governments will have to make the call to ensure that security over innovation is important uh, give precedence to securing the data than uh, keeping something a laissez-faire yeah. approach. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so last question for, of the day for uh, Manish. Manish, there are several sectors which are already heavily regulated in terms of cyber security, be it the financial sector or even telecom. But certain sectors where we need mention, say the healthcare, where there's a lot of data that's being handled, but maybe they're not so... Uh, 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 the, the 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 way they handle cyber security is maybe not as uh, at par with certain other sectors. So, what are your views on this, and what do you think are some learnings that these sectors can get from the from say telecom or financial sectors? Yeah. So that's again a very interesting question. Thank you for that, Apna. I'll try to keep it short. I'll not 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 uh, do that long uh, conversation now. Uh, keep it very short. But the couple of learnings that we have, uh, especially from telecom, and uh, uh, Subrata mentioned about he's a, he's a veteran in telecom. He mentioned about uh, the best practices, what he has seen, and the challenges that he has also seen with 5G adoption that he mentioned, and a uh, couple of uh, uh, standards that he talked about. Now, one thing I uh, in telecom, uh, why have they been more innovative in security or more invested in security. I mean, they are the gold standard. That's what people, I mean, industry says, right? There are two reasons. One is highly regulated. I mean, regulation is a reason why you invest more. That's one of the prime reason. Second uh, important reason is that they have faced the music. They have seen those threats. They have seen those attacks much before it was seen by other sectors. I mean, 2012, I re recollect I was working for a couple of uh, telecom operators trying to protect their infrastructure. I talk about Airtel, I'll, I can name them because it's all, all there in the news as well. So Airtel, Geo, uh, Telecom, everyone. I mean, everyone wa was facing those series of cyber threat. They faced that and, and, and they prepared themselves, right? So the learnings that uh, uh, a telecom operator had was that investment is important in two streams. One is technology, which is very important, which is about the controls that you put in your infrastructure, the framework that you put in. But then second investment, which is equally important, is people. I mean, security, people, if you have to secure in your infrastructure, to protect your infrastructure, you need smart people. because. The people who are, who are uh, there on the other side, these are hackers. They are persistent hackers. They would try to penetrate the network, and for that, they'll put all the efforts, a sustained effort. So, you, so uh, 
that balance of investment bit building up a robust sock it's called as security operation center that's a practice that went in for every telecom and that practice also um, um, went in in building up those sock practices in uh, banking and finance also so that's people that's smart people people with tools so empowering those uh, uh, those sock engineers and building up the robust infrastructure which telecom learned that's what uh, uh, has to be done in other sectors also it cannot be that you have all invested into all the technology you put your um, investment into building up a very strong security infrastructure but you don't focus on building up a strong workforce the hunters the um, um, investigators who can look into uh, a security threat threat and try to um, understand what's happening to get more visibility so yeah thank you thank you manish uh, should we move on to q and a then or is do we have professor ंगे See, uh, one thing, in fact, uh, that uh, we believe uh, uh, as a foundation, and in fact, I also personally believe, is cyber security is not just the responsibility of the government, and uh, the other panelists also have mentioned it. So it's a collective responsibility, and citizens, as netizens, we have a major role to play. One is uh, like we have also been kind of pushing uh, that uh, cyber security should be integrated as a part of the curriculum. in the schools so whether grade 2 onwards if the child getting exposed to tech education and all that so that is the time that the child needs to know about what cyber morals is so that's that's the way we need to intervene and then going forward age appropriate curriculum should be kind of developed and enough of awareness should be created already lots of awareness campaigns and all is happening i4c is doing it the ministry of it is doing it there are different kind of agency doing it non profits are doing it Uh, but we need to do some sustainable campaigns we need to do those dialogues that can by in fact general people can connect to people like i said aam janta ko connect karna hai usse to us tarah ke dialogues karna important hai then setting up these volunteer networks one more thing that we have been trying to do is develop those community ambassadors at different places so we have something called as the cyber peace core under that anyone if, if you are a student or you are professional uh, whether you are uh, uh, maybe from any any walk of life uh, any segment you belong to you can contribute you just need to spare one hour in a day one day in a week or one month in a year to create that community impact so we try to kind of create a pool of say 50 60 people in a state and these are like our master trainers jo ki aage gaon gaon tak jate hain रिमोट लोकेशंस में जाते हैं एंड डिलीवरी करते हैं जो भी अवेयरनेस मैसेज है इन देयर ओन लोकल रीजनल लैंग्वेज सो दैट इज द इम्पैक्ट अगर हम यहाँ पे सिंपली फी क्रिएट अ सेट ऑफ डू डूज एंड डोंट्स एंड अवेयरनेस मैसेजेस तो नॉट एवरीबडी कैन अंडरस्टैंड बट इफ यू स्पीक टू पीपल इन देयर ओन लैंग्वेज लाइक आप चर्चा करें गाँव में जा कर के बैठ करके और चर्चा में बताएं किस तरह का फ्रॉड होता है या फिर नुक्कड़ नाटक के माध्यम से then people will understand it much better and they'll retain that knowledge so that has to be like a, a, a mixture of all when i say and everybody has a responsibility industry is playing their responsibility government is doing it uh, in civil society is doing it. academia uh, uh, dr rajat munai is here i'm sure uh, he'll also add and as netizens we all should kind of be a responsible netizen we need to know responsible online behavior ki cyber space mein responsible online behavior kya hona chahiye hame bhi malum hona chahiye we have to be responsible in this space so that is what i'd like to kind of add uh, to your question and uh, this you. this lo- lot more that can be done thank, thank you. you i'll just briefly add it's something that uh, is very very close to my heart and as both industry and academia we've worked with different communities 
but the challenge is that you first need to understand basics. Um, in India, when you get into a taxi over a conversation of an hour, you would have told the taxi driver where you live, how many children you have, the construct of the negotiation that happens between convenience and privacy. Saying, I have this data, le lo, but if I get this service, mil rahi hai, to kya main choose karunga. We are a price sensitive market. And then the sanctity of your data. So, uh, Vineet has been doing remarkable work. He's not just securing the cyberspace, but is also making for an internet that is safe and productive. So that conversation from starting from cyber bullying to digital identity to digital rights to cyber hygiene to what is a responsible Indian citizen when we talk about the internet we see it like a road agar kachra daloge to wapas kachra hi milega right pair mein wo hi lagega so the conversation even about privacy to a to imagine and think that the lowest common denominator in the village does not understand or does not care is a very naive approach. But to speak in a language which is conversant and also uh, there are lots of learnings and successes of two or actually three amazing programs by Government of India. One, Sarvasiksha Abhyan, second, Pulse Polio Immunization Campaign, third is uh, COVID Appropriate Behaviour. We were not a country which was wearing masks. Social distancing, masking, hand washing, these were three golden rules that saved a lot of people in the country. So similarly, just relatable messages, COVID appropriate change behavior, engaging with society and consistent uh, contributions from all sections of society. This is our job, your job, and everybody needs to turn it and embrace it like a bottom-up movement. So that's very, very important if you want to see India succeed because we are equally strong and equally vulnerable as each one of you. Our parents in the homes, who are we leaving out, who's currently not in the room, whose voices are not heard. So taking everyone along and actors like, you know, Vineet's foundation, schools, um, systematic inculcation of this behavior, everything is going to play a huge role. Yeah, sure, please. Um, So, do you have any specific panelists you want to? I would to take that, uh, Panna. Sure. So, uh, that's a problem that uh, industry across is facing. Sorry, I did not get your name. Well, I'm Parkan Ratin Dash. I'm a professional consultant, a heavy consulting firm by the name PGI Associates, which is in the space of market entry, industry research, technology commercialization, and government affairs. Good. Thank you. So, uh, but that's a very interesting question because that's a problem which um, 
a lot of people are facing, right? It's across sectors that uh, uh, this problem is faced of data localization and regulations for data reg regularization. Now, the software piece that you talked about, right, it's called a SaaS, security as a service. And security as a, uh, sorry, uh, software as a service. And now it's uh, XAAS, anything as a service, right? And uh, uh, how do you ensure the challenges, how do you enable that? When you have so many regulations specifically around data reg data localization, then how do you enable that? That data regulation is in place. I mean, for specific industries, specific sectors, the data regulation norms are in place. Uh, take an example of my organization, which builds up security solutions on the cloud. It's a SaaS-based model. And it, the, it's a cent centralized SaaS-based model. We have our global data centers. And then uh, uh, through those global data centers, we are serving our customers across the globe. But then when you have to, to offer that service in the country to a bank of banking and financial customer or to a healthcare customer, then you need to have localization of data that data within the country. That's a, that's a regulation. Fortunately, unfortunately, that's a norm that has to be done. And the way it's happening now is that anywhere that you are hosting your data, right, hosting your software, software has to be there somewhere in the cloud. Cloud doesn't mean it's a cloud. It's it, it, it's a infrastructure somewhere. And that infrastructure has been enforced to be within the, within the country. I mean, uh, we have uh, uh, Anish uh, sitting here from Microsoft. Azure data center, which is Microsoft data centers, they are present in the country. Or Amazon data centers, they are present in the country. So data localization has happened, but software organizations have to ensure that when they are deploying a solution and offering it in this country on for specific sectors, then they have to be hosted in those data centers, those specific data centers, which have a footprint in the country, which are present in the country. Having said that, this is more from an advocate of uh, uh, regulator's side, but I'm also on the other side uh, because we also face the challenge, right? Uh, uh, the way the, go the forward going strategy would be that what kind of data is very important. That's why I mentioned during my talk earlier that it's very important to identify what kind of data that has to be localized. Not all the data is required to be localized, right? Not, not everything has to be localized. When you are taking a data from a patient, that data is very critical. That has to be localized within the country. You can't afford it to go out. But uh, when there are other forms of data which are not important, that can definitely traverse out. So, so uh, uh, regulators have to review, should review, that uh, whatever uh, regulations are being formed or guidelines have been formed, there is a periodic review of uh, those guidelines, and that has to be in accordance with how technology innovations are happening, so that they don't become, uh, over a period of time, they don't become a roadblock, but rather enabler for business. Like uh, of a healthcare information of your patients, it is such a critical and most, imp I would say it's one of the most important PI data that's, uh, that's there. And an organization which is, which is, whose business is to process that data would be more confident if the regulations are met, right? If you have the data localization, a specific data localization happening, they'll be more confident. So I, I would say it's a, it's a trade-off, it's a balance that needs to be made, but definitely public-private partnership, it requires that both, from both the sides there should be a greater collaboration. I'll just add, uh, I'll just take 30 seconds. To add on that, uh, so uh, since Manish mentioned, we also were facing this problem, but you know, there is a silver lining to this uh, requirement of data localization. You will look at partnerships of bringing uh, the solutions to the country, and as a whole, then you actually increase the tech intensity of the uh, India as such, the India ecosystem as such. So partnerships is the way to go. Right for you to get that done. For example, our partnership with Geo and LNT actually came into news, and that's how we brought a lot of services which were not localized within the country, right, with such partnerships. Thank you.
just a very brief intervention i hear you and i can't empathize more with your challenge the entire premise of cloud and the fact that it's a global business and there'll be reciprocity for india as well um i was very pleased to hear at least the public comments made by the honorable minister and especially the fact that this current draft was withdrawn because there were similar questions of what happens to indian companies then and how do you work in an infrastructure which is inherently open and diverse um a lot of these debates started post the snowden revelations where the questions were around us spying on friendly countries and questions of mass surveillance we did learn that there is no blanket one size fits all solution we did learn using your own system, using your 
phone device rather than keying in your name, number, and all that. Now, we developed this model. Few of my students worked on it, and we actually looked at many things. Like, for example, key loggers. Somebody puts a uh, big key logger, a big key pad on the ATM key pad, and when you dial in your pin, it records your pin, but at the same time, it actually punches the uh, because very thin pin, so when you press it, it also punches the key on the real ATM. So therefore, the same password is actually now recorded, it's like man is a middle attack. Or, there is a camera, which is supposed to be a secure camera to figure out whether you are doing transaction or not. But this camera is a, uh, is a panning camera and it can actually see what keys you are punching. And therefore, it can record your pin. Now, having said that, the next step would be a fake ATM. And the fake ATM is the one which is going to read your card as you swipe it in using magnetic stripe. And it will actually ask you to key in the password. You will key in the password. And then this ATM, the fake ATM, when you say withdraw 1000 rupees, it may actually come out and say, sorry, the ATM is out of money. This is the nearest ATM, please go to that. Okay. So now you have lost your ID, you have lost your password there without even linking to your eye, you think that yeah, this ATM is giving me right information, I go to the next place and before the money. Or worse, it will actually give you 1000 rupees. Okay, so you don't even suspect that there was any problem. You say, give, get me 1000 rupees, it gives you 1000 rupees. And you actually happily come out and say, yes, I got the money. Only six months later, you realize somebody took out one lakh rupee out of your bank account because of this transaction which you can't even relate to six months later. Using the same uh, ATM card magnetic data and the uh, password or pin that you type, this guy can actually just withdraw this thousand rupees or one lakh rupees or two lakh rupees or whatever. You will not be able to track it or what happened. These kind of attacks are absolutely possible. But the reason why these attacks don't happen is because it is going to be a law and order situation. It's a physical infrastructure and therefore police has to be vigilant about it. Can the same thing happen for your email? Can the same thing happen for your logical identities, virtual identities? And can the same thing happen for your um, you know, uh, facilities that you are actually supposed to be getting in virtual space? Yes, it can. But in that case, who is the one who will actually safeguard you? Because the people are actually not used to handling things in a virtual domain. They are probably used to handling things in the physical domain. So, it comes to the next aspect, and that is how much ignorant we are about security. And as a uh, as a general principle, it is seen that even the so-called experts of security are not secure, are not secure themselves, and probably don't know too much about the security protocols and such kind of things. I have seen this examples many times where people come and say, "Okay, we will encrypt everything, and therefore data will be secure." No, it doesn't. It doesn't give me security enough. Encrypted data lost, there are people who can recover data out of it because there are various circumstantial evidences through which data can be recovered. Many times you would come and say, okay, we will give you this solution and where well, HTTPS is a solution, secure socket layer, HTTP, and therefore your data cannot be lost. Secure and SSL VPN exists and therefore your data cannot be lost. And during pandemic, a lot of solutions actually came out for work from home. And they were actually sold to many people, many organizations and many places because the businesses were getting affected. Not all of them were secure. In fact, the majority of them were not secure. The secure meaning they were secure in certain circumstances, but security could be breached in certain other circumstances. And unsuspecting managers and unsuspecting people and policy makers would probably go and take 
extension. B, in the false notion of security, and at the end of it, sometime, somewhere, security data loss would happen, and they won't have any clue why it has happened. So ignorance about security is, in my opinion, a biggest problem. The previous uh, session, it was actually said that awareness should be brought in about security, a very good move. Probably awareness, for example, we saw in case of COVID pandemic saying, uh, you know, wear masks, maintain physical distance, and such kind of things. Very simple awareness protocols, but they brought in a lot of, lot of very interesting safeguards against COVID spread. The similar kind of a thing could be done for even data security. However, data security is a very complex phenomenon, and it cannot be something like a don't share password, or it cannot be something like uh, don't keep your password on the mobile. Because the systems today actually make it easy to keep your passwords online, keep your password, so mobile, keep your passwords recorded somewhere, and such kind of thing. So therefore, it is not as easy as they we create an awareness for public. Our parents, grandparents, and such kind of people who are more vulnerable, or the kids who are more vulnerable for data loss, suddenly amount of security that you can do, amount of safety that you can do by education is not adequate for them to not go to their identity. Um, it has been said several times, you know, several times people talk about is Aadhaar secure. Indian stack is actually a very, very powerful stack of data handling. Aadhaar as an authentication mechanism which is separated from data uh, keeping authorities and which is further separated from uh, authorities who provide you services. And therefore, it is a very, very fairly um, robust mechanism in the country. But then, even then, we keep hearing, and I think that's the second part that I want to mention, is what is known as, um, you know, panic mongering. So, you see, suddenly, Data leaked from Aadhaar, 1 million reports leaked from Aadhaar and that is the news that will come out as a headline. Only when you read it inside, you figure out that what they are talking about is something else than what is written on the headline. And most media actually likes to sensitize the information or the news and therefore it actually creates a panic. And when it creates a panic, um, you know, there is a, another, another danger that comes in. Because when I actually get panicky and I know I should not be sharing my data, I go and talk to my friend and he says, no, 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 nothing happens. I have done this and nothing happens you can share. So therefore, I am thoroughly confused. I don't know which one to actually blame or which one to actually trust. Okay? And then it is like a story, Bhariya Aya, Bhariya Aya, the Bhariya doesn't come and one fine day when Bhariya actually comes, Nobody is prepared for that kind of a system and there is a massive loss that will happen. So therefore, there is a panic mongering and this panic mongering will actually result into a real loss of data at some point in time without people knowing and that will be even bigger thing. The challenge that cyber security actually poses is the loss of information and use of this information to have the loss of resources, or loss of money, or loss of identity, and all that. There is an unpredictable time difference, time gap. It, I may actually lose data today, but I might actually get the impact of data loss after one year. And in which case, I really don't know when and why and how I lost this data. One year later, when I look at it, I won't remember what happened and where did I lose this data or where did I use this ATM or where did I supply this OTP and all that. Uh, so therefore, it will be very, very difficult to track as well. Uh, on, in addition, there are these new technologies which are coming in. Blockchain, you know, for example, is a very, very odd uh, reality, augmented reality, virtual reality and such kind of technologies which are coming in, NFT which are coming in. These are the kind of things which actually further pose danger to our own data. Uh, many times, blockchain is a very interesting example where a lot of blockchain experts have actually come out with solutions. In fact,
fact, I remember when I was reaching this solution, in one of these exhibitions, there was a group of people who were actually talking about a blockchain-based digital degree story. Okay. So I asked them, what is the use of blockchain here? Please explain. Because to my limited knowledge, blockchain is the one that actually protects the transactions, which means there is a thing that is being given from A to B and B to C and all that. Authenticity of that transaction could be established using blockchain. Trust can be made using blockchain on the transaction, and that's how the digital currency and all that actually came about. Now, what is this digital degree? which is actually only one-time transaction, the university giving it to a student, where is the blockchain coming in? And I was very curious to figure it out and what is the solution that they have actually come up with. Unfortunately, they could not convince me that their solution is the right solution for the problem that they are solving. And at the end, even after long discussions, they could not convince me and I could not convince them. And the conclusion was, Sir, you are the old generation, 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 you are the old idea. Now this was an interesting conclusion because this actually presented into what is known as generation gap, gap, age gap. And that's something which actually I thought I must mention because when people don't know the solution, they hide behind such kind of slogans or such kind of aspects of um, you know, uh, establishing certain kind of thing, and then they actually end up doing even worse because then they really don't know what is the problem that they're solving. I mean, it's like if you have to kill an elephant, you want a cannon, but if you want to kill a bird, cannon is not the right solution for that. Maybe once in a while you will be able to kill a bird, but you can't always guarantee that you will kill a bird. So. There are various kinds of solutions and unfortunately often people find it difficult to actually have a solution architected for appropriate purpose. Yet another thing that actually talks about is, you know, if I look at the communication networks, the devices in between, mobile or whatever, or any switch, anything, it's basically a loop for carrying my data from me to my end use, which could be bank, which could be any other server where I am getting access from for my uh, information or for my services. It is often said that end-to-end -end security should be implemented, and often people don't understand this notion of end-to-end -end security, which means anybody coming in between is just a conduit and not really a source or sink of information, therefore information should not be shared. Information should be only between the originator of information and actual place where the information is destined to go so that one can actually do proper thing. Now, end-to-end -end security, in the name of end-to-end -end security, to be more precise, it will actually do quite a lot of very interesting things which actually break this end-to-end -end security and therefore they cause many the middle attacks and such kind of things. People actually also talked about data localization and in data protection bill, which was actually uh, is with the parliament committee and all that, uh, we actually talked about that data localization and all that is important, but it's not really data localization. From the, from the perspective of information superhighways, the time that it takes from one end to other end, even if it is just next door to you, maybe much more than the time that it can actually take thousand kilometers away. And therefore, localization is with reference to the time, the latency between two endpoints. And that is important because we are actually looking at convenience, and I don't want to look at the delay. I want to look at the convenience of my data reaching somewhere. And therefore, data localization is something else. When we actually talk in terms of um, in terms of security and safety of data, data localization basically means that it should be in a place where the law of the land is active. Now, which basically means the data for Indian citizen or data for Indian origin should not go out of the shore from India. But then again, there is a problem here. 
because it may actually go off the shore and come back to India. And that's the very minor thing. So as long as data is going from one place to other place and not getting misused, data localization is less of an issue. But then in order to do that, the law must be applicable. And fortunately, law cannot be applicable on data. Law is made for people, law is based for physical assets, law is made for building law. Behind every law, there is a notion of a person who will break the law, and therefore there is a person who is involved. Law is applicable on people. And unless we actually identify a people or an organization on which law can be enforced, the data localization is of no value. Right? Because you can't force law on the data. You can't say this 10101 will be protected by, by the law. I mean, and that is a problem. So therefore, data localization, when we're actually looking at this particular aspect, yes, it is important to have data localization, but not really data localization as such, but the controllability of data and usability of data should be localized. The person who is actually collecting data from you and processing data for you should be under the ambit of the law. And that is what is important. Okay? Because once the data is lost, it is lost. You can't do anything about it. However, you can only get this person and say, why are you not implementing and this is a crime, criminal. Okay? Of your data loss, depending on the data that you have lost, depending on the value that you have lost, depending on the money that you have lost, and so on and so forth. So therefore, it is important to understand the meaning of data localization by putting data in my laptop doesn't mean that it is safeguarded because my data, even though it is in my laptop, and when I connect to a network and a malware that comes into my system can take this data away. Now, data being with me, Whose responsibility will it be if the data is lost? So it is completely localized. Yet there is a data loss that can happen. Okay. So there is a thing that one has to think about it, and I think in the DPA uh, Data Protection Act, it was very clearly worded on how we actually safeguard the data. And the second thing, what are the data that we should be looking at, where the privacy can be lost? And these are the kind of things that we work upon and very important thing. So, without going any further, the DPA actually provided a space for innovation, a space for data sharing, and yet holding people accountable for data that they collect from uh, vulnerable users. And that was very important, which also included that responsibility of awareness essentially gets passed to the data collector. And that is actually a very, very important aspect. So um, I would actually once again like to thank Vicky for inviting me here. And uh, I would be willing to take any questions if there are. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Professor Muna. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Muna, for joining the session uh, it, uh, and sharing your insightful delights with, uh, delights with us. Uh, now we'll be moving to the other uh, speaker, Dr. Amit Andre, uh, requesting Dr. Andre to take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, all. It's been a pleasure uh, to speak here at the forum. I think I really would like to thank Sparika Ji and the entire team uh, with Piki uh, working in arranging fantastic sessions uh, for all of us. Since morning, we have been interacting with multiple aspects of cyber security, multiple aspects of adoption of cyber security in the industry, in the education segment, in the government. But it's very important for all of us to understand what kind of technology are aligned to implement service. And today, one of the case studies which I would like to focus on and elaborate on is artificial intelligence. Global impact of artificial intelligence in cyber security cannot be left behind. The reason being it's all about emotions, it's all about data, 
It's all about what could be the perspectives which can be generated out of the information. So having your data converted to an information and then converted to a meaningful insight, putting an action and securing it makes it very important. <laughs> Yes. 
customer experience, employee experience, digital experience. It's very important for all of us to understand and address these factors. And while we address these factors, the security of all of these transactions play a fundamental and most important role. So why we speak? The, why we speak in understanding the threats, understanding the behavior, understanding the utilities of different different applications. It's very important for all of us to understand not only these aspects, but what can be threat, what cannot be threat, or what should be protected is very important. And that's why compliance is a neglect from the picture where government organizations and organizing policies are automated with the automated process of authority is uh, around 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 the process of the from the cyber security segment, yes, all of these are termed as sophisticated threats. And we have to diversify this evolving sector in different segments of understanding what is the threat and what is not threat. And how do we structurally point out or protect ourselves with the help of machines, with the help of artificial intelligence program that automate the structure of securing each of the terms. Why do you think this needs to be automated? Why do you think we need machine here? One and the most important factor which will align us with the with the thought process of having machines here is the volume. Can you get it? How many digital transactions happens in a second? When I say transactions it is, it, is, it is just a complicated thing, a live or, or, or a mail or a email, a mail or a comment or a blog or a browsing of the sites. There are more than 26,000 million transactions happening per second around the world. And that's what machines help us in defining the correct factors of security. One of the important understanding here, which is being communicated in this digital world, we're talking about digital era, digital India, digital multiple uh, organizations. We also need to understand how the virus is spreading. And one of the most fundamental virus here, which is so as malware, which needs to be considered for all the applications. Every minute there are 2021 instances of people getting affected with malware. Every 15 minutes, 9,864 instances. And we're talking today with 45,400 instances which are going across any of the digital era for all the applications. And all of these malware needs to be addressed and protected to a case where we need to understand how attacker will get extremely efficient, how governments will be extremely efficient to have at pronounce a zero day malware. There are multiple companies who are working and AI can tap things as malware that don't look like prior malware samples. And the machines will be able to understand the legacy, the signature-based technology, the efficiency of blockchain security, the endpoint security, and multiple other data center segments to categorize them as malware. While we speak about malware, I would like to talk about the case uh, which is practically implemented by our team at one of the renowned organizations in India, Siemens, which handles 60,000 cyber threats per second with the help of artificial intelligence. 60,000 cyber threats and attacks per second globally controlled in India by a technology organization called Siemens. With the help of one of the largest uh, 
cloud service provider which helps in automated adversities around cloud data and people for accessing it, which is Amazon Web Services. One of the fantastic cloud service provider which has of course, uh, all other products of this world have also had a few of these. But awareness of this using the page maker, blue, or everyone can be there, which will help the machine learning activity to understand the changing behavior of cyber security dynamically. And all of us adapt to this security or are human to protect. Uh, it is much, it, is, it will take much uh, lengthy time than an impact is to have to make. And that's why machine learning and secure platforms will make an important factor of taking corrective action much faster and in time when artificial intelligence comes in. Yes, there are multiple operating platforms on this cloud and we need to understand cloud data and the infrastructure with the perspective of security, from the perspective of protection application, from the perspective of uh, different delivery which happens to the community. So the entire infrastructure has to be secure and defined with the maximum task which would be created with different machine learning algorithms and services around which artificial intelligence will play a major role in creating the current structure and automating and taking actions on time for every trap which is laid down in different platforms in this digital world ahead. With this, we will have to work with machine learning around endpoints, around cloud, around network, which will save not only time and effort, but also the really fastest way to secure any infrastructure, any domain, and any structure to define the best and secure infrastructure which is governed and used digitally. Irrespective of domain, whether it's technology, whether it's sales, whether it's service security, whether it's application development, whether it's data, and whatnot. That will create an impactful aspect of understanding the importance of artificial intelligence and then deriving it to the places like Spain, like Bank of America, like Ministry of India. We have been recently working with the Ministry of Artificial Intelligence in United Arab Emirates, where in last week at Jaipur they have launched flying cars, flying vaccines, and the entire communication is secure with the effective NFT and blockchain parameters, which is practically live these days. And people have started using, consumers like us, the corporate man like us, is starting, is starting to use the experience in here. And this covers the complete segment of not only digital adoption, but digital understanding, digital security, and digital implementation of use cases in different, different consumer behaviors. <laughs> this was a clear and a short insight on how well artificial intelligence will make mark in, 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 in the cyber security industry. Thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andre, for your for the insightful session. Uh, do you have any questions uh, from the audience for him? Uh, yes, please, uh, sir. Uh, your mic. Uh, uh, do you have? A uh. Thank you, Dr. Andre, for your elaborative deliberation over here. I have a very specific question, which is, uh, you know, very practical in the industry as such. Uh, cyber security, cyber physical systems are the basis for any, you know, technology that we talk about in data space. So use of AI in IIoT that I'm talking about, or let's say IoT as such. Now, while we're designing, while we're designing, you know, a network architecture, okay, for an IoT as such, maybe it can be in a factory, 
I mean, uh, it can be in any other space. I'm talking about design aspect. The more physical systems that we include, more data will come in and more vulnerable will be for cyber security risks as such. Now, had the data that will be you know, collecting today, data is dated. Had the data that will be collecting today is meant for today, this question would have been easy. But just because the data that we're collecting today through these cyber physical systems will be historical data 20, 30 years down the line, that will be relevant over there also, what is the trade-off point? What is the inflection point that we think about while designing? Because in one space, we have data coming in, more interfaces that we create. Another space, we have threat of security. So what is the trade-off point we should be considering in the design process? I want to know your views on that. Thank you. So it's very important that any design, which any project that starts the designing aspect, and that design comes to reality and takes some time. And that particular design to work or to practically implemented and be used will be probably efficiently used for let's say five to ten years. So it's very important when we plan to design an architecture with think ahead of probably 10 or 10 years or more than 10 years. Now while we do that, we need to understand different factors of when it comes to cyber physical systems or digital implementation of this segment. When we talk about security and designing, we need to consider security of the entire infrastructure first. Second, we need to also talk about security of
Thanks, Amit. I think uh, no more questions and thank you for joining us today. I know uh, we were planning something, but finally we could have you virtually from Dubai. So thank you for taking our time. And uh, like we mentioned, um, the subject which you have uh, taken for a 15 minutes presentation today would of course require more deep diving with many things which can be done. So we would definitely have a specific special session on when we talk about, uh, talk about the impact of the AI or the emerging technologies with respect to the cyber security. We did have the discussions on emerging tech and securing their digital environment in the first session. But here we would be, I would be more interested with, to understand the different countries' perspective when we talk about how the AI and the other things have been taken forward with respect to the cyber security. So thank you, Dr. Andre, for joining us. With this, uh, with this we move on to our last session and our last presenter, which is, of course, having a case study presentation. Uh, we request Mr. Amit Dubey, co-founder India Future Foundation, uh, to make his presentation. And the topic is cyber attacks and investigation strategies. Thank you, Amit. I think a uh, nice way to end it when you talk about the attacks and the investigation when which we started with something in the morning. So over to you, Amit. We, uh, we look forward to know more about on the subject from you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Sorry, my team is saying because uh, after this we have a tea coffee thing being presented outside. So if you can wrap up in 10 to 12 minutes, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. We can move to the next slide. This is just about me. Next slide. So uh, I have given 10 minutes. I'll try to wrap up in seven minutes so that I can keep three minutes for QA. And I'll just tell stories. I run a radio show, Hidden Files. Kitne logon ne suna hai? Red FM par aata hai, 93.5 par. Main jo cases solve karta hu police ke saath, uski kahaniya sunata hu. To aaj bhi main kuch kahaniya hi sunaunga. And we'll try to learn with that. आप सब लोगों के पास मोबाइल फोन है एक तुरंत एक्सरसाइज करेंगे अपना मोबाइल फोन खोलिए उसमें ब्राउजर लॉन्च कीजिए और उस पर टाइप कीजिए प्राइवेसी डॉट नेट स्लैस एनालाइजर ए एन ए एल वाई जेड ई आर जेड ई आर प्राइवेसी डॉट नेट स्लैस एनालाइजर अपने अपने ब्राउजर में क्विकली एक करेंगे जब आप ये खोलेंगे तो उसके नीचे एक ऑप्शन आएगा स्टार्ट टेस्ट करके बटन आएगा प्राइवेसी डॉट नेट स्लैस एनालाइजर खुल गया नीचे स्टार्ट टेस्ट बटन होगा स्टार्ट टेस्ट को क्लिक कीजिए जैसे ही स्टार्ट टेस्ट को क्लिक करेंगे आपको अपने बारे में बहुत सारी इंफॉर्मेशन वहां दिखने लगेगी क्या दिख रहा है योर आईपी एड्रेस योर लोकेशन योर मोबाइल कौन सा है आपका ब्राउजर कौन सा है आपका बैटरी कितना चार्ज है आपका सिम कौन सा है सब दिख रहा है ये जो वेबसाइट है ये मैंने नहीं बनाई है ये कोई भी वेबसाइट हो सकती है करेक्ट और अभी जो ये वेबसाइट कर सकती है उसका आप पांच परसेंट आपने किया है इसके बाद इसमें आगे जाएंगे तो ऑटो फिल लीक टेस्ट है तो ब्राउजर कैपेबिलिटी टेस्ट है फाइनली डिजिटल डीएनए है आपका डू यू नो व्हाट इज डिजिटल डीएनए यदि मैं आपका डिजिटल डीएनए पता कर लू तो मैं आपको लाखों लोगों में पहचान सकता हूं बिना आपका मोबाइल नंबर बिना आपका ई मेल जाने डिजिटल डीएनए इज योर पैटर्न ऑन इंटरनेट कैसे आप इंटरनेट पर एक्ट करते हो All operators they know your digital DNA, your IPDR जो records होते हैं, they tell them कि what is your digital DNA. तो कई बार anonymous जब criminal होता है और हमें उसको ढूंढना है, तो क्या करते हैं हम? Digital DNA के base पर millions of लोगों में उसको ढूंढ सकते हैं। ये कुछ capabilities हैं। Can we move to the next slide, please? सबने देख लिया? Exercise. जो next इसमें option था, so I always like to start. ये थोड़ा fast fast करते जाओ। Time बहुत कम है। यदि आप slide में time लोगे तो मैं slow ही बोलूँगा। <laughs> I always like to start my ये mic ठीक नहीं है मैं बहुत बोलता हूँ मुझे पता पड़ जाता है तुरंत पांच मिनट में mic गड़बड़ है because मुझे ये अपनी आवाज गूंजती हुई सुनाई दे हाँ hello हाँ ये थोड़ा फिर भी better पता नहीं क्यों फट रही है okay so I always like to start my session with this line that I would love to change the world, but they won't give me the source code. So I truly believe that this entire world is a software program or hum sare log kya hai? Artificial intelligence plugins hai. Jaise ki koi bhi ek AI engine train hota hai, 
वी आर ऑल्सो ट्रेन बाय द डेटा सुबह से हम डेटा की बात कर रहे हैं सो वी आर द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ दैट डेटा दैट हैज बीन फेड टू अस सिंस अवर बर्थ बचपन से लेकर आज तक जो कुछ भी डेटा हमें दिया गया हम उस डेटा का प्रोडक्ट है यदि मैं झांसी की बजाय रोमानिया में पैदा हो जाता तो आज में कुछ और होता कोई दूसरी भाषा में बात कर रहा होता ज्यादा अमीर होता या गरीब होता सो वी आर द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ दैट डेटा डेटा बदल गया हम बदल गए और हम जिंदगी भर उस डेटा को डिफेंड करते हैं कि हम ये हैं हम ये जो भी आइडेंटिटीज आप गेन करते हैं ये समझना है कि आज जितना भी साइबर अटैक होता है उसमें सबसे ज्यादा सक्सेसफुल अटैक वही माने जाते हैं उसमें डेटा मैनिपुलेशन करके आपका माइंड मैनिपुलेट कर दिया जाए एंड दैट इज सो इजी सो आई टेल यू थ्री स्टोरीज क्विकली ये मूव कर सकते हैं आप और माइंड मैनिपुलेशन इतना आसान है क्योंकि आपका एक छोटा सा मैंने लिंक भेजा और आपको फेसबुक पे लिंक आता होगा इज दिस यू इन दिस वीडियो कितने लोग क्लिक कर देते हैं पचास परसेंट लोग फिर मैंने कहा इज दिस योर वाइफ इन दिस वीडियो कितने लोग क्लिक कर देंगे और थोड़े ज्यादा इज दिस योर डॉटर इन दिस वीडियो और थोड़े ज्यादा कर देंगे भाई सारे चिंतित हैं कहाँ किस कौन सा वीडियो हो गया रिलीज तो आजकल लोग ऐसे डरते हैं हमने क्या एक्सप्लोइट किया सो वट इज द बिगेस्ट वेलबिलिटी ऑफ अन बींग सबसे बड़ी कमजोरी क्या है आज के डेट में और प्रिसाइजली बताइए और प्रिसाइजली बताइए लालच डर एस्पिरेशन रेपुटेशन ये सब नहीं है ये सब बहुत पुरानी हो गई काम क्रोध लो मोह भय अहंकार इसके अलावा एक खतरनाक वेलरेबिलिटी निकल के आई है वो है किसने बोला खड़े हो जाओ सर <laughs> मैं आपके लिए एक स्पेशल प्राइज में इसलिए मैंने आपको मैं पहचानना चाह रहा था सो आई गिव दैट प्राइज टू हिम क्यूरियोसिटी सबसे ज्यादा आसानी से जो मैं अटैक करता हूं जो सक्सेसफुल होते हैं वो आपकी क्यूरियोसिटी एक्सप्लोइट कर लेता हूं क्योंकि आप क्यूरियस हो हर समय रील देख रहे हो आधे घंटे तक निकल जाता है पता नहीं पड़ता क्यों क्यों होता है ऐसा इससे पहले तो बड़े बोरिंग डी देखा किसी ने दिल्ली दूरदर्शन आधे घंटे अरे छोड़ो बंद करो उसमें भी तो वीडियो था फिर इस वीडियो में क्यों और उस वीडियो में क्यों नहीं क्यूरियोसिटी ये वीडियो ऐसे बनाए जाते हैं कि पहले पांच सेकंड क्या आप जानते हैं कि ये पर अब तो जानना ही है मुझे अब तो मैं जाने वाला छोड़ूंगा नहीं फिर वो आधे में छोड़ देगा क्या आप जानते हैं कि अरे यार कितना जन्माओगे हर आदमी जानना चाह रहा है ये हमारी क्यूरियोसिटी को एक्सप्रोवाइड कर रहे हैं और लाखों करोड़ों रुपए कमा रहे हैं और वही गेम करके मैं आपको हैक कर लेता हूं अभी एक केस आया मेरे पास एक ज्वाइंट सेक्रेटरी का फोन रिकॉर्ड हो गया एक जर्मन डेलीगेशन आ रहा था उनका फोन रिकॉर्ड हुआ तो पूरा का पूरा मीटिंग कैंसिल करना पड़ा क्योंकि बहुत सेंसिटिव कम्युनिकेशन था इन्वेस्टिगेशन बैठ गया मैंने देखा भाई फोन में कॉल रिकॉर्ड हुआ कैसे तो कोई ऐसी एप्लीकेशन नहीं मिली <coughs> था घर के एप्लीकेशन पर डाउट पहुंच गया वो एप्लीकेशन थी एक टॉय कंट्रोलिंग एप्लीकेशन चाइनीज टॉय आते हैं जो एलेक्सा टाइप के होते हैं उनसे बातचीत भी कर सकते हो फिर वो मूव भी करते हैं देखे किसी ने मॉल वॉल में मिलते हैं वैसा एक टॉय को कंट्रोल करने के लिए एप्लीकेशन इंस्टॉल करनी पड़ती है फोन में मैंने कहा साहब आपने ये क्यों इंस्टॉल की थी बोले अभी मेरे पंद्रह